morning. Aloha ka kahiaka kako. It's finals day at the Billabong Pro Pipeline. Our finalists making their way to site and getting prepared for the road to a pipe title here at Ehukai. CT1, stop number one on the World Surf League Championship Tour. And it's a beautiful day. I'm Kaipo along with Ross Williams. Ross, it's on. Morning, Kaipo. Yeah, it's definitely on. Uh, there's still a lot of swell in the water. There is some wind, but it's air wind. It's air wind. It's air wind, <laughs> especially on those lefts. <laughs> Glass half full. And, you know, as we look at uh, what, what's happening here, it's really going to take an adaptable surfer to take out a title here at Pipe. Um, some of the keys to look for, Ross, today? You know, you look at the Pipe Pro, it's all about getting barreled. It's about finding barrels on this stretch of reef. But today, there's not as many. And in fact, there's not many at all. So it's going to be about big moves. Uh, and there is still some big sections out there, especially on those right-handers. So uh, everyone's going to have to pivot a little bit and think about hitting the lip pretty hard. Well, let's learn a little bit more with Chief of Sport, Jesse Miley Dyer and Laura Enever. Good morning, everybody. Finals day, baby. Jesse, what are we expecting to see today? What's the call? Yeah, so the call is we're going to go, uh, first up, we'll be starting with men's quarterfinals. Then we're going into the women's semis, men's semis, women's final, men's final. Um, we are expecting this swell to hold today. It is for sure going to be pretty tricky. We're, we've been looking at a really hard forecast for the the next uh, days in the event window and sat down here this morning, talked to the surfers. There's a lot of people here who, you know, know this break really well and they're all telling us this is this is the day for competition. So we're going to be on. Amazing. The surfers are stoked. Let's get into it. Back to you guys. Well, there you go. OK, so it's been a consensus. We look to Surfline for the forecast when we're making these calls, Ross. What do you see here? Yeah, and it's almost more about when we're not making a call. So the next two days, there is some swell in the water, uh, but there's also a northeast swell coming, and there is a ton of wind. The wind's going to be really strong here uh, on the last couple of days of the wedding period. So right now, today, you can see right there, five to eight feet, just a small drop this afternoon. But Kaipo, it's contestable. It's pretty clean. The lineup is manageable. Everyone's going to be able to fight back and forth and catch waves and compete. Uh, Thursday and Friday looks really rough. So today's a day, Kipes. Yeah, there you go. Uh, looking a little more grim in the longer term forecast. Today, adaptability will come into play as well as management of expectations. Um, and, you know, choosing the right equipment for the playing field today will also be key. As we set up our first heat, quarterfinal number one for the men's. Out in the red jersey, Jordy Smith. In the blue jersey, Leonardo Fioravanti. We heard from Jesse Miley Dyer. 30 minute heats for the quarterfinals. We will extend that by five minutes for the semis and the finals. And th we're starting today with uh, a great matchup between these two, Ross. Yeah, this is a very good matchup, very even. Um, if you're trying to you know, place a bet on these two guys, you'd be pretty pressed uh, to, to figure out who's got the advantage. Obviously, Jordy's more of the veteran. Um, and he's got uh, more W's under his belt. But Leo's on a bit of a, a roll right now. He's got a lot of momentum. He's feeling a little sassy out there, Kaipo. Yes, well, a lot of momentum coming off of winning the Challenger Series. Leonardo fioravanti has been passionate in every single one of his heats. Jordy Smith, the veteran of the two, 16 seasons on the championship tour. Two-time runner-up for a world title. Came so close in both 2010 to Kelly Slater, and then again in 2016 to John John Florence. This is the start, the road to that final five and the Rip Curl WSL finals where Jordy Smith's going to want to make his way to the end of the year and give himself a chance at a world title. Yeah, he's uh, this schedule, too, is set up so well for Jordy. Um, you think about Bells, J-Bay. Um, he surfs so good at Sunset Beach. That's the next venue. He's already got a great result here. Um, he's, he's gotten better uh, in hollow waves. Jordy's very well-rounded. But Leo, I, I do want to say he's a little more scrappy. We've seen him get into some kind of uh, scrappy paddle battles when there's no priority at the start of these heats. Be interesting to see a set come in and, and what Leo does. Looks like right now he does have the inside for the right-hander. So he's having his way right now with Jordy. And that might be the plan for Jordy. Just let him kind of scrap around and, and uh, not fall into that trap. 
Jordy is going to be first to activate here. Here we go, the big South African. They'll snap off the top. Jumbled water here, clears it. Looking for more open face. That's going to be the opening score. And to set the scale for today. And more than uh, what went down on that wave, I think Jordy was just trying to kickstart the heat. I, I really don't think he wanted to get into any kind of paddle battle with Leo since that's kind of been his track record. He just said, fine, you know, I'm going to take off on this little wave. I don't really care if I get a keeper score. I just want to get the priority system going so we can get that out of the way. Yeah, I, I like that. You know, Jordy just almost, just kind of conceding, like, okay, let's start playing the game. Let's go back and forth with priority. I'm sure Jordy saw what Leo did in the round of 16 with Callum Robinson, uh, Robson, that where Leo was just all over him at the beginning of the heat in that open priority situation. Close, even, like, priority paddling interference calls and blocks. In this event, Leo, um, we've seen... Uh, a handful of surfers really scrapping around. We saw uh, uh, Joao as well, uh, kind of circling and sharking around Rio yesterday, playing some head games. Here we go. The Italian on his first wave, he's going to take a left, getting caught on the heels here, and he's just going to kick out. Jordy Smith and Leo Firovanti. Uh, Firovanti is just going to get a fractional score. Jordy getting a 2.33 for his opening right-hander. And this is just a classic day, uh, well, classic in the sense of uh, um, what you can expect or not expect on a North Shore. It changes, uh, it changes so often, so frequently on a North Shore. And today is going to be one of those days. We could still see sort of a relatively normal set come through where guys are going to get barreled. Uh, but you're going to have to be really um, just mold to these conditions and be okay with doing turns. Yeah, we take a look at our points of difference for the judges and our criteria. Deep technical barrel rides will be highly rewarded. Innovative and progressive maneuvers, especially in a combination, will be highly rewarded. That's going to be a key, key factor. Major maneuvers on critical sections, especially if combined with a barrel. Those are the notes from the judges this morning. And here's Leo Firovanti on his second ride. Open up with just a half point. He's going to do better on that right. I mean, so these surfers, when they, they come to the North Shore, especially when they come to backdoor and pipeline, they have this mindset, I have to get barreled. I have to you know, push the limits and take off on these crazy waves. And on a day like today, this is like something what you would normally see in Brazil, uh, what you'd normally see on a Challenger series. Uh, it's way more scrappy. It's about doing big turns and big sections. That's where they're going to get the points. Smith, wave number three, pulls in and just barrel seeking there for Jordy Smith. So um, no completion. and. You said, Ross, I mean, changing up the game plan mm. today, perhaps, and, and not even factor the barrel unless it's a super obvious barrel. That's right. Uh, and hour by hour, uh, we really don't know what it's going to look like by lunchtime. It could be a bit smaller. Uh, so you're going to have to be nimble today and be OK with uh, fighting for scores. 24 minutes on the countdown, tracking Leo Firovanti on the paddle back out waiting for his last score and see how that affects the heat will he take the lead just a 2.11 will give him lead he gets that and more 4.33 for Firovanti Firovanti in the lead and Jordy Smith sitting out the back with priority the X factor today you know with all that being said about doing big moves and big sections if someone sneaks into a smooth wave and finds himself a barrel section that is going to be a, a, a wild card, you know, because the judges are going to obviously reward you for a barrel today. So if you can get lucky and find a good barrel, that's going to be probably a huge score. Kaiwi Belly prepping in the Red Bull Athlete Zone for his quarterfinal matchup against Liam O'Brien. Nice looking rusty boards there for Kaiwi Belly. Fresh looking sticks right there. Nice round pin, three fins. No real frills on these boards. They just like <laughs> good for the North Shore. Well, and and hopefully Leo, I mean, uh, Kyle waxes his boards. Remember last year he snapped the board, had to get a backup, paddled out, barely had any wax oh, on his board, and was asked, you know, was actually I think he was asking Strider in the lineup for wax. So, <laughs> well. <laughs> Here's the CT Shaper rankings. The points start at the quarterfinals. So Rusty Priesendorfer over at Rusty Surfboards is going to be earning some points because Kylie Belly is in the quarterfinal. 
Liam O'Brien with those DHDs. He's going to give Darren Hanley some points as well. It's going to be an exciting year, and uh, we will determine a winner at the Rip Curl WSL Finals for the CT Shaper rankings. I like it. I'm kind of pulling for all the dark horses, too, because there's so much focus on the Mayhems and the DHs and the Pizels and the CIs, but uh, we got Bradley in this heat right now. That board's looking really fresh on her Leo's feet. And uh, we got Jordy's Pops, too. Yeah, Smith Shapes, Graham Smith, um, shaping Jordy's board. You know, these two, let's take a look at these two and the WSL stats. When we look at matchups between Jordy Smith and Leo Firavanti, matchups, head to head matchups, two wins uh, for Jordy over zero for Leo. That happened at Rip Curl Pro Bells 2019 in the round of 32. And one of the wins at J-Bay in 2017 was an epic heat, an epic win for Jordy Smith. Let's turn the clock back to J-Bay 2017. Jordy Smith and Leo Firavanti. Firavanti with an excellent heat total of a 16.17, Ross. Yeah, just amazing. Jordy's such a sniper uh, at J-Bay. You just don't want to draw him uh, in the heat draw here. He is a weapon. He's strong. He's smooth. Uh, he knows that spot better than anyone. He's a local boy there. Found the barrels and forget about the turns. I mean, when this kid lays his rail over at J-Bay, that is uh, a sight to behold. This was a perfect heat for Jordy Smith. Two 10-point rides, the 20 out of a possible 20 in the score line, and Jordy Smith put down an historical performance at J-Bay. It's just got great pace. He doesn't ever push it. He doesn't force a move where it doesn't belong. He reads that inside barrel section better than anyone. Uh, and that really makes a difference. J-Bay, you can kind of force the issue and get in front of the wave, get behind the wave. But Jordy, uh, he has the keys to the matrix out there. That's what a perfect heat looks like. Live action. Jordy Smith. The Jordy eyeing up a section. Lip glide through that first section. Gets the board right back under him, slides the fins around, hangs on, gets a little dirty for the finish, but goes complete. Kaipo, did you see that clip that uh, Jordy put on his uh, Instagram from like four or five, six days ago at Rocky Rights? That carve? Oh my gosh, it was one of the better turns we've seen so far this winter. Uh, and it looks a lot like this right here at Rocky Rights. So, Jordy, he's going to be really tough to beat today. He's a big kid. He's loose, obviously. He does tail slides like that. Uh, but if he gets a section where he can really throw down, he's got a lot of power. Little pin turn right here, just getting down the line. Decides to chuck the fins out the back right there. And for such a big, strong guy, he's one of the loosest cats on tour. He really likes to, um, you know, throw those fins around. Yeah, he's extremely flexible. 34 years old, so maintaining that flexibility into your 30s is really impressive with Jordy Smith. Has moved over here, he has a place on the North Shore, so he's spent more and more time on Oahu, and he's just been dialing himself on the North Shore. Every single season, it seems like he elevates his performance. Yeah, he's, uh, he, he really is comfortable. That's the key thing for the North Shore. It can be a spooky place. Uh, there's sort of a boogeyman on the North Shore, like, oh, the waves are big and strong and scary, but once you move here and uh, get to know all these reefs a little better, that boogeyman, disappears and you just start having fun on the North Shore. And you can start say the same for Leo Firavanti. He built a house here. He's got a place on the right. North Shore and he's spending a lot of time here on the North Shore as well. So you know, two North Shore transplants, if you would. Um, but now <laughs> they have a full-time residence available to them on the North Shore of Oahu. You got their Maikai card, you might say. <laughs> Kama Aina. Well, this is just the start of the day today. Of course, men's quarters into the women's semis, men's semis, and then we will have finals time where we're going to crown a champion here at CT number one, the first stop of the championship tour. And 10,000 points to start your year. Ross, invaluable for the winner when you look at just even getting through that mid-season cut. You're almost guaranteed to make that cut with the event win. That's right, it's huge and um, it, it means a lot, especially for anyone left in a draw that might be a little more scrappy, that's not your perennial world title threat. Uh, they're gonna be like, whew, sweet, you know, I got a big result. I'm not worried about that cut line. So 
you know, when you get down to the nitty gritty end of the of the event, you really need to focus on that W. Yeah. Let's take a look at the road right now for our men and our men's bracket. Starting off with Jordy Smith and Leon Fiorvanti, we're going to go into Liam O'Brien, Kaiwi Belly, then a battle for Brazil, quarterfinal number three, Felipe Toledo versus Joao Chianca, then quarterfinal number four, a barn burner, Jack Robinson, John John Florence Ross. Yeah, that's a smoker. Um, so all, all really good heats, really tight heats. Same for the ladies as well. One thing that, to an uh, interesting little note, not one goofy footer and the whole event, they're, they're all gone. It's all regular footers, both the men's and the women's, that's all that's left. So, uh, and I can tell you right now, uh, it's a sigh of relief for the men's draw because Italo and, and Gabriel today would be a nightmare. On these lefts, they'd be doing backflips with this air win. Yeah, and you know, you're gonna have to watch out for defending world champ, Felipe Toledo, um, because he can really kick into another gear in these conditions as we've seen in the past, Ross. A hundred percent. He'd be pretty psyched right now eating his bowl of cereal. He's going to be flinging some backside loops. <laughs> uh, last score for Jordy Smith, 5-4-3. Uh, Jordy takes the lead. Jordy up on this left. Has to negotiate a couple of warbles. Kicks out. He will remain in the lead. Leo Fiorvanti with priority, just needing a 3.44. Time on the clock, we're halfway through at 15 minutes, 45 seconds. And right now they're both should really kind of still reading the lineup, still trying to get used to like, okay, what am I doing here? Where's, what's my program? Am I gonna find a big section? Am I gonna find a long one? So now you could say at the 15 minute mark, that's over. They really need to get their hustle on. Leo's interested in this one. Ferravanti looks down the line, does not identify any opportunity so pulls back and remains with that priority we talked a lot on the last few days about opportunities as you can see leo paddling back to the normal peak uh, opportunities at eights is that still going to be the case today yeah it's still definitely available uh, although they're not exactly looking for a barrel uh, but you're just looking for a corner you're looking for a, a section where you can you know, throw down a couple of turns, especially two turns, Kaipo. If you can lay down, a, like the judges say, a combination of major maneuvers, that could be a big score. So they're looking for anything to stay open. There's, a, there's still quite a few closeouts. Smith on the priority. Long bottom turn, swoops, a carve back into the pocket. A little shampoo in the morning, why not? Jordy Smith identifies more opportunity down the line. Got a little runner, some additional off the top maneuvers. Clashes with the oncoming section, that eats him up, but that's not going to factor that much into uh, hampering the score as Jordy Smith got some busy work done. He did. He strung together a handful of moves there. So, uh, you know, we're, that was right on cue. And there is supposed to be a northeast sort of wind swell coming up throughout the day. I don't see it quite yet, uh, but it is supposed to show up, and that'll create some long running rights uh, out here. Be a much different look. Nice swoop here for Jordy. Like you said, just a bonus shampoo barrel there. But it was, you know, today they'll count it. And then a couple more finishing moves there from Jordy. I, I like the way his board looks. Uh, his body looks freed up. He looks loose. That should be another keeper right there. You could consider that a major move. Nice little carve. Count that barrel, too. And then a couple smaller maneuvers on the inside. So it looks like another mid-ranger. He's going to have himself, you know, probably a couple of fives or better. Well, he will improve upon his second score of 2.33. We're waiting for that score. We're going to take a break. Wait, we're not going to take a break because we're at 13 minutes on the countdown. There may be some opportunity out there as sets hit the reef for Leo Ferrovanti sitting with priority. And Leo not looking interested in that set. So we will take a break right now. When we come back, we'll have the score for Jordy Smith and the situation and the results for quarterfinal number one.
The Billabong Pro Pipeline is brought to you by Billabong, the official apparel brand of the Billabong Pro Pipeline, and by Yeti, built for the wild. Quarter final number one, finals day here at the Billabong Pro Pipeline. Jordy Smith out in the water against Leo Ferrovanti, coming back from a break, and we can check off the score last of Jordy Smith. A 5.33, Firovanti with priority. Now needs a 6.43 to take that lead away from Jordy Smith. Firovanti finds a little tucked under barrel, but that's all it's going to be. That's not going to be the number for Leo Firovanti. And priority should be switching to Jordy Smith with the lead and heat control, Ross. Well, there you go. Uh, that's not exactly what Leo was looking for. You see that side wind action right there? It's creating a lot of ribs in the wave. Uh, and with those ribs, you'll get separations. So you'll see sort of one chunk at a time, one section at a time. It almost looks like soup bowls in the Caribbean right now. You know, it's got all these separated sections where you're going to have to produce something exciting for the judges. And you can guarantee when Leo saw this wave and when he was paddling, he was anticipating doing some big maneuvers. And the next thing you know, that thing just folded over like a weird little hot pocket. So it wasn't necessarily a good barrel for Leo, and he'd be a little frustrated. Yeah, as he, sh as he should. So still looking for that 6.43. And that, as we're talking about numbers, well, we got this paddle here right now. We got Jordy Smith. Let's see if he decides to use his priority. It's going to be Leo Fiorvanti He's surfing under priority. Again, pulls in, ducks out. And no score of relevance for Leo on that attempt. Smith takes another peek. Leo staying busy. Firovanti looking for a corner. Finds a little more of a corner, finds a little bubble, gets through that section. Nice carve in some difficult water. Back up into the lip again, and the fist pump for Leo Firovanti as we turn our attention. Jordy Smith in the barrel and goes incomplete there. So, Leo Firavanti with an opportunity to flip this heat right now, Ross. Yeah, he found himself a, a nice little section right there. That thing stayed open for him and finished the, the wave off with a couple of decent turns. Right here again, just a, a bit of an Easter egg. You know, he just found this thing. It, and it, that's how you're going to have to surf today. You're going to have to let the wave shape up in front of you and sort of just have a response for it. It's not very predictable right now. And this thing actually held shape. Right there you can see, he sees it, he's like, whoa, I'm gonna pull in here. And he was actually pretty deep and that, that might get the judge's attention. I know it's a short barrel, but it was a little technical because he had to go through a section and then just some finishing turns there. So, you know, we got ourselves a heat. And this was Jordy's attempt. This could have been a really good fight back instantly uh, for Jordy, but just a touch too deep and the floor of that barrel just opened up for the big fella. Seven minutes 45, we're on standby, waiting for that score for Firavanti again, needing a 6.43 to overtake Jordy Smith in quarterfinal number one. Well, I'm bringing on the line. Let's bring in Rich Porta, our rules and judging expert. Morning, Rich. Morning, gents. How are you going? Oh, we're doing great. We're excited for the finals day today. Uh, but I want to start picking your, your brain, Rich, on what the judging criteria, how are people going to garner those big numbers today? Yeah, sure. Well, it was interesting. Right on cue, Leo gets that 667. And we are at Pipeline and back door, so the judges still want to see the barrels. I know there's, they're hard to find, but you compare that barrel just then at Leo's to Geordie's, where he had the carve and the little barrel, and he gets a, a point plus with some change in front of it. So the barrels are still there, obviously not as many as we like, but 
if you can find one, that's what you want to do. And then we've got the aerialist crew coming in in a couple of heats, and, and airs are going to be a big kicker today for sure. So the judges have set a good criteria so far this morning. You know, you've got the 667 and then a couple of mid fives for Geordie for his surfing. So the judges want to see the surfers doing the big turns in the critical sections. If you can find a, a nice, deep, thicker barrel, they're, they're the ones you want. The little light barrels aren't going to count for much today. So they want to see the combos as well, but the critical sections, that's all the surfers have to think about because the judges want to see them put themselves into those positions. All right, so yeah, so really being nimble and being able to attack the wave both with turns, aerials, and barrels to get the big numbers. But talk about big numbers, Rich. Um, maybe you can help me dissect this. Why was John John Florence's 993 yesterday a 10? Two judges went 9.8 on that. I saw that live, and I, it, was, it was great commentary too, Clark, I must admit, because he does disappear, you know? And one thing I learned very early in John's career is you never take your eyes off that guy, because he does things like this all around the world. You think he's gone, but then he appears somehow, and, as he is, knows this reef like the back of his hand because he lives there, he would have been able to find that little pocket to sit in there. What the two judges that gave it the 9-8 did was they judged a bit more of the weight because there was a lot bigger and thicker barrels on offer and the three judges that gave it the 10 straight up did it for the technicality of how amazing John's wave was. So that everyone jumps on board, you know, there's too many 10s, there's not enough 10s, that should have been a 10, that shouldn't have been a 10. He gets a 998, yeah, sure, it's a 10. But that's why the two judges just dropped it off that little bit because the wave wasn't as good as a lot of the waves were available at the time. Oh, thank you. Thank you for the explanation, Rich, and all the analysis. Uh, have a great day, and uh, we'll see you soon. You guys have a great day. So there you go. Uh, nothing really happened so, while we were going through. We saw Leo catch a couple of, catch a, just a throwaway wave. The situation remains in the water. We're at four minutes and 10 seconds. Smith with priority. Smith needing a 5.58. Five, a couple of waves coming through here. And you can see, Ross, a little bit of that, that cross, uh, that wind swell mixing in especially when we're peering from above yeah this is not your typical uh strength trade winds it's strong enough to create those ribs but you can see those ribs crossed up uh going from right to left across your screen and that's going to create these big sections and if you look at a glass half full guy um it will create these pockets where you can you know explode and do some big turns so uh you're just gonna have to take advantage of these these conditions today Smith, stoic and waiting. Well, let's kick it into the heat recap. Quarterfinal number one, Jordy Smith came through, and this was a 5.43. Yeah, I like that little tail chuck right there from Jordy, always looking loose. And he's got a, a pair of waves, almost the same score, 5.4, 5.3. Classic swoop, found a little tiny barrel there and finishes the wave off. But the difference right now, uh, and there's not a whole lot between him and Leo, is Leo found just a slightly juicier barrel. And I gave him, like uh, Richie Porter said, about a point more. And right there, it's just sort of a bonus section, but it was throaty. And that's the buzzword always for every single big event. It's critical. They want to see a critical barrel or a critical section. And that one um, was, you know, it's fortunate for Leo, but he found it. And there's all the scores, the unabridged version, all the waves ridden, six waves ridden by each of the surfers. Highlighted are their top two, equaling their score line. Two minutes, 15 seconds on the clock. Opportunity for Smith, as he does have priority in these final two minutes. It's a two minute drill for the South African to overcome the Italian in quarterfinal number one. Kind of interesting that their numbers are 23 and 46. It's just doubled. Jordy's number. Whoa, numerics, Ross Williams. Mind blown. <laughs> and he's in the lead. <laughs> 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 
Well, there's not that a whole That was awesome. Of... That was... <laughs> Sorry. Oh, boy. <laughs> 135 on the clock. Smith needs to summon a wave. He's been looking loose this whole quarter final. He's been looking loose the whole event. Now it's going to come down to these final 90 seconds. Yeah. And, well, he's got... He's got the got the power, you know. The priority is under his name. So, looking over my shoulder, I do see a couple little lumps. He might have a shot here. Here we go, and it will be wave selection that's going to be a key for Jordy Smith. We already know he can have the performance. He can get there at a 5.58, no problem, given his ability. But the wave he selects is going to make the difference. Yeah, he, he's going to need a, a section with a little bit of power so that he can throw around his weight. Jordy's a big guy. He can throw a lot of spray, so it, it will have to be just barely his best score. Uh, so it's pretty black and white in front of him. He just needs a section. On the paddle here, down to 30 seconds. He's going to have to take the next couple waves. That's exactly right. He's only got the opportunity for one or two more swell lines. Uh, this is where Leo can start to feel a little excited, knowing that he's going to break through into the semis. Oh, looking grim at the moment. Last chance paddle, but he's going to run out of clock. Needs to get to his feet. After the horn, pulls in and was not complete. So that would have, wouldn't have changed the situation. So with that being said, we got our first semi finalist at the Billabong Pro Pipeline. It's going to be the Italian, Leonardo Fioravanti. When we come back, Liam O'Brien and Kyle Ibelli will be in the water for quarterfinal number two. Tons of people come to surf the North Shore every winter and I think we have a kuleana, a responsibility as ocean people to make sure that our aina and land stays healthy and clean. We're really grateful to WSL for providing a donation to North Shore Community Land Trust and the impact of those funds will be continuing to restore lo'ikalo like the one we see right here, traditional Hawaiian taro patches. Kalo is a very important plant for our people. It's our food source, you can eat it from the flower to the stem to the root. Pretty much like identifies Hawaiian culture. So it's awesome to see them building a big lowy patch back here. Tell us what you're doing by posting on social media with the hashtag WeAreOneOcean and tagging WSL and WSL Pure in your posts. We are one ocean! Oh! <laughs> We are one ocean. The oceans connect all of us as we fly above the Pacific Ocean. 
and start things up for quarterfinal number two with Liam O'Brien, Kyle Ibelli in that challenge. And on the set, I'd like to welcome Seth Moniz. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, Seth. Yeah, Ross. What's it feel like, Seth? I mean, coming back to Pipeline, you know, and I'm sure you have highs and lows emotions. Last year's runners up, but what, what's your experience been at this year's Billabong Pro Pipeline? I mean, this year's Billabong Pro Pipeline, um, it was tough. I mean, we obviously didn't get the best conditions. It wasn't like last year, but you know, that's how it is. That's how surfing goes. Some, some years are great. Some years can be really difficult. And that's why we're in this though. And to compete against the best, you know, you still gotta, you, it's a challenging thing when it's small like this, but um, that's why we love it. It's just to compete against the best competitors in the world. Well, you know, looking at your fellow competitors, uh, do you have a pick? early on in the morning so who, who you think is going to take the title this afternoon it's it's a really tough one i think um i mean you can never count out john even even though the conditions are like this he's it's like his home break at logs it's similar to that right now he can go left and do a big punt even right doesn't even matter which way the wind is for that guy that guy can can punt on anything and a little bit of local knowledge goes a long way today but I think you can't count out guys like Leo. He's just, um, days like this, he's just a fighter. He's a really good competitor and seems to make the right decisions at the right time. So I would say those are my two top picks. I like that a lot with the, with the Leo call, just because coming off of a, a great effort uh, at, in the Challenger Series in 2022, where he had to grind through a lot of heat in you know, challenging conditions, and Leo came out on top of the pack at the end of the year on that Challenger Series leaderboard. So yeah, I, I, I mean, like that. in a way, right now it's like a Challenger Series event. It's it's slow. You guys are doing turns. Guys are gonna have to go to the air, and um, yeah, it's just a challenging event. Well, let's turn our attention, Ross, into this quarterfinal number to Liam O'Brien, Iowa Belly. Who's got the advantage here? Uh, well, I like Seth's um, pick with Leo because Leo is smart. And he's also scrappy. He's not afraid to get kind of dirty. Um, and these conditions are like that. Um, and I, so for Kyle, I, he's also scrappy, makes really good decisions. He's good at sort of like big section closeout turns, which might be a factor today. But I wanted to ask Seth, too, since you're teammates with Liam, maybe not many of the audience out there know, are not super familiar with Liam. What are his strengths today? Liam's a sneaky guy as well. I mean, he's always a dark horse in events, I feel like. but. This guy puts a lot of time out here, and he puts a lot of time when the waves are like this and no one paddles out. He he surfs a lot, even when the waves are bad. So, you know, he's not lost out there. This guy can pick. He, he can find the diamond in the rough. Um, I mean, in my I had him in my heat yesterday, and he beat me, and it was so tough, and it was tough to pick out the waves, and, you know, he made the right decisions, and I didn't. So um, I can really see him actually going far in this event as well. Yeah, Liam O'Brien, 23 years old, out of Burley Heads, Australia. Technically his second year on the championship tour, but, you know, he had that horrible ankle injury at the beginning of last season, which uh, impeded him from, from competing, but got the grind on. Went to that Challenger Series, finished off there, you know, above the cut line at number nine to get back onto the championship tour. One thing we, we can tell already from the young Liam O'Brien, Ross, is that he is a grinder. He will grind heats out regardless of the conditions. Yeah, uh, he really is. And I, I think I remember, I recall him uh, in a post-heat interview at Haleiwa after he qualified and he surprised himself. I think with his injury, he was thinking, oh, I'm just going to keep my ratings up and, and try to have a, a solid year and requalify next year. And lo and behold, he qualified. So Liam... Um, He's really talented. He's got a smooth style, uh, and he's well-rounded, like Seth said. He, you know, he can get. Um, he's really good barrel rider, and he's uh, obviously does well in the beach break stuff. So, um, I, I'm really interested and excited for Liam because not many people know who he is, and he's he's a he's a pretty cool dark horse. Yeah, Liam. He's gnarly. Um, I think he's gonna. He fits the tour really well. Uh, he's a smart competitor. He makes really good decisions and. On land, he might be shy, but in the water, he, he, he means business. Um, in our heat, you know, he didn't look at me once or say anything. He, was, he had a serious face on, so I like that. Can you tell us anything about Liam O'Brien? Because he really does keep 
to himself that the that um, to the fans that he kind of like maybe a trivia or or a fun fact about Liam. Ooh. <laughs> no, no pressure, sir. Uh, shoot. Um, I met his dad recently, and he's here, and um, they're both surfing off the wall recently. I mean, it's not really a trivia, but yeah, they both have just the coolest styles. Like, I saw his oh. dad just stand up on a wave and go straight and pump past me, and they look I pretty identical on a wave, and it's kind of cool to see the resemblance from, like, son to father, and in a way, I feel like I have a similar style to my dad when I'm seeing clips of him, old clips of him surfing, and um, yeah, I like that. It's 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 cool to see that father-son uh, style resemblance. That's a fun fact right there, yeah. Seth. Yeah, that is awesome. Um, you know, but in contrast uh, to Liam O'Brien, who's like super smooth, you have Kyle Belly Ross, who's just, I mean, sometimes his passion overrides what he's actually capable of and he and then he actually takes himself to higher levels because of just his mind and how passionate Kaiwi Belly is. Yeah, he he definitely this is where he belongs. You know, you can tell that there's no second guessing that his destiny is to win heats. Um Kaiwi Belly too, amazing barrel rider and super sendy. Uh, you know, Kyle charges in, in Tahiti and Hawaii. Uh, he's kind of underrated that way, uh, but and then also he's really scrappy. He you know he likes to get in paddle battles. He doesn't mind playing the game. Um, he's super good for the tour. He's he's really a, a great competitor. Yeah, um, you got you got Kyle in the semifinals last yeah. year on your way to the final, Seth. Yeah, that's right. I had I've had Kyle in a few heats now on tour. Had him in a quarterfinals at Tahiti and then semis last last year over here and. Yeah, he's no fun to have any heat. <laughs> he's um, he's a really good competitor and surfer, and I mean, I feel like every year he has an event where he has a crazy breakthrough, and he comes from behind where it's he's completely gone, but somehow he makes it happen. So yeah, you're really, actually you're actually count him out. you're actually two to one versus Kawi Belly. Two to one. Nice. Yeah. Do you know that stat or not really? I knew I got him two times. I don't remember losing to him, though. Yeah, you should. Yeah, where, that's where the ones I, you don't Where did remember. I lose to him? Uh, I'm going to take a look right now. It was at uh, North Narrabeen. Oh, okay. You can have that one. <laughs> 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 okay. Let's hear from Leo Firavanti. He's our first semifinalist for the man. Leo is with Laura. Leo. Someone is taking home that pipe trophy and the 10,000 points today. What was your mindset like turning up to the beach this morning and how did you keep the energy high? I know it is finals day, but there's a long way to go. There's some amazing surfers to get through. And I haven't even thought about the trophy, the, anything, the points. I just, just wanted to make sure that I came to the beach doing what I did yesterday, that I tried to find some rhythm in really tough conditions and that I you know, worried about this heat because Jordy's an amazing surfer, amazing competitor. And I mean, I knew it wasn't going to be easy at all. And talk about that 667, that was under priority. You are just saying that you saw it on the paddle back out. Tell us a bit about that. Yeah, so I went on one that was pretty average. I just tried to give it a go. And, and then the, the wave after was the wave before that I got. And it hit the reef at Ains pretty well, but it was a bit bumpy. So I saw that it hit the Ains, the Ains bowl. So I'm like, OK, I think the next one, if it's clean, it could do it. And I tried not to show Jordy too much interest. Um, and he obviously pulled back, so I'm like, all right, this is my chance. And when I took off, I saw it build up. I'm like, okay, this, this could be the one. And I was just stoked to find a good barrel in some tough conditions. <laughs> Absolutely amazing. Well, you're our first semifinals of the day. How does that feel? Yeah, it feels amazing to start the year off with a great result. And, you know, it's, it's going to be a long day, but who knows? Um, let's go heat by heat, but, you know, I'll give it my all. Let's get it. We'll see you soon. Yeah, Fioravanti will be in semifinal number one. <laughs> a couple of rides during that interview. The only meaningful number, a 2.5 for Liam O'Brien as we track O'Brien on the paddle back out, Ross. Well, that's a, a really good inside scoop from Seth that uh, Liam likes to surf out at back door and pipe when the waves are you know, not that great. So he'd be familiar with finding scores out here. And uh, during the interview, Caillou Belly, yeah, just cruising through that barrel. It looked like he almost squeezed out of it, um, but he looked a little bit uh, not so stoked on that wave. And Liam, this is the 2.5. Nice little smooth layback snap. Another uh, fun fact, 
that I just learned about Liam O'Brien is he actually worked at the Billabong Surf Shop on the Gold Coast to uh, help fund his first real push on the CS Tour. So, I mean, you talk about a good comeback story, and now, now here he is on the big tour. Yeah, I mean, people find their way, right? And some, some surfers, you know, Seth, sign big contracts or just right on tour and there's a number of surfers kind of got to work side jobs just to fund themselves uh, for international travel we're going to get kylie belly going right here he belly with a big turn for the comeback 2.41 is what he needs um to turn the heat for the moment what do you think about that turn seth yeah that was nice um i think they'll reward those end section turns it's, it's a critical turn at the end kind of just makes a statement right here Boom, yeah, that's the score. But going back to Liam, um, I'm pretty sure he was in college, studying for college, but since he just qualified, I think he put that on hold. <laughs> I believe he, I think he was a senior. Wow, yeah, so almost right there. there. Yeah. Well, we'll be waiting for the score for Kyle E. Belly on the paddle back out. Ibelli, again, was a uh, semi-finalist last year at Pipeline. Would like to replicate that performance this year. Kyle Ibelli actually, you know, had three semi-final appearances in, in 2022 on the championship tour, in which he ha actually had his best year finish up, finishing off um, eighth in the world. Oh, here he comes, Ross. North Felipe North. Toledo. He looks pretty psyched. Joao, another psyched individual, not lacking any energy. Damn, I forgot about this heat. Um, I think Philippe will be a, he could be up there today. It's it's really fitting his surfing, um, if, especially if it's going to go to turns, and it seems like it will. Yeah, um, I think the swell is dropping a bit, so. Yeah, quarterfinal number three, I'm calling the battle from Brazil. O'Brien, here we go. Liam, double pump bomb turn, comes around this section. Nice little carve to start. Keeping the rail clean for a second turn. Wave wedging towards the end. A little slash off the oncoming whitewater. Goes complete in some very shallow reef. Reynolds Hayes likes it. As well as Ryan Callan, wondering what the number is going to be. <laughs> That's exactly what he's doing. <laughs> it's fun to you know be on the beach and, and spectate and watch and trying to guess scores. And on a day like today, too, it's pretty grindy. So. Uh, at the end of the day, you're still just trying to win. Everyone's competitive on tour, and it feels good to win. Whether it's three feet and choppy or eight feet and pumping, nothing's as good as getting a W today. And Liam getting a lot of smooth turns. I think that last turn, Seth, helped a bit, just getting a little bit of a fin throw there. But um, 4.17, and you said it, that was kind of a critical section for Kyle. Yeah, I think, I mean, Liam surfed that wave really well, but there was no, like, real critical section that gave him like a, a really solid ending but I think that'll be the score to bump him up into first place so that's his job and there you go I think he's yeah he's right yeah, back in it. there yeah 3.67 and Liam O'Brien it's a back and forth quarterfinal number two I'm gonna go out to the water to Strider Walzaluski your thoughts Strider thanks Kaipo yeah just checking in I wanted to kind of get um, a note from from Seth I think we got a rider on a wave. Somebody on that one? <laughs> yeah, it's Kyle Belly and oh. Kyle uh, throwing the palms up and standing proud after surviving, you know, a pretty treacherous double up dumper on the inside. Replay of the ride, Ross. Uh, and a barrel to boot. Wow. So common combination of major maneuvers. And again, it's just a like kind of a float hit. But that's the buzzword. It's a critical section. Uh, the judges love that. They're going to eat that up all year long. That's no secret. And Kyle is so good at that. You know, it's not real technical. It's just putting your board on a gnarly section. Yeah, and, and there we go. Wave. Well, it was it was a harder wave to put together, but you get a you get an opportunity like that for Kyle and just slam it, and you know that's where the points pay off. Yeah, we'll be waiting for that score. I'm going to go back out to Strider. Thanks, Kaipo. Yeah, back to Seth. I was just checking in. You know, a loss is never easy, but, you know, with what we have now, we got the best of a bad forecast. So, you know, these guys having to battle through some unfavorable conditions. You know, Seth, does it, does it, ease, in the, does it ease the loss for you out here when you see it like this on finals there? Does it still hurt deep inside? No, nah, it definitely still hurts. I mean, 
either way, when the waves are small or big, you know, you don't want to lose. You want to make heats. But I, I'm sure if the waves are pumping right now, I'll be a lot more bummed in the booth, you know, commentating for this heat because I could have been in this heat right behind us. But um, I'm, I'm stoked for my friend Liam to be getting a solid result. And, you know, I'm cheering on for him. We, we both work with Reynos Hayes. So it's, he's my teammate. And, you know, I want all the best. After the heat's done, you know, I'm, I'm cheering him on. There you go. Well, 6.83 checks in for Liam O'Brien with 11.54 on the clock. Ibelli in the lead. We're going to go to a break. And when we come back, we're going to have a special treat for you. Stick around. Some days it, you think you're in sync with it and you're catching all the best waves and then you're ripping. Then other days, pretty much just humbles you and the ups and downs of it. Giving me kind of, I don't know, happiness in life and it's given me new friends around the world and it's pretty much my life. I think the best way to pay respect to the old generation is to take some of their surfing along with you. Billabong Pro Pipeline and pulling in Kaiwi Belly in a backdoor barrel finds the exit, disappears. And a surfer from Guarujá, Brazil, wants to repeat his performance from 2022 and get into the semifinals. He's on his way right now. He's got a lead over Liam O'Brien. And he's going to add to that lead in a big way as we're checking in the numbers. And a nine-point ride stacks in for Kyle Ibelli, leaving Liam O'Brien with priority and a two-wave combination need of a 15.83. Replay again of this nine. Wow, that is a pit right there and through the foam ball. So the judges recognizing that that was a pretty gnarly little barrel right there. And on a day like today, you know, there's diamonds in the rough. They're not easy to find. But we all know that Kyle, that's kind of what he's known for. He's sort of a, a truffle pig. This guy can just find he can find these nuggets, and geez, that was a nugget, Seth. That was a nug. I mean, there it is, um, finding a wave that doesn't really exist right now. <laughs> but that was awesome. Um, Kyle's got like the, I, I saw him on the beach walking, and his legs are huge right now. <laughs> he must have been lifting a lot of weight, so, you know, he's, he's hammering that foam ball and making those sections easily. Take a look at all the judges' score. One judge going as high as a 9.5. Again, we throw away that high number, the low number. Easy math there as we average out the remaining three. A flat nine and an excellent ride for Coyote Belly. 
Liam O'Brien now needs two waves. And he looks interested in this one. O'Brien with priority decides not to go. Kyle looks down the line and agrees that that was not a keeper. Rolling into to this, I promised all the viewers a special treat, and we got a little teaser of Trilogy Volume 2, in which you're a part of, Seth. And uh, that's going to be, you know, you're the next generation. Of, of course, Trilogy, the original Trilogy, uh, made in 2007, featuring uh, Joe Parkinson, Andy Iron, and Taj Burrow. There's a new threesome uh, in Trilogy Volume 2, some new friends and some new adventures. Yeah, I mean, don't want to take anything away from those guys, but, you know, we had an amazing opportunity to film this movie last year, and uh, we went for it, and there was, a, there was a lot of hard work in between events. Um, we, we didn't really get to come home in between events because those breaks we had, we were traveling and hunting for waves, so. But in a way, we had the best time ever. I got to surf with Griffin and Ethan, and we scored some amazing waves, I must say, and um, I'm really excited for everyone to see it. Can you tell us of any of those waves that you visited? Um, or is there a, yeah, kind of an no, NDA no, that's, that's, on that? I don't think it's a secret. I don't know. No one told me <laughs> not what to say and not to say. But, um, yeah, we went to South Africa. After Jay Bay, we went to the West Coast. And um, we camped out for two weeks over there and scored some crazy beach breaks. And um, we had Peru in there. And then we were in Indo for a month. And... That's where I, I hurt myself before GLAN and tore my MCL. So I kind of missed out on half of that trip. But, um, you know, I saw some amazing surfing from Griffin and Ethan. Um, yeah, the, the, the bar was very high surfing with those guys. That's awesome. Yeah, each of you are raising each other's bar, I'm sure. And, and the MCL is all good now? Yeah, yeah, it's all good. Um, just had a bad, bad wipeout that you'll see in the movie hopefully soon. And, um, you know, it was a bummer to do it on a surf trip right before an event when I'm having a decent year, but um, that's how she rolls. And luckily for that midway cutoff, you know, I was safe. So I, I headed home, packed my bags, head, went home and just recuperated for this year. Yeah. And how does, how do, do Ethan and Griffin insp inspire you as a surfer? Um, both in their different ways. I'd say Griffin with his hard work and his dedication. You know, he, he puts a lot of effort and time into this, and it's no joke for him. He, he really just wants one thing, you know, and I, I'm sure that's a well-known thing. He's just like, he says it to the world, like, he wants to be a world champion. And he kind of, like, sends that out into the universe in a way. And then Ethan is that just quiet assassin, and he just lets his surfing do the talking. He doesn't, doesn't really say much. Um, quiet guy if you don't know him, but... Um, you know, he's probably, he's my favorite surfer. I'd say he's one of, he's my favorite surfer right now to watch. It's just crazy to see him surf a wave. It's just, it's just perfect. It's, he's got that Andy vibe where a lot of kids are going to want to be, you know, they're going to look at Ethan and that's the guy you want to surf with, like, and have that style. I think one of my favorite things about Billabong is their history and all the really awesome surf movies from the 80s, 90s, and all that. So many cool movies. Any, um, do you ever dive into some of the retro movies that Billabong made? Yeah, I mean... A lot of them. I mean, I've watched them all. It's, I mean, my favorite is Trilogy. I mean, how, how can not, that not be? Um, that movie was just on repeat. Ross was, was in a couple kids. of Billabong movies. You yeah. Watch that um, as well. What was the one with? <laughs> I wasn't going to. No, no. I just went there. It was more like Pump. Like I, like, I liked your, your movie with Shane. Um, I'm not too sure if that was a Billabong movie. Oh, but Sons of Fun. Sons of uh, Fun. Margo. Yeah, Margo, you, Shane. That was, that's up there for sure. <laughs> I just remember growing, like, you know, because being a Billabong writer back in the day and watching uh, the movies with Aki and um, uh, just there's so many movies that were, like, made a, an imprint on you and it made you want to go to Australia and some of these rippable beach breaks. Yeah, I mean, Billabong's a very core surf brand and... Um, they want to represent surfing as, as it is. So. Yeah. Celebrating 50 years yeah. right now as a brand, Billabong. Let's dive in right now, you guys, into the heat recap. And it's been Kylie Belly Ross who's been the performer in quarterfinal two. Yeah, and I'll, I'll pose the question to Seth. Um, what do you, what do you, how does Kyle have such a good radar? How does he find these nuggets out here? Man, I think he's just a hunter. He, he doesn't stop believing in 
look at him, just that wave was insane. And that didn't really exist out there, but it came for him. And that's why you can never count out this guy. He's he's uh he never stops believing in himself and he has he has the talent to do it. Yeah. That nine really is really standing out, Ross, when we took it. Look at the entire spread um, of this heat right now. And it's just like just to take it one more layer deeper for Kayo. I feel like a lot of surfers, and, and I'm definitely guilty of this, they'll, they'll look at a, at, a, at a bad wave and be like, it's not a good one, and they'll paddle over it. Mm -hmm. But someone like Kyle, he'll look at it a second time, a third time, a fourth time, and then he might just barely see something, a little window, and he'll take off and, and get that nine-point ride. Yeah, I mean, that's, I feel like that, that gray area where you, you know, you're on the fence of going, and then you go, and you take that risk, and you get a nine, so that's... Sometimes you have to be, it has to be like that, and you have to take that risk. Strider, what do you got? I just, you know, another question for Seth. I was just watching, you know, you guys got ahead of recap and, and watching Kyle uh, and Liam on, on the paddle for that, that nine point ride that he had. They were like right on top of each other. And then, like, basically underneath the throwing lip and popping up. And that, that, that pressure from your opponent, and also, you know, a normal surfer is paddling into these waves from outside coming in. You guys are taking off completely underneath the lip. Do you guys identify way more on the wave taking off later? Is that is that a benefit for you guys? I mean, it just sets yourself in the critical critical uh, position. I think you see here, he's he's yeah, he's far under it. Then he's in the perfect spot to just stand up and go straight into it, backdoor it with the perfect speed. And I think you know, as a surfer paddling into that wave, he was going to make it. He just set himself up for that whole wave. Um, I mean, you see John yesterday. He. I don't, I don't know, that was some guru stuff he did, but he was under the lip, slid right into it, and he just immediately projected with that speed through the barrel. So, yeah, in a way, it's a, it's like a new technique. Um, I mean, it's been going on for a while. Andy guys, Andy, Bruce, you know, they're somewhat of the creators of that, it seemed like. But, um, yeah, it's getting taken to a new level nowadays. Well, we got Kyle Belly coming in, and the clock is run down for Liam O'Brien. O'Brien? will be settling with an equal fifth to start off his year on the championship tour. And Kyle Belly on to the semifinals. Thank you, Seth Moniz. Yeah, thanks for having thanks me. Thanks again, Ross. A lot of fun. When we return, quarterfinal three in the water, Felipe Toledo and Joao Chianca. It all happened last September for this young man, Felipe Toledo, nine long years on the championship tour with one dream that he accomplished in two straight title match wins over Italo Ferrer at Lower Trestles, and it is his new home break. He's been there for a while in San Clemente, California, known as the fastest surfer on the planet. If it was day, it was his day to throw down a lot of searing carves to hold up that Incredible world title trophy, tears from his eyes and his family with all the ups and downs along the way. And he comes into this season a different man. 
guy with the yellow jersey showcasing that he was the best surfer in the world in 2022. Five final showings out of 10 regular season events, and this is what he did right off the buzzer in this quarterfinal matchup that he's going to enjoy with Joao Chianca. Thanks for being with us, Joe Terpel with Megan Abubo, who won the Triple Crown and runner-up in the world back in the day. Megan, this is fun. Quarters are on. It's finals day. And your pick so far have been spot on in the first two heats of the day. Yeah, I don't want to brag, Joe, but it's I think great. I did for you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm excited. You know, you, every morning you wake up, you kind of look at the, assess the conditions. And, um, yeah, I made some picks this morning. So... <laughs> Now looking at this one, Felipe versus Joao Chianca. This is a classic. Felipe just into his second ever quarterfinal at Pipe. Joao Chianca, he's in his first finals day. However, he might have made the biggest impression on the world with his willingness to charge and take on wild conditions in that super heat he had with Florence last year. Yeah, and he's a, he has a good air game as well. Uh, he's I love the way he surfs. He has a lot of raw power, um, great style, real fluid. So. This is such an awesome uh, matchup, you know, fellow countrymen. Uh, you know, you have your experienced veteran, Felipe, and then Joao. I, I'm, I'm excited for this heat. Really fun heat, and it's a really great one to talk about an all-Brazilian quarterfinal at Pipeline and seeing how much growth there's been within that region of showing up with serious contenders. You remember the first Pipe title for Brazil came to Adriano de Souza in his title-winning season when he won the final in 2015. That's not too long ago when you consider the longevity of this event from the 70s. As we see Felipe staying active again, just a quiet little look under the hood. Nothing major there. Just incredibly active against Chianca. But the rise of Brazilian contenders, it's more and more each and every year at pipe. As we see the first attempt from Chianca goes up and down. Yeah, Joe, there's been a a real insurgence of Brazilian surfing out at Pipeline. Um, definitely in my generation, you know, there were guys that would surf it really well. Um, but, you know, of course, with Adriano, he winning the Pipe event, um, definitely uplifted. And I think um, Gabriel coming on the scene it really gave the Brazilians confidence, as we see Felipe here kind of eyeing up this little barrel here at back door. Not a lot to offer there, just a quick kind of head dip and then out of it. but. Really impressive Joao here taking off, stalling, getting a nice little barrel here, but unfortunately nose picking there on, on his um, doggy door exit. Thinking about all Brazilian matchups in the last couple of years, Caio had Samuel Pupo last year. Italo and Iago Dora had a quarterfinal in 2019. From 07 to 2018, there was just one all Brazilian quarterfinal. That was the Toledo Medina matchup when Medina clinched the first world title for Brazil. Now these two enjoy the lineup together. Interesting part about the all Brazilian story. Sometimes you ask a guy like Medina, he said these are the toughest draws when it's kind of more personal. It's about their home turf. That's where Medina sometimes has the toughest time taking control of the heat. For Felipe, he's kind of became team captain, especially with Medina's absence last season, where he spent a lot of time with Joao Chianca cheering him on, giving him words of wisdom when he was coming up short with explosive performances. Yeah, and finals day is a emotional competition day and coming up, up against fellow countrymen, your friend, somebody that you actually took under your wing, um, you know, and have to kind of tear down that armor and really, or, you know, not tear down that armor, the opposite, build up that armor again and get out there and beat them. One man that's been doing great things in pipe in the last two seasons, Kaiwa Belly, is with Laura. Kaiwa, the job is not done yet, but you have just made back to back semi finals at the Billabong Pro Pipe. You must be feeling confident, all different conditions. What was the game plan today? Talk about different conditions. Like this morning, I showed up at the beach and uh, we don't have a lot of uh, more time to wait, so um, I knew we had to go. And over there, you, you can't pick if you're gonna have a good heat or not it's just you gotta get um be really focused and try to like um attract the waves to you and i got really lucky i got a few good ones and i had really a lot of fun in the heat um yeah super psyched talk us to that nine point ride what did you see in it yeah it's uh it was a little wider one and i got right under the lip my board was really small and i tried 
bump and I couldn't see a thing and I just saw the the end section coming against me and I'm like oh my god oh my god and I I almost got um, caught by the, the wave coming against me and I just barely made it and yeah I knew it was going to be a good score for this kind of conditions like that's what you want to find if you find that you're pretty you're pretty good and yeah I'm just psyched to make the heat and uh, Liam also is such a good surfer and first uh, tour event and he got third uh, quarterfinals it's a pretty good result for him I knew he was really dangerous I was waiting for um, a comeback any, any moment. And talk us through your surfboard. You were saying you, you thought your board felt a bit small on that? Yeah, so um, it's crazy. Pipeline, like you surf different kind of boards all day long. Like yesterday, I changed boards three times. And it's uh, I, I saw the waves today, and I'm like, I'm going to go a little uh, short board. And it's just like, it's crazy in Hawaii. There's so much water moving, and there's so much chops that, like, you always, it's always good to have a little more board to go through the chop and, and be a little safer. But in these conditions, I knew I had to do a couple of turns, maybe, and uh, I need a smaller board to, to do that. And anything you'd like to say to your uh, family and friends back home? Yeah. Valeu, galera. Obrigado pela torcida. Mais uma bateria. É, descansar agora, porque hoje vai ser um dia longo para nós. Deus quiser. See you to the semi soon. Rest up. Valeo, thank you, Kaya. Thank you, Laura. This guy has got success at Pi back to back seasons into the semifinals once again. Big hack off the top of this one for Joao Chianca and a snap to slide over the dry reef. Explosive surfing for the man from Sakurema. Nice and powerful, and Strider got cleaned up as well. Look at the Waz. He's got that huge pack on. That thing is so heavy. No problem on that duck dive, Megan. No, no problem. <laughs> Shredder's used to it, you know. I mean, this is small stuff for him. <laughs> exactly. Probably exciting. He loves being in the mix of it all. That's what's the best thing about Strider in the water. He just loves being in the lineup. He's like a kid in a candy store when he's uh, going to play-by-play -play with us. Here we see Joao taking off on this one. Look at this huge, aggressive first turn. Love this, setting it up for a nice closeout re-entry there. Yeah, you gotta make do with what you got out there. You can see this perspective right here from the land on the behind him, but look at that, just so crispy on the top there. So much water that he's displacing off of his fins and then comes, sets himself up right here on a frothy re-entry and kind of gets a little tail off there. Yeah, what a great wave he just got. And how cool is that? A board he's never ridden before? It's working well, Joao. Great decision on the 5.11 this morning. Imagine the, the confidence you have to take a, a board out, you know, to the Billabong Pro you've never ridden in your life. Well done for Joao Chianca riding a CI Pro 5.11, 18 three quarters, two and three eighths. He was riding a 6.1 yesterday in competition. So trimming down a little bit makes sense for the de decrease in size as well. Yeah, I was thinking when I was watching some of the surfers uh, evaluating the waves this morning, I was thinking their number one priority right now is probably assessing the equipment that they're going to ride this morning. We've gone to, from big barrels to really high performance surfing. Speaking of the king of high performance, big blast and just couldn't hang on to that explosive opening hack. So right now, Chianka score coming through at a 6.0. Well done. Best number we've seen so far. Even though Felipe's been active, Chianka is trying to show the world that he's good no matter what size it is at Pipe and Backdoor. As we flash back to last season, round of 16, heat number six, Chianka versus Florence. This is one of the heats of the year, one of the heats of the decade. Taking on Florence in his backyard, Joao certainly stepped up big time. Yeah, look at this insane cavern he has in front of him. Ah, just what a beautiful sh aerial view there and just gets absolutely spit out with the barrel. His shorts nearly ripping off of him and right in front of John John. Just a battle going blow for blow. 16 plus totals to a 17 plus total for John in the win. That was an incredible day for pipe history and for this young man's career. Chianka's name was cemented as one of the best to watch last season as part of a very stellar rookie class. The Chianca family famous for what they do in big waves as he's the younger brother of Lucas Chianca who's totally 
totally changed the way you approach big wave lineups from Nazare to Jaws to Waimea, who participated in the Eddy a couple of weeks ago. A lot of love there for the brothers from the Chianca family. Up and out for Toledo. As he's looking at everything at the moment, Megan. Yeah, he's staying busy. And, you know, Joao got that six-point ride, so he knows that he needs to find something kind of at least in the range of that. Uh, he has two low-scoring rides. And, Joe, when you're talking about um, uh, Joao's brother, yeah, it's it's like he, he's some modern-day madman. You know, and he's, he's been in the big wave scene for a while now. Just so impressive, like you said. And the way he surfs big waves like he's surfing trestles or something. <laughs> oh, it's so true. It's like you can't even mind surf with him. And it kind of, I always try to mind surf with Felipe too. And one thing I think you say when you watch Felipe, it's like a video game because it almost doesn't seem real. Speaking of video games, True Surf, you can all download that right now for free on the App Store or on Google Play. You can actually compete in the virtual Billabong Pro Pipeline, battle with your friends in the new challenge system. And some of these people around the scaffolding are incredibly talented at playing true surf. But we get to see that in real time as well with Felipe when he puts on a performance in a 30-minute space. It does the unthinkable right in front of your eyes. Yeah, what he does in front of you in real life, it's, it's almost animated because you couldn't script it better. You, you really never know what Felipe is going to do on a wave. He's so um, unpredictable, and he's he makes nearly all his turns, all his airs, um, and just I love how springy he is, no matter what size the conditions are, and one of the best rail games in the, in the, on tour. And he's so stellar when it comes to really converting quarterfinals. You know, he's on a seven straight win streak in quarterfinal appearances on tour, and he's kind of really got to witness that last year in real time when he made five finals out of the 10 regular season events on road to that world title. That is so dominant. When he gets to a final series, though, he just takes off. 15.45 to go in quarterfinal number three. The defending world champ chasing a 3.77 because Joao is throwing down a six with this wave. Felipe Toledo in motion on his backhand, throws down that full rotation with his eyes closed, doesn't even need a section. He can just lift that sharp eye off the face of the wave and blow like a helicopter through that strong trade. Well done for Toledo. Just trying to make sense of this lineup and turn in some big scores, still chasing Joao Chianca. As Chianca looks like he wants to slide in a back door and aggressively make it a closeout. Just a short tube ride there for Chianca to go with the 6.0 that he had for two big turns on his forehand. Yeah, he's just looking so strong and conditions aren't really easy out there. There's a lot of wind, a lot of whitewash. Um, here he goes taking off, pulling straight into the barrel. 
Finding that doggy door, good way to back up that six. Well done, yeah, such a great tube rider, as we know, and I think the world knows it's soccer in with the CT there. They get so much great surf, and during that last replay, Toledo went left at pipeline and got the exit. Smaller inside too, but a hammer of a backside hack. Yeah, he really knows how to stamp it there, doesn't he? Certainly does, he's so quick in transition. Sometimes it's hard to keep up with the amount of turns that he can throw down on a wave. Change the way you look at certain venues like Jeffreys Bay in South Africa for how he can throw alley-oops on demand on a wave that wasn't ever considered an air wave before. Numbers in for last of Toledo. I should say previous, he had that full rotation. Now has the barrel to be scored. 4.5 for the effort. Last barrel for Joao Chianca, that smaller one at backdoor, 3.57. And yet to see the number for this one. Or excuse me, this is the full road. We saw that at a 4.5. Let's have another look here, Megan. Yeah, he's setting himself up nice right here. Gets to the air, full rotation, beautiful landing. His back foot almost comes off there. I mean, I think we're gonna see some um, more of that today. And just imagine if Toledo does get a bigger section, something the judges to really examine there. That was really just uh, based on his ability to pick that board up, really no air section there. And just that amazing ability to rotate in the wind. He's been doing that for a long time. His little tube on the inside might be a better number. It is, in fact, a 5.0 for Toledo. So he's just been building on numbers scouring this lineup for little bits and pieces and he now needs a 4.58 to catch up to Chianca. 11 minutes on the clock. And they'll let that one roll through and hold the position, not giving each other too much space right now. Yeah, Joe, you wake up on a day like today, if you're an air guy, this is like epic conditions for you. <laughs> uh, and, and, you know, there are barrels out there as we've seen this morning already. So. Um, would be really cool to see uh, barrel to big air combo on, on a couple of those pipe lifts. Really love that. At the start of this heat, we saw our own Strider Wazalewski got washed through on the inside. I just got to check in. Waz, how you doing? We just had another set come through, so we had to reposition. A lot of the water moving over here to off the wall, kind of over here where we're watching the surf from and watching the athletes. And, uh, well, Unfortunately, I got a little too far inside. Was thinking, oh, I got this, and then, bango! We got a couple sets on the head. Backpack uh, took us over the falls, and then we went over and met the reef a few times on the inside there. And then that's when you guys got to see me say hi to Joao after his wave. So, that's uh, you know, there's the reef is definitely very, very shallow in there. And these guys are finishing their waves right on to. I wouldn't even give it a foot. I mean, there's literally no water on the reef in there. So. I just had to go make sure I did some R&D, and I did. I got <laughs> left some fish food in there, a little bit of skin on the reef, but all good. Uh, love it, Strider. Thank you so much for your commitment to getting the best seat in the house and reporting there. And another big shout out to the boys on the Red Bull ski out there, Larry Haynes, getting all the great shots in the water. Abe Lerner, long time lifeguard here on the North Shore, big part of the Hawaiian Water Patrol dodging sets they have to understand the lineup better than anybody and they do striders in great hands as we see an inside pipe wave not much on it for joao might as well take a look toledo with priority a lot of people joe uh, oh here we go it looks like replay joao oh, i'm just pulling into a little barrel there he's really trying to build like you said um he's got a nice six he's sitting on so I think he could be a little more patient, try to improve on that 3.57 that he has in his score line. Um, I was saying earlier, Joe, Larry Haynes, a lot of people at home might not know, but I, everyone's got GoPros nowadays. So Larry Haynes was the guy when the surf was like bigger and you're at sunset anywhere and he would love to take off behind you with this huge camera and say, go, go, go. And you're like looking at him like you're crazy. I don't want to go. <laughs> and you know, he's one of the best in the business, but yeah, he definitely um, was a pioneer when it came to water photography and riding behind surfers. There's Larry Haynes right there. He nicknames that big housing an ice chest. 
such an incredible character to always catch up with and uh, just loves it. Lives for these moments when there's a lot of activity, like big, big open ocean swells. Larry's out there getting the shot. Well done. 7.50 to go in this quarterfinal. Let's hear from Dr. Spencer Chang with Kaipo. I'm here with Dr. Spencer Chang of Hawaii Pacific Health. Uh, Spencer, and you, you and your crew are providing the medical assistance here for both Pipeline and Sunset. Tell us about the role that you, you and your crew play. So basically we need to take care of the athletes. The main thing is to keep them safe, you know, because really bad things can happen at pipe. Unfortunately, it doesn't happen. I mean, fortunately, it doesn't happen that often, but the bad things can be things like near drownings. We've had pelvic fractures, you know, ankle fractures, uh, you name it. A lot of bad things can happen. So we have to be there to make sure that we can take care of these athletes. I was just going to ask you what, I mean, this is the world's most dangerous waves. What kind of injuries do you see here at Pipeline versus the injuries that you would see maybe at the second stop over at Sunset? You know, the reef here is so shallow, and of course, the, the wave is, it is heavy barrels. And so what we see a lot is we see a lot of, you know, heavy injuries that could be like head injuries. I think we've seen pelvic fractures, like I said, femur fractures, near drownings. So those are the kind of things that we may see at somewhere like Pipeline, whereas at sunset, the wave is a, a deeper, it breaks in a deeper uh, ocean, and so it, you don't quite see those type of injuries at sunset. What else does Hawaii Pacific Health, what roles does it play in the islands in general? So Hawaii Pacific Health is the biggest health organization in Hawaii. So we have the gamut of physicians, you know, from primary care to specialty. And so we can take care of the entire island that way, including the, the World Surf League as well. Thank you so much, Dr. Spencer Chang and the crew for taking care of all of the surfers. We got the first responders here all on site in Hawaii on the North Shore, Hawaii Pacific Health. Thank you so much, Kaipo and Dr. Spencer Chang. Great doctors. They love to surf as well. Loves to play his guitar and music, and he loves helping the best surfers in the world just stay in the water and stay intact. Uh, so lucky to have them on board as well. As we have 5.45 on the clock. Abe Lerner's been driving that Red Bull ski the last few days, but it looked like Kamalani Ahui on the Red Bull ski with Larry Haynes for today. Legendary waterman, Terry Ahui, head of the Hawaiian Water Patrol. Yeah, passing the torch down to his son. So cool. It's uh, really like a brotherhood. It's a family, a true ohana of life-saving specialists. I don't think you can pay those guys enough for all the lives they've saved over the years. No, and a, a really cool fact about the Hawaiian Water Patrol is a lot of them are just the, the best surfers on the North Shore. I mean, I've seen... Bunga Perkins as a Hawaiian water patrolman, um, you know, Kavika Foster. Like these guys, some of the, but here we go, live action. Running through this inside pits, Toledo held a great line, managed the space in the tube well before it shut down. Now it's Joao's turn. This one's looking a touch bigger, and he's got the speed to hit the lip. Great connection there to start. That 5'11's looking insane. So much control. There's the finishing hammer for Chianka. Looking to improve on a 3.57. Toledo is looking to improve on a 4.5, 4.21 to go. Wow, Joe, you don't really use the word spicy and backdoor in the same sentence, really, but <laughs> that board looks spicy. Here we see Felipe you no, know, getting a nice little head, head dip there. Uh, this is the water shot right here. He's nice and deep in that barrel, though, and does does definitely find that doggy door out of there. Um, but this is that wave right here of Joao. I love this. Like, look how spicy that first turn is. So quick. Gets himself right back up into the lip, even, like, managed to drift the tail a bit. Close out. Nice snap right there. Water view here. Draws his bottom turn out. But look how fast and quick he is already off to the next section. You can see from behind the wave and just kind of wafts that fin out. I like it. He's surfing so fast and electric right now. Ripping. That definitely looks like a magic carpet under the feet of Chianka. He's got a great support crew from Channel Island Surfboards on hand. Brent Power. Also, Britt Merrick, legendary shaper. Son of Al Merrick, who started it all. And also, Pinga, who's his manager and coach. There's Strider. Get a front row seat. How's he looking on the way back out? 
wow, just the energy coming off, off of his shoulders as he paddled by. Uh, you know, there's so much in that paddle and the posture. And when you catch that vibe when he's going by, the tongue he was literally hanging out of his mouth and the smile ear to ear, you could see that he was feeling that uh, confidence and exuding energy paddling back out at the current world champ, Felipe Toledo. Good man was. Well, Joao Chianca's got a pair of sixes. Toledo now needs a seven to get into the semifinals. 2.30 on the clock. Toledo does have priority. He likes that number seven to begin with, so he might be feeling good even though he's chasing a score with 2.25 to go. Yeah, and, and he has a high IQ when it comes to heat surfing, so I'm sure in his mind, I'd love to be able to get in his brain right now and say, I wonder what he's thinking, like, okay, I need a seven out here right now. I got two minutes to go. Am I going to go to the air? Am I going to go to turns? What am I going to do? Mix it up. Uh, this is where you see that, you know, that the true champ in him come out. Looks like he's going for it now. Two minutes on the clock. The defending world champ wants to stay in yellow, wants to stay in the barrel of back door as long as he can. Exits with a beautiful roundhouse cut back and shuts it down. Electric surfing. The Toledo family loving that performance. And now it's up to the panel to see if it's enough to turn the heat. Remember, he's chasing a seven. It would have to be the best wave we've seen ridden in quarterfinal number three. I mean, I'm not a judge, but, you know, I like it. Here he goes, Pallian, he's he gets straight into the barrel. He's in there for a while, too. Perfectly positioned, beautiful roundhouse cut back here. Hoping there's something more on the inside, and boom, nice hat at the end there. Interesting wave to judge. We can see this point of view, this perspective from the channel. You know, he's nice and deep there. Beautiful positioning. Really nice, clean cut back here. Oh, this is a tough one, Joe. Another great view here. I guess the first things you think about is the size of the sections and what that wave was looking like. For this turn, the wave went flat. However, he kept his speed and then got to the finishing move. So. Maybe the wave size let him down towards the tail end. The barrel wasn't super haunting, but he managed it so well. I mean, he surfed it like a champion with what he had on hand. You think about his destiny with the yellow jersey. He's been in this yellow for a very long time. If he loses this heat, it will be trading hands. Yeah, and it's uh, it's tricky. You know, there, there aren't a lot of barrels out there. So um, and on any given day, barrels are, are scored high right so i like what he was going after but as you said the wave was just a little smaller than we'd like to see scores coming through for felipe toledo 6.4 not enough it was chasing a seven was the best score of the heat but the celebration for joao chianca's support crew will begin pair of sixes to get the win in his first semi-final of his young career on the championship tour as he just beat the defending world champion in this third quarter final. What an exciting show as the two Brazilians will split the peak and Joao will prepare for the winner of the next quarter final. Jack Robinson taking on John John Florence coming up next.
John John. Backdoor. Long wall, but even John John will not find the exit door there. Wait. No, he does. What? What just happened? That'll be a super fun battle against Jack. You know, he got me a market, so um, I'd love to get him back. Here we go, Jack Robinson grabbing rail, pipe barrel, backside, oh. coming out with a spin. Just kind of surfing, huh? Just, just loving it right now. Just, just surfing, staying focused. That's it. Just doing my job. Happy finals day. Quarterfinal number four getting started. What a heat. Jack Robinson from Western Australia, Margaret River, the box, big waves, big barrels, is taking on a local legend, John John Florence, two-time world champ, a pipe champ, called one of the best surfers of all time from what he could do in free surfs and two-foot waves and what he does on the outer reefs right here in his backyard. Five-year difference age-wise with these two. Jack Robinson, five years younger, but two great friends. I think when you surf this well and you have similarities between the two, even going to John loves Margaret River, then Jack loves Oahu. So they love where each other come from, and they don't mind calling each other up to go for a surf when they're in each other's backyard. Yeah, and they both have the same type of waves that they love surfing. Um, that probably that goes on tour as well, and they usually shine in similar types of waves. So. I feel like that's when you're, you know, those are your peers. Those are your sur surfing peers, although everyone does this tour together. When you're traveling, you're all kind of, whoever you really like to surf the same kind of waves with is usually who you're around the most. Really cool. The other day, you know, White Man's been pumping, you know, leading up to the eddy, and Jack Robinson showed up at John's house. There's a really cool clip John posted recently, and they're on the way to White Man. Jack had this classic comment. He's like, hey, John, by the way, you know, I've never surfed out there before. And John's like, I had a feeling you were going to say that. They just had a blast. Obviously, Jack was so ready, so prepared. But they've gone on some really cool missions together. This one much different, though, with so much on the line to kick off the season here at Pipeline. Let's hear from Joao Chianca with Laura. I'm down here with a very, very happy Joao. The job's not done yet, but this is the best result of your career on the CT so far. And your first matchup with Felipe, and you took the win off the world champ. Yeah, um, <laughs> kind of speechless right now. Um, before the heat, we expect so many things, like when we we come up against like these guys and like Felipe, we we expect always like big airs and big scores and amazing surfer. And, I don't know, just so honored to share the, the the outside with him and get the win. Wow, like it's Bila One Pro Pipeline. Like one year ago I was here like getting knocked out by John John on the like incredible waves and here I am like on the finals day making the first impre good impression of the day. So uh, it's good, it feels good. And uh, that first impression on a brand new board apparently. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, conditions got super tricky and smaller, so uh, we didn't have too many days to put these small boards on the wa in the water. We always expect big waves, big surfing out here. So, yeah, my my short boards were like all without stickers and without grip. I just stick them up and went to the water, and like it went just fine. Well, semi-finals, you're either going to come up against John John for a re revenge round, or Jack. Who would you like? Oh, uh, well, both of them are really good surfers. I have a rivalry with John, and I think I do have like really competitive um, atmosphere with Jack inside of the Vulcan House. So it it will be really cool. But I will just try to like keep focus and like play play smart, step by step, wave by wave. So yeah. Well, go get a foot massage from your brother, and we'll see you back out there soon. Thank you, Laura. So good. I love it. What a moment for Joao Chianca into his first semifinal of his career. And will it be a rematch with John John Florence? And how cool, you know, how proud he is that he gets to say he has a rivalry with John John. He certainly does after what happened last year as we see the spring-loaded Florence going incomplete. Going for a big air attempt there. But the bracket is looking exciting. Leonardo Fioravanti took out Jordy Smith early this morning. And then we saw Kaiwi Belly get past Liam O'Brien. That's the first semifinal. This wave just came in as a 5.33, Megan. 
Yeah, he slots nicely in that barrel. I love that finishing turn there. John John just knows this reef so well. You can see it right here. Just pull straight into this little barrel here and then sets himself up for a nice re-entry. It's a water shot here of this turn. Boom, and no stranger to that. He pulled a big one off yesterday. It certainly was huge. He called it, yeah, a little air thingy in his interview. <laughs> a but little it air. it was gigantic. I was ready to max out the score then as well. John came off his personal best, highest combined heat total for himself at Pipe in the last heat of the day yesterday. 19.33 combined total, almost getting a 10. He beat his previous record, 19.23 total he had against Taj Burrow in round three in 2015. I like that we're seeing a little color on his board too. It's, you know, John always renowned for having his clear white boards and stuff like that. I do, I, I like the color. It Flying pops, red. Especially Flying in red. the white water. I think his friends and family love it as well. As we peek over around the bushes. His mom, Alex, so proud of him, encouraging him to be the best he can be. His wife, Lauren, since she's actually from Australia, but you would never know if you just met her. Her accent can completely disappear on demand. She'd be great in the movies. She could just have different types of accents. And, but yeah, she's an Aussie. Happy to call Hawaii her home. Yeah, I had many uh, days out at the sandbars with, with um, John John's mom, like back in the day, you know, and just her and I, there weren't a lot of women in the lineup back then. I mean, I'm talking, John John was probably like eight, nine years old, you know? I love those stories. Jack Robinson is gonna slow down a bit. Stan's got nice and high on that sharp buy. And now a quick reaction time to shut it down. It, uh, Jack's a, a little bit slower. You know, he seems a little more calculated today. Yesterday he was just caught tons of waves and was all over the place. Um, it's always interesting to see quarterfinals or finals day actually when the athletes come in and, you know, they tone it down a little bit. Uh, they've had a couple days of competing. We can see right here. Jack's kind of, he's looking, I think he's searching for a section, but he pulls in there, comes out the doggy door there. End of the day, you know, a couple good turns, or a good turn at the end of that, but not sure if that's gonna go in the, his um, score line. Such a cool style we were talking about, it's hard not to think of Bruce Irons when you see him ride a wave, maybe because of the stickers as well, or a bit nostalgic, for what Bruce used to have on his surfboards. Jack always uh, mentioned them as he looked up to the Irons brothers as he grew up surfing slabs, he wanted to have that same style. He wanted to be radical in big waves and slabs. And he got so good at it so young. Surfer Magazine always used to have a hot 100 for all the Groms. He was always on the top of the charts, but and some. He was leagues beyond the rest of the kids his age, especially when it came to tube riding in hollow conditions. Yeah, aren't you right, Joe? Look at even the way he paddles. Um, that, I mean, that's the way Bruce used to paddle, um, especially from behind. He could he could be the stunt double for Bruce for sure. <laughs> and you get you get the similarities, and maybe that's why they have a common bond. You know, being getting covers when they were little kids, talked about of being the next big thing to happen in pro surfing, and living through it out. You know, without getting any burnout factor and growing with their maturity and how to find their quiet space within it all. They both have done really well at that. As we see the takeoff, and what a way to pull in. Mr. Florence attacking the next section. Draws it off the top again. I don't know if there's that many people that could have found a tube from that entry. I believe Robinson might be coming out, and he has made another barrel of backdoor to add to all the barrels he's made this week at Pipeline. Jack Robinson still had his wave before to enter in, but how about the entry for John here? Yeah, straight into the barrel there, Joe. Stays in there for as long as he can. Beautiful re-entry right here. And then he's not done. John John's looking super good, really quick. Love this water angle. Look at that, straight into the barrel over on the foam ball while he's taking off. Sets himself up here for a nice quick re-entry and then to finish it out right there. Love it. He can create moments for himself with that ability to really take off under the lip. Yeah, he did one of your arm bars just then. So, <laughs> so impressive. 
he really can make conditions look a lot more rippable than it is for the everyday surfer. You'll see him surfing like random waves up and down this coast. Sometimes you'll just be having a barbecue watching it. Oh man, it looks really fun. John's out there and you realize how challenging it really is. How about Jack here? Yeah, wow. That, he, he was really deep in that thing. Look at this. He's like sitting, basically sitting on the foam ball. Super compact, kicks out. It's always interesting when the surfer makes out of the barrel, but then they have to kick out straight after instead of go through the doggy door because of the positioning they are on the wave. This is a classic matchup, two solid surfers. This could easily be a final for many years to come, Strider. Oh, 100%. And, you know, just watching the lineup and being out here, it's a very defining moment when you see those good waves come through. It's a definitely a, a hard lineup to read right now, but when those little nuggets come in, those ones that suck back on the reef and really stand up and give them the opportunity. It's very, uh, you know, defining and watching the two surfers kind of frantically move around when they see it and their headspace of what's happening. It's a really cool note and, and watching them, them ride these waves, they both like the same type of wave, right? These really hollow, heavy waves, but they're both totally different surfboards. If you look at the outlines, you know, John's surfboard is way uh, more of a, a front-loaded board with more more wide point up front, and then you got Jack's board with a, a more traditional center point. So if you look at those boards, completely different, but they love the same waves. Thank you, Strider. Yeah, you love it. Just different takes on equipment to see what works best. John up and out. Numbers in for last exchange. Robinson 5.0. That was the two bride. It's way before the turns 383. Florence built to a 7.17. And that was all on his ability. You'd see that wave, you're like, maybe there's a five in it, maybe a four, but he surfed it up with how technical he was entering that barrel and okay. then finishing with some turns. How cool is this? Jack's in a big heat at Pipe in John's backyard, but we'll never forget what happened last season in Jack's backyard. It was a final at Margaret River main break. Surf was pumping. Everyone knows John's reputation on main break. He's owned that for many years, but it's Jack's territory. It was one of the most exciting finishes to a final we had last season. Everyone thought John was just going to repeat his success. It was all about Jack getting creative, responding above the lip. That was able to take a huge win right at home. Yeah, uh, what, a, what a heat. Yeah, again, Jack just looking like, I mean, it, John John basically put main break right on the map. So for Jack to come out on top of that, that's a huge feat. Like, again, we never see anyone surf as good as John John out there, and Jack did it. Uh, such a special moment in surfing history, especially for these two, as we see that rad approach once again. Lawrence will get caught up. Just a quick fade. He can get so low on his board and incredibly flexible for his size. A big kid. And you can get nice and tight and low in those barrels. Jack will have priority. As John has the lead, Robinson needs a 7-5. John Pysel said this is a new board for John. It's not his first go at it, but it's a fairly new board for his quiver. But likes that red color because it pops in the water, especially in video. Yeah, you know what's interesting about these two surfers as well is they have a uh, same approach kind of to the waves, but they have really unique different styles. Uh, and their board, as um, Strider was noting, their boards are so different. And I think, you know, that really truly brings out their styles. Um, John's approach, uh, they both like the same kind of waves, sections, but, you know, definitely their maneuvers and even just the way that their body positioning is when they're doing their turns is so almost polar opposite to me. Isn't it crazy to think back in 2012, John actually would get some criticism on his style. Remember that? It was pretty wild because he was surfing differently. People were relating him to more skateboarders or snowboarders with what he was doing with his arms at the time. And it was really cool. A young John was just like, I just love the way I surf. And he stuck to what he was doing. And now every kid at every break around the world is trying to copy what John does when they ride a wave. Yeah, it's funny you say that, Joe, because I remember there was an era where um, everybody tried to emulate Mick Fanning or Joel Parkinson and, you know, growing up at long right hand point breaks at Snapper, they had this certain style, bottom turn, top turn combo. But, you know, John growing up on the North Shore, such different types of waves. I love that he stuck with his type of surfing that suits him and the waves that are in front of his house. 
Uh, and now this whole generation, is, as you said, is trying to emulate the way he surfs. It's, it's really great to be able to see all these kids coming up and surfing like John. Uh, so refreshing to see everyone with their own unique style and how they love riding a wave. 13 10 remaining in quarterfinal number four. John leading over Jack Robinson as they're both hoping for a spot in the semifinals. For me, I, it's home. It's this wave that I've grown in and around from being young and just wanting to sit out there in the channel. Eventually paddling to the peak and starting to get some waves to now battling for the scariest wave. It's an evolving life challenge for me. As a kid, it's scary because you want to be out there, but you don't really want to be out there. Then there was my mom who really inspired my brothers and I. We had always check pipe from our house and we had this little tree house that would look straight into the barrel. The days that I didn't want to go out, she'd paddle out on her longboard. And I'd be like, I don't want to go. And she'd be like, no, you should go. Pipe is kind of the apex of it all. We still check pipe from the tree house at my mom's. Nothing's changed. John's so happy to have so much encouragement from his mom over the years as he takes off under the hood and back door. Nice small barrel there, but surfs it so well. There's the fam's reaction. Just a couple houses down from where we're sitting right now. Always so much support in that yard for many years for surfers like John Florence, for Kelly Slater. It's a gathering of this local community as we look at Jack Robinson, who's got some serious momentum back during this section, but he'll get taken down. Definitely had a jump start at that one. Trying to go the distance, still chasing a 7.5 for a chance at a semifinal at Pipe. Let's have another look here, Megan. Yeah, Joe, just driving the, down the line and truly showing us what the definition of back door means. Uh, unable to come out of that one. And we see John right here, nicely straight into the barrel. Nice, trying to improve on that backup score. Good exchange there, though. John was on a 6-2 the other day, now a 6-0. So a couple inches shorter on this ghost model that was made famous, really, in Jack's backyard at Main Break Margaret River. But I don't think he ever really rides anything above a 6-2, unless he's got his big guns for the Outer Reefs or Waimea. But usually when it's bombing at events on tour where people are going for serious step ups, John just stops right at a 6-2. And that rail control he has is second to none. Yeah, we'll even see him at sunset probably ride a 6-2, which doesn't happen. Like a lot of guys don't do that. Now with 8.30 on the clock, Jack and John. John's trying to settle the score as Jack leads 1-0. And that was that big final at Margaret River. They're starting to move. 
up the reef a bit. John's the one with the lead and priority. We'll see how crafty Robinson can get here. Robinson working closely with Leandro Dora, Yaga's father. And they've had a really great connection, a lot of success. And interesting, you see them moving quickly, and there's so much to look at when you look at the horizon, Megan. Yeah, the ocean's moving out there, isn't it, when you're in line with the horizon? And we see Jack right here. He's paddling hard into this one. Definitely created some space just in case that opened up, and that's such a smart play. Just with positioning, when you don't have priority, if you're just far enough away to take a wave off John's watch, it will be Florence pulling into the first section. You can see that red board, and he comes out again. Master of those challenging closeouts. Young Ripper, Gavin Klein, happy to see that barrel complete as we launch Jack Robinson with a ton of speed, wide open. He's looking to sneak out the exit. And he is into daylight. Just missed getting clotheslined by the lip there. Well done for Jack. Yeah, what a nice exchange there. Um, it looked like in the beginning for that, John John actually had his number with that priority call because he, you know, he had priority and he got that this that wave. But then Jack just speeding down the line here, pulls in nice, beautiful barrel there, but almost gets clipped and then just holds on. Right here, the water angle. You can see how fast he's going. We can't see him here, but he's in there. Finds his door out of that. Love this like angle as well. This is straight on what the judges see. Pulls in, he's nice and deep. Perfect timing to come out of that thing. I love how he just grabs his, grabs a wave, the, uh, the whitewash with his back arm and just springs right up. Jack Robinson battling with John Florence, but how's John again? <laughs> right now during that last replay on the foam ball and i think robinson was like oh thank goodness seeing that red paisel pop up a rare fall for john because it feels like he's making everything he takes cameramen by surprise everyone on the beach by surprise with the spaces he can create inside the pit strider what a great last exchange oh it's so fun and you know what the, the best part about being out here in the lineup uh, is the reaction from the crowd on the beach. So we're here at finals day, and you can just hear the crowd roar when the guys come out of the barrel. Uh, and so obviously for John, you, you hear these loud roars, but after that last one for Jack, same thing, beautiful. So fun to hear it. Thank you, Waz. Jack just made another barrel and shuts it down with a clean off the top. Matty Bemrose loves it. He's one of the loudest guys you'll ever hear. Whistling, laughing, clapping. He, he supports his team riders till the end of every event. He's done so much for Jack over the years. He inspires him to perform at his best. It's a great team on tour as we check out the view from this angle. Yeah, nice and deep on that barrel. Pull straight in. Just a little re-entry right there, but just so many waves ridden here. Jack's really starting to go up a gear right there. He's, I mean, the amount of waves that were exchanged, we see John on this one, pulls into a beautiful looking barrel there. You know, not in there for super long time. And, and John, of course, he's got two pretty good scoring rides. So he's looking to improve on his 5.7. Real exciting battle. And it's really cool, the opportunities they're creating for themselves. It just brings you back to that relationship with an ocean when you know how you can create space. Some surfers, when they're new to a reef like this, they might not be getting even all these reps in because they're not sure what to look for. Jack and John with so much time out here. This is a super heat, 410 to go. Yeah, Joe, they know the reef really well, as you, you mentioned. Um, they know the right waves to look for. And yesterday, Ross said something really interesting. He said, uh, John, wills the wave he wills the win he wills the maneuvers he wills the barrel to come so it is truly i think jack's actually showing us the same thing they're both willing these these good scores out there today gotta love that and you gotta love the consistency of jack robinson that he's still enjoying from last season only losing two of his last seven quarter final appearances as the judges react to jack 6.67 Waiting on one more score from Jack. 
Johns are in 717 5.7 so Robinson chasing a 6.21 still waiting for that last number 315 to go winner takes on Joao Chianca in the second semifinal yeah such a close heat right and a lot of waves were ridden by both surfers super consistent in this heat and now numbers about to average out Jack gets the lead change 717 to match John's best now it's coming up to the second score to decide this heat. Florence, priority, 250 to go. Needs a 6.67. All quiet in the Florence camp. Yeah, they're going blow for blow, exchange for exchange. Everybody, I mean, we, we can hear cheers from both sides. This was the 717. They got Jack out in front. Yeah, nice and deep into that barrel. I love it. And then here he's setting himself up. You got to finish strong out there. Barrels and maneuvers, combinations. That's what the judges are liking today. Aerial view of him pulling into that one. Just coming straight out with that foam ball. Finishes it off here. You know, both surfers showing complete repertoire out there. Being able to get barreled on a tough date like today. And also doing some really nice turns to finish their waves off. So true, and it's a really good comparison. I mean, they got the same number, and you just want to remind viewers that the judges had different opinions. So if you take, you know, Judge 5 on Jack's last wave, he threw that a 7-5 on jo Judge 5 on John's 7-1-7. He threw a 7.0. So there's different opinions. It ended up averaging out the same. Yeah, you know, whenever you have judges involved, um, our judges are wonderful, but... Everyone's always subjective a little bit. We all have things that we, we like, although we have a criteria that we judge off of. Um, and that's what's amazing about judging. You know, you throw out the high and the low, and you get that average consistency, and that's something you can always count on. You oh, it's so true. And, and you love it because that's when you know you have a great heat, when they're matching each other with scores. The battle is real serious now with a minute five on the clock. Under priority, Jack is going here, and he's got it. A great section to make it out of. Another great tube ride for Jack. Meanwhile, Rob Florence is sitting out the back. 50 seconds. Remember, the yellow jersey's up for grabs with Felipe Toledo out in the previous quarterfinal. Can Florence pull something off on his home break in the dying seconds of this heat? Yeah, interesting heat. We saw a lot of the energy go towards John John, um, the waves, and then at the end of here, it was kind of going towards Jack, where John has another opportunity here, fully capable of, of getting the score as well. Still real quiet down at the Florence camp. His support crew wearing bright yellow so they could see him and hear him. Ten seconds, that's not the wave. And they're into the countdown. Maybe that was the last chance for John. John Florence and Jack Robinson remains undefeated over his good friend, Dave Riddle. Matty Benrose celebrating the win for Jack Robinson as he's into his first semifinal here at Pipe. And he'll take on Joao Chianca here on Finals Day. We're going to take a quick break. Finals day continues. Women's semifinal number one coming up next. Lakey Peterson taking on Tyler Wright. We'll be right back.
unbelievable power display of hacks. Tyler swinging again, pulls in, cool style, and she will come out. She finds a little runner here, back door, pulls in, slotted deep. It's time for the semifinals at the Billabong Pro Pipeline semifinal number one for the women out in the water. Lakey Peterson, red jersey, Tyler Wright out in blue, and we're getting to the pointy end of competition here at CT1, the first stop of the championship tour. I'm Kai Pagura, along with Ross Williams and Dimity Stoyle. Dimity, uh, your assessment, first of all, of the semifinal. Aloha, Kai <laughs> Yeah, uh, that was just very exciting. I think I'm just, uh, yeah, really excited to see the girls now because what a finish that was to that heat, just blow for blow. Ross, why do you feel about that last heat? I w actually, I want to let's move on. We're going to get into the semifinal <laughs> right now. Let's just talk about let's just talk about Lakey Peterson and Tyler Wright semifinal number one. Well, it's uh, it's tricky out there, and there there is some big scores. There's there's definitely some critical sections. There's some fun little barrels here and there. You just have to be uh, again a, a truffle pig. You got to sniff them out. Uh, they're not really obvious when they come in, um, so you got to be really clever. And then also, you, there's the rhythm thing. Like Jack got into a great rhythm in the last uh, few minutes of that heat. Waves need to come your way, but you have to keep striking. Yeah, both um, both of these women did make it to the semifinals last year here at Pipeline. Tyler going down to Moana Jones Wong and Lakey going down to Carissa Moore. So it is not uncharted territory for either, but the goal is to win this thing. Tyler Wright's gonna get the first chance. Snaps off the top there, glides down the line, high float, puts it down, no problem for Wright. Arcing turn, more open face, solid start for Tyler Wright. Yeah, and one of the... Uh Interesting notes for, for Tyler and for a lot of the contestants is, uh, you know, she stays right here every winter, right on the beach, and surfs out here at Backdoor on days just like this a lot. So she'd be familiar with the way the wave breaks, how to find those little barrels and sections. She's used to doing turns at small Backdoor. You know, some surfers won't paddle out when it's like this, but uh, I see Tyler out here a lot. Dimity? Your thoughts on this opening ride for Tyler Wright? She's looking solid. Yeah, she's looking so energized. And, uh, yeah, just even her, you know, paddling around the lineup, hunting that wave. Well, showing how shallow it is yeah. right there with Tyler Wright getting the board caught uh, on a coral head dimity. Yeah, yanking that leash. Um, hopefully she doesn't snap it on the next one because that generally can happen if, if the leash you know, gets wrapped around a coral head, can can nick it a little bit. Yeah, and not like it's a, like coral heads out here, Ross. They're more like a, a lava reef, right? A hard lava reef. Yeah, exactly. It's it's so mature. It's like cement with uh, all kinds of little uh, caves and uh, weird little valleys. Um, but there is a little trench right there where she paddled out. She found that little puka. You can see there's uh, that blonde sand that's showing. That's the channel. Lakey finding a little barrel on the takeoff. Peterson then kicks out, wants to regain priority as Tyler Wright is still on the paddle back out. Oh, here we go with a paddle battle, Dimity. Yeah, well, <laughs> Tyler just kind of cruising out the back. I don't know if she's seen where Lakey is. And uh, yeah, it just shows these girls are hungry to get these semifinals started. Wright's not gonna wait for priority, here she goes. Wave number two for Tyler Wright. Drops in, beautiful barrel, threads through that first section, gets the completion, high float on the inside, puts it down and yells at the beach as she should. A dominant Tyler Wright in the opening exchanges, Ross. Yeah, and that was really well spotted. So that's just what we were talking about. You have to find it. Uh, you know, that's not an obvious backdoor wave. This is all the way kind of pushed up against the channel at off the wall. Uh, as she was paddling back out, and there's, you know, that's the other thing we talk about is just being in the right place at the right time. And then Tyler, this is the kind of wave, uh, Dimity, that she surfs great on. She's got good instincts, so she read this barrel well, and she really knows how to finish a wave. She's a competitor. Oh yeah, she read that wave so well just to slide out of the doggy door at that 
uh, perfect time and managed to get that huge finish. And look, she's probably looking straight up to her teammates up in the house and going, come on. Like, she definitely is one of those surfers that gets fired up by the people that she surrounds herself with. Really emotional, isn't it? She, you know, even her post-team interviews, it always looks like she's uh, like really soaking in the emotions of the moment. Uh, and I, when she gets fired up, that helps her a lot. Yeah, definitely. Let's hear from the last heat winner. It was a spectacular battle between Jack Robinson and John John Florence. Jack's ended up on top. He's on the glass with Laura Enever. Jack, wow, that heat was always going to be exciting. You have just made yourself known to being the comeback king. In the last five minutes, you turned that heat around in, in about three minutes. Talk us through it. <laughs> yeah, I try. No, um, that was a cool heat. He was in a better rhythm at the start and, um, yeah, just... Took me a little bit of searching to try and find the waves, but I feel like we were both hunting, like we both knew what waves we wanted. So, yeah, it was uh, always going to be like a little battle just to, to get those waves. And, um, yeah, it's cool. It was just go surf and silence between us in the lineup. It's, it's fun doing that. It's nice. And you were talking about how you both know this wave so well. You both have been barrel experts since you were about 10 years old, but how cool is it to go out in conditions like these and uh, get the job done? Yeah, it's cool. I mean, we're from pretty similar places, Western Australia. It's so similar here. He loves there, and I love here. So, yeah, it's uh, you know, it's always always a good battle for sure when we come up against each other, and hopefully many more to come. And you're into the semi-finals. One of your best results here at Pipeline. How good does that feel? Yeah, it's cool. Uh, just one by one. You know the deal. <laughs> what are they feeding you up at that house? You and Joao, let's go. Special juice, Red Bull. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll let you rest up. And uh, we'll see you in the semifinals. Okay, thank you. There you go. Well, our men's bracket is starting to fill in all the way to the semifinals. Just four surfers remaining in competition for the men. So we can take a look at our men's bracket here at the Billabong Pro Pipeline. Semifinal number one, Leonardo Fioravanti versus Kaiwi Belly. Your thoughts on that, Dimity? Yeah, no, I think... Uh Kaio's had a really crazy rhythm in this whole event so far and 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 Leo's had just been grinding them out too, finding absolute nugs under priority and they've both been impressive. Right down the middle with Dimity Stoyle. Your thoughts on <laughs> semi-final number two, uh, Ross? Leave Dimity alone. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, it's... Uh, all four of these surfers have a really sharp radar. Um, and I'm gonna keep saying this today, you know, whoever can find those waves that are hiding right in plain sight, they're gonna do well. Um, the, the judges love to see critical sections. Uh, and if you can find those juicy little barrels and those closeout maneuvers, you're gonna, you're gonna get it. And sometimes it can happen just like for Jack in the last three minutes, you just have to keep striking. And Kaipo, just to clear the air, Jack, I'm going with Jack Robinson today. Uh, oh, that's <laughs> why. I, there you go. There you go. And, you know, I'm going to give up. I, you know, my, my fantasy surf has been absolutely decimated. But my power surfer is Jack Robinson. So Jack wins. I get double the points. So there you go. Yeah. Ross is staying neutral throughout the whole. Out of those four surfers? Uh, let's see. I think uh, Joao. All right, I like it. Joao will get it. Yeah, he's dangerous. They're all really similar, though. They all have what it takes to find those waves, and and they like they're consistent. They have wider stance. They they know how to put down a big closeout maneuver. Yeah, you know who needs to find some waves right now is Lakey Peterson, because as we look at the scores right now, an excellent score of an eight point ride backed up by a four point five for Tyler Wright. Lakey Peterson is in a combination. She needs two waves of 12.5 or better. She does have priority. Looks like she likes the look of, looks of this one. And she's gonna go. Peterson looks discontent, kicks out priority. Error to Lakey Peterson, Ross. Yeah, and that's that fine line between staying busy, catching waves and trying to find something and you know giving up priority on a, on a dud. Uh, but she's got a lot of time left on the clock. The scale is set kind of high, uh, that eight point ride. It was a well-read barrel, um, and it was sort of a juicy section, so I get it. It's like excellent surfing today, but you'd say the scale set high. So for Lakey, she needs to not get too excited uh, and too down on her luck. She needs to stay positive, realizing she can get an 8 too. 
Yeah. I'd like to say aloha and mahalo for watching to our local audience watching on the Sur Spectrum Surf Channel, channel 20 and 1020 on your box. Thank you to the entire Spectrum crew. Greg Fujimoto and crew doing a great job. And if you miss any of the action, you can turn locally, you can turn to the Spectrum Surf Channel for a replay of today's event. 23 minutes and 15 seconds, and so far it's been all Tyler Wright, Dimity. Lakey Peterson now needs to fight back. These two have been uh, in a number of matchups in their long career. 11th season for Lakey Peterson, 12th season for Tyler Wright. Let's take a look at our WSL stats with the head-to-head -head matchups between Peterson and Tyler Wright. Yeah, look at that. That just shows you how long they've been on tour at the same time together. And there's been a lot of fun matchups between these two. Tyler getting the nudge just by one heat. So, uh, yeah, love the max heat score, though. 17.03. These girls push each other. Yeah, Ross. And when we look at their averages, 2.3. 12.33, 12.62, pretty similar there on the average. Yeah, this is very even. Uh, looking at those numbers, this is a, a very even match. And, uh, you know, they they serve a little different, too. Lakey has a little more flair. She can do an air and a heat. Uh, Tyler's got, I think she relies on her power surfing. Uh, she does. She's into that grab rail carve um, that she gets scored so well for. So a very even battle here, but two different approaches, really. 22 minutes with Tyler Wright with heat control. A lead comboing Lakey Peterson and Priority Dimity. What's the play now for Peterson? Yeah, I think uh, it's probably an advantage for her now that she doesn't have priority. She can try and move away from Tyler and just try and get busy now that because she did, you know, use that priority on a bit of a dud before. Um, yeah, when we first woke up this morning, it, there actually didn't look like there were a lot of right handers. It was closing out a lot. So the last couple of hours, those rights have um, gotten a lot cleaner and, and um, it's going to be a, an even match for these two now. Ross, you have a trained eye on the North Shore. Why are we seeing more rights develop? I think uh, as the interval drops, uh, as the swell period drops, you're going to see more A-frames, little broken swell lines. Also, there's big ribs going sideways across the lineup. Believe it or not, even though that's kind of a messy deal, it does help the waves break up. So some of these closeouts are turning into opportunities. Quick paddle by Lakey Peterson. Right behind her, Tyler Wright. Tyler decides not to go. Peterson was looking back, uh, observing Tyler because Tyler does hold priority. But you cannot do kind of a fake walk, you know, Ross. The priority will switch if that occurs. Yeah, our priority judge will keep a keen eye on that. So if you're deemed to be using a little too much strategy and blocking uh, the non-priority surfer, uh, they'll take your priority away. A little bit of a positioning dance going on in the water. Beautiful day. Illustration of the shallow bottom dimly that's under our surfers right now and we talked about it before even on smaller days still hazardous because the surfers are way way inside on this shallow yeah. reef there's a lot less water on days like today and that's when you see also people their mindset changes too you know they're having more fun they're they're loosening up and uh, it can be dangerous because on the bigger days there's more water obviously a lot more power uh, but yeah, these, these smaller days can be just as gnarly with the reef. Looking at Lakey Peterson starting to break away, Ross, giving herself a little bit of space from Tyler Wright. Tyler slowly pursuing her. And priority switched over to Lakey. Love these drones. There you shots. go. Yeah. And great point. Uh, that, that little fake, fake by Tyler Wright. And we just were talking about that circumstance. Even though you have priority, you can't fake like you're looking at a wave and have the other surfer pull back and that's exactly why priority did switch into Lakey Peterson's favor. Watch this. Lakey's looking back. Tyler kind of faked her out a little bit. Our priority judge in the tower says, no, 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 can't do that. Lakey, you get priority. Well spotted. Really close, uh, that was a close call. It could have gone either way because Tyler still had one arm on the rail, like on the nose of her surfboard trying to do that one arm paddle thing which 
didn't work in that <laughs> situation. It was well well spotted by Ratso, but I will say it was also sold well by Lakey because yeah, she kind of did a nice fake and then a little head lip flick back yeah. at the judges like, oh, I wanted to go. But when you look back that way, it was kind of a closeout. Yep. Peterson finds the barrel, threads through that, comes out with a little bit of spit, lip glide, puts it uh, down. Yeah. Lakey Peterson on the answer back, and she will get out of that combination dimly. Yeah, that was, that was exactly what she needed. Got the priority, found a nice clean little barrel, came out with the spit, and then just did a big finish turn. So, well, if, back in this. If we're comparing Tyler's eight, uh, you know, and that's, that's where the bar is set. This wave, uh, the one thing that will hold it back a little bit, the wave is softer, it's a little smaller, uh, but it was a nice barrel. It was, she was deep. It spit, which is always visually a cool thing for the optics, like, oh, this is a pretty hollow wave so hollow that the wave actually spits its guts out and then a very clean finishing turn here so if it's not an excellent excellent score i'll guess it's pretty close to it she's right back in the heat let's take a look uh, for comparison this is tyler wright's eight ross well it is a little more exciting wave being it's taller it's a little more critical that section right there is a little taller and critical as well so i think that might give her the edge but um lakey's wave was perfect and she surfed it great so even if it falls under the eight, it's going to be right there. It's going to be a good s score. I love just how clean that overall wave was. You know, it's such a n it's so nice when you see the conditions have been so messy and mixed up, and then you just see a nice, perfect, beautiful, a little smaller than Tyler's, but yeah, very visually pleasing. 6.33 drops for Lakey Peterson. She's still trailing Tyler Wright, but she's reduced that deficit. Broke her way out of that combination. Now she just needs a 6.18. Let's take a look at the judges' numbers and how we got to that 6.33 for Lakey Peterson. One judge going as high as a couple judges with the 6.5s. They're also low of a 5.5. Live action back to Tyler Wright. Two manual there for Tyler Wright. Fights for the finish and gets it. Oh, Tyler's surfing really well. She's ripping. Uh, she's reading these little, these little backer waves can be tricky to time it. Ooh, out the back. Catching up with Lakey Peterson. Emerging from a backdoor barrel. Peterson's going to kick out ahead of Tyler Wright and look to regain priority. And Tyler on the foreground, just in some really shallow reef there, having to bail her board. Wow, how quickly can the energy change in a heat, you know, from one priority switch up just to the rhythm of both surfers completely changing. And to your point, Dimity, the wind has switched a little more favorable to the east, so we're seeing cleaner conditions. That's going to equate to better barrels, easier barrels. Wow, so that's a taller wave compared to the 6.3, which, by the way, I thought would be closer to, to, to Tyler's. Um, I was a little surprised by that score. Uh, that is a bigger way for Lakey, and that's going to grab more attention from the judges. Again, Kaipo, that's that buzzword, critical. Is it, is it a bigger wave? Is it, you know, does it have a little more of that girth on it? And it did. What I think is going to happen is Tyler Wright's going to improve upon her score line. She's going to get north of a 4.5, which she's currently holding. The requirement right now for Lakey Peterson, a 6.18. So that requirement should grow, but that performance by Lakey Peterson was a great one. That was a clean barrel, a nice exit, a beautiful turn, Dimity. So uh, I think we're really going to be on the line as far as the change. Okay, 5.17 does drop in for Tyler Wright. Now Lakey needs a 6.85. Oh, yeah, I loved the turn that Lakey did straight out of the barrel. She had so much speed and just laid into that big carve. Yeah, I'm interested to see what the score is. It was a bigger wave than her 6.3. It's not out of the question that she'll get the 6.85. Yeah. Look at Look this. At bo both surfers kind of getting mowed right there. It's a difficult paddle because you can't really duck dive there. It's too shallow. Lakey Peterson, this is a replay. We're still waiting for the score. So, yeah, that turn right there, just so fast and critical. And the speed she had was really nice. Yeah, it was. Uh, she kind of surprised everyone. She caught this wave really quick. Uh, but again, a, a little bit bigger wave, so again, a little more critical section. Uh, and then this turn, steeper section again, and she really uh, carved through it nicely. So that's a nice power turn for Lakey. That's a seven. Did. That's a seven for Lakey Peterson. 
She has taken the lead. However, we still need one more number for Tyler Wright to make this. We'll find out that number when we return to the conclusion of semifinal number one here at the Billabong Pro Pipeline. The Billabong Pro Pipeline is brought to you by Billabong, official apparel brand of the Billabong Pro Pipeline, by Turtle Bay, official resort of the World Surf League, and by 805 Beer, properly chill. I'm Kelly Slater. I committed my life to this, you know, all of this. There is so much pressure now. It's really do or die. He's not coming here to participate. He's coming here to win. Her career is at stake. You want to perform in the big stage? This is the biggest stage you can have. Oh, my goodness. This is sport history. Make or Break, season two, available on Apple TV Plus. February 17th, where we will be debuting the first four episodes. Those four episodes will chronicle the behind the scenes of the 2022 championship tour. Previous to the cut, a week later, we will, pre we will be debuting the final four episodes. Tyler Wright, tube hunting, finds a barrel, gets under the hook, High line exit for Tyler Wright. Looks to the oncoming section, gets a nice thin throwing snap, looking for a 5.33 to retake the lead off of Lakey Peterson. Dimity? Yeah, that was uh, just a smaller size barrel, but she managed to thread through a couple of sections in a row and then did finish it really strong. Ross, your assessment. She scrambled away under priority, so uh, Lakey gave her this wave. It was a small barrel, but it was well surfed, and I really like the, the spark on that little tail side there. Board looking great, so shout out to Paisel. That's a, a fast looking surfboard for Tyler. She's surfing really well. That board's looking really nice. I love how um, it, it's, it's, it looks fine when she's surfing it. She's, got, she's able to just um, surf really loose and free up the fins. That looks like a fast board, and I, I'm definitely thinking she's going to get that score, Kaipo. So, veteran move there for Tyler. She's such a sharp competitor. Yeah, just back and forth. And when you look at the score line, the two wave score line, that eight for Tyler Wright is invaluable when you look at the framework of this heat because Tyler does not need a lot to retake the lead, but still waiting for the judge's decision. One number's come in, and it's above the line, but we need four more to make it official. And for Lakey, you know, she has a lot of time left, even if Tyler does get the score here. She just looks needs to look for a wave that is a little more on the juicy side. She needs a set wave and to break through that, that seven-point ride again. 5.43, right takes the lead. There you go with all the judges' numbers on the bottom. And this is another look at the 5.43. Yeah, 
Yeah, really well timed. She totally maxed out the barrel time there, stalled and then let go. Really zippy little tail side there from Tyler. I like that score. Yeah, it does look like a... I just love this turn here. You see how the board looks like a lot less foam that she, than what she normally rides, and it's suiting her so nicely, I think, and definitely, I think a lot of the points came from that turn. Yeah, Tyler Wright arrived on the North Shore. John Paisel greeted her with a truck full of brand new boards, and it looks like uh, John's got them pretty dialed. Again, our surfers are competing, but so are our shapers. CT Shaper rankings are in effect for the 2023 Championship Tour. Quarterfinals and on is when your Shaper is earning points. So Lakey Peterson, not just earning points for herself, she's earning points for Channel Islands. And Tyler Wright is putting up numbers for John Pizel. And for Lakey, she is on a, a really good looking board as well. A six foot board, so much bigger. I think Tyler's on a 5'9", Pizel. So uh, for Lakey Peterson, she is on a Brit Merrick uh, C Pro 6.0, a little more standard round pin, three fins, where Tyler's looking for a little more sensitivity, and that's why how she was able to kick those fins free. Uh, Tyler looking for maybe a little more stability. Yeah, and I did check out Lakey's quiver in the athlete zone, and they do look very um, traditional, nice, beautiful Hawaiian uh, shape boards. Oh, not shaped in Hawaii, but for Hawaii, you know. So, um, and then... Tyler's just on your traditional shortboard, uh, just able to get so loose and dig the rail in. So very different. Yeah, sorry. So Lakey looking for, I meant to say, for a little more stability with the round pin, six foot board. Uh, so it's a pretty big discrepancy between her and Tyler, the size of boards, a 5.9 to a 6.0. Here comes a wave. Lakey Peterson with priority. 6.44 is the number she needs. Decides not to go on that one. Still plenty of time on the clock. And as Lakey's waiting for another wave to come through, let's go track down Laura Enever. Where are you, Laura? Well, if you have not been down the road to check out the new and improved Turtle Bay Resort, I would get down there ASAP. I've been spending a lot of time down there, but they have bought a slice of this stunning resort up here to the Turtle Bay VIP zone. They were shucking oysters up here yesterday, serving drinks, and it is well and truly the best seat in the house to watch the final day of the Billabong Pipe Pro. Yeah, that's right. Nice, nice things. And they had the oysters out there yesterday. Uh, my good friend, Hopena Pokipala, over there, Hopena, and his oyster shucking company uh, brought some delicacies over here. Tasty. Rocky over there serving with his dog. Jamie O'Brien teaching <laughs> lessons. Turtle Bay is where it's at. Yeah. <laughs> Got to check out the uh, Alaya restaurant as well. It's some uh, four-star dining there at the Turtle Bay Resort. Your treat, Kaipo. Let's go. Let's go. <laughs> okay, you got it. Five minutes, 30 seconds. Uh, Lakey Peterson, priority. 6.44 is the need for the surfer from Santa Barbara, California. Tyler Wright's freed up under priority. Tyler Wright finds another little bubble. And that one, no harm, no fall, will not change the situation. Really close heat with Jack and John, uh, and a repeat here, very close heat uh, score-wise with Tyler and Lakey. I mean, there's hardly anything between them. 13.43 and just a tenth of a point behind with uh, Lakey. Yeah, and that's what we were saying before when their stats, head-to-head -head stats came up. They're so equally matched. They've had 7-6 uh, as the, you know, as their um, winning percentage each, but it's, it's, it's good because they're so... They're, you know, they're like veterans now, these two. And Tyler starting with the eight-point ride definitely didn't throw Lakey off. She was straight back, stole the rhythm back off Tyler, got the seven and the 6.33. Tyler fought back with 5.43. So these two are definitely making it exciting for us. So thank you. I think the big difference, Kaipo, between the seven of Lakey and the eight from Tyler was a closeout section. Mm. You know, Lakey had the benefit of a left coming at her after that barrel and got to bang that closeout pretty gnarly section. That's where this heat's lying. And I like the point, that Dimity, that you, made, that you just pointed out is that when we look at the semifinals, they're all veterans except for Betty Lou Sakura Johnson. Uh, Carissa Moore on tour 13 seasons. Lakey Peterson on tour 11 seasons. Tyler Wright 
on tour 12 seasons. There's been a lot of talk about the new generation, right? Coming on to the championship tour, but at the start and pipeline, it's the usual suspects. It is. It's it's funny how that tends to happen. And the first half of the tour before the cut line are very uh, tr just challenging spots that, that uh, yeah, the, the veterans um, can can sort of rise to the occasion in, in waves like that. Yeah, and Kaipo, just to pile on to that conversation, the the waves for this event have been super tricky. And when the waves are, are difficult and tricky, veterans usually shine. Yeah, that's when the game comes into play, right? The chess match and, and yep. heat strategy and right. your overall heat IQ. Priority usage. Yeah. Yeah, veterans get pretty comfortable when it, when it gets tricky. Let's take a look at our heat recap, starting with Tyler Wright, Dimity. Oh, yeah, straight into that one and uh, gets, a, gets a big finish on this. I love the airdrop. I think that was so critical, and she loves it as well. Ross, Lakey yeah. Peterson was able to answer back. I think, you know, actually Lakey's surfing a little faster, uh, and she's, you know, throwing down some nice carbs, but the difference in his heat for Tyler is just that closeout section off the wall. The, the judges really like those critical sections. Yeah, Finding a nice backup is a key. And this was the backup for Tyler Wright. Exciting finish, Dimity, with that throw tail. Big fin throw. She turns around. She's feeling that one as well. So it's definitely close. Down to two minutes and 20 seconds. And pretty tense out in the water for Lakey Peterson. All the scores on the board there. Five waves ridden by Tyler Wright. Four by Peterson. And you can see the highlighted top two waves that equal the score line. Well, if you could order a wave right now in the backdoor menu, you would order, if I'm Lakey, you're gonna order, a barrel is fine, you know, that'd be great, but just a, give me a closeout section to hit. Because that's really what obviously the judges are telling them. Like they wanna see those sections that have a little more risk. So the order would be a barrel, barrel royale with a side of closeout. Well, cheesy closeout. Yeah. Cheesy closeout. <laughs> with a nice, <laughs> Heavy section on the end. Drop your wallet on that <laughs> cheese ball section. <laughs> <laughs> One minute 25, and looks like there's some lines out to see, but you know, with the this swell angle, not it's not guaranteed that all the energy is going to hit the reef here at Pipeline. Yeah, it's it's really breezy too, and it's meant to get even windier the next two days, so. Uh, you know, sometimes it's hard to see those lines come in. There's there's some huge uh, white caps and chops out the back. Under a minute. It's going to be go time for Peterson. Lakey needs that 6.44. Looking back at the beach, checking her positioning, just hoping for a peak to come through. With 40 seconds on the clock, that would be three waves hitting the reef at this point. There's number one. I <laughs> love the, the, uh, the timing. You've done your homework, Kaipo. <laughs> and uh, going under number two. A situation like this, she's a... This is... She doesn't take this one for sure. It's going to be the end on the next one. So that's it. Handshake that's time. that's number three, and number four is not going to get there in time. Yeah, that was another close heat. Now Tyler is eking away a little bit. Was it uh, seven to six? Now it's eight to six. Oh, yeah. Wreck their heads up. Well, Tyler Wright on to the finals. Lakey Peterson with a semifinal finish. Nice start to the year. Tyler Wright is going to make it. Who's going to meet her? We're going to find out. Semifinal number two in the water.
I was definitely at home watching it and I'm like, should I be watching it? Should I not be watching it? And I actually was rooting for Steph because I was like, okay, she's going to be tired. She'll be tired. This is great. So we want Steph to keep going. And then she, uh, she got there. I was like, oh, all right. Well, yeah, <laughs> well, she has a lot of momentum and I'm jumping in the water like cold turkey. It felt like I was swimming upstream that day. One on one with Carissa Moore. You can catch the full conversation with Carissa and Joe Turpel on WorldSurfLeague.com. Welcome back to the Billabong Pro Pipeline. We are in women's semifinal number two. And I'd like to welcome to the set Megan Abubo. Thank you for joining us, Megan, as well as Dimity Stoyle. Megan, this matchup, semifinal number two, is kind of a master and apprentice matchup in, in a way of Carissa Moore and Betty Lou Sakura Johnson. Yeah, really excited to watch this matchup. You know, there's a little history between the two. And as you said, we have two different generations of women surfing here, both surfers from Hawaii and both powerhouses, gr great barrel riders. So this is going to be exciting. Uh, our takeaway from the first semifinal, what, do, what do, we, do we expect in semifinal number two, Dimity? Yeah, well, it's pretty much the opposite. That first one, we just had two regulars just going against each other like they've done for the last 10 years or so. And this one is uh, going to be really exciting. We've, we definitely knows, know that there's a, a really nice little rivalry starting between these two, and, and I love it and uh, it's exciting to watch, and we'll see who gets the win. Yeah, if we look back to... Uh 2022, well, actually 20 to 21, where Beilu Sakura Johnson uh, took out Chris Moore in a final at Haleiwa. Um, and, it, and that was kind of like the starting point of the, the ascending of Betty Lou into the championship tour ranks. There she is, it's 16 on her back, and she chose the number because she was just 16 years old, Megan when she made the championship tour. Yeah, she was, and she did it in fine fashion at her home break, you know. she. Um, I like what you said about uh, this matchup, Kaipo, because, I mean, I know we're talking rivalries, but they're different generations, right? But Carissa, she does have a target on her back. Yeah. Uh, five, five world titles. Yeah, well, let's take a look. I mean, I said master and apprentice. This time, 2021, Haleiwa, the apprentice, took it to Auntie Carissa with her performance, the Queen of Holly, Eva Dimity, <laughs> putting it down. Auntie Carissa and, yeah, Betty Lou is just so fun to watch out here at Holly, Eva. She knows this wave so well. She lives across the road. Um, every time I'm free surfing with her, I sit next to her. <laughs> <laughs> but she just, she was throwing huge turns every single wave. And her wave selection there is incredible. She backs it up with huge turns. And she's up against Carissa Moore, 10 on her back. It's a perfect number in surfing. Five world titles, Olympic gold, 13 seasons on the championship tour. She's been twice a runner up here at Pipeline, Megan. So on paper, you gotta go with Carissa Moore in this matchup. You do uh, with the experience and there's really only one other surfer or two in the world that are more accomplished than Carissa Moore is. Uh, and uh, like, as you noted, Olympic gold medalist, uh, not only uh, above all that, she's a local girl um, representing Hawaii here in her home waters. And she's one of the most powerful women surfers on tour. And, you know, Pipeline is no weak wave. So this is a great matchup for her surfing out there. Turn to social right now and look back with, uh, the, we talk about the master and the apprentice. Take a look at social right here with Betty Lou Sakura Johnson in the post of just some of Chris's sea stars back in the day with Auntie Carissa mentoring all these young surfers, Dimity. I love that. And, you know, it's almost like, uh, it's just, look how tiny she is. And um, There's a little Luana Silva as well in there. It's so special. <laughs> Moments like this is, uh, yeah, something they're going to have memories forever. And now they're, they're both in the water with their jerseys on, with their numbers on their backs. Yeah, then, they, against each then other. they grow up and they want to beat you in the semifinal. <laughs> How's that for life, right? Auntie. <laughs> no respect to the aunties. <laughs> yeah, Kaipo, I'm not sure how Carissa's is feeling about the auntie status <laughs> right now, no, but it's always great to see Carissa. Every generation she gives back. I mean, this is she's been doing this for a long time and she's still giving back to the next generation. Yeah, I just did Hawaiian math. Carissa's 30, Bay Lusa Crow Johnson's 17. That's that 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 age difference, that's auntie. <laughs> <laughs> it is, it is. <laughs> hey, we know someone who's in the final. Tyler Wright is in the final, and Tyler's with Laura. 
Yes, we were just building Tyler a sandcastle so I wasn't towering over her. But uh, Tyler, that heat back and forth between you and Lakey, you got the dream start there. You found that eight point ride, but the rhythm kind of switched up halfway. How did you have to keep the mindset there to get that 5.5? Yeah, the, yeah, look, when I lost priority, like, look, uh, I didn't feel I paddled for the wave. I, I definitely felt that, I, yeah, I was looking, but I didn't paddle for it. And so, yeah, that definitely went in Lakey's favour. She converted the six on the next very next wave. So um, it's, it's one of those ones where you kind of just got to cop the call on the chin and move on. And, um, yeah, I knew... I had the eight, I knew it was solid, and to get an eight out there at the moment, to get over a six is, it, you gotta be going. So, um, yeah, when I got the 4.3, I knew that, I was kind of just adapted, found what I needed, and then went for it. And you spent a lot of time over here in December last yeah. year, and I know that you were out surfing pipe and backdoor in all conditions, and you know, just trying to do anything you could to get used to this reef. It seemed like it paid dividends then, as you knew exactly what waves you wanted. Yeah, honestly, the, we did three weeks together, you, me, Flick, and my wife, just down the road. So, um, honestly, that's what's paying off right now. And it, it's kind of funny, like, I, I almost didn't commit to coming over and doing those few weeks, but I'm really glad I did because surfing pipe in all conditions and really understanding that we're not going to get perfect pipe every time we're out here. It's, it's on these days that you really got to you got to know your marks, you got to know your pins, and you got to move between them. And I think I'm really lucky that... Not lucky, but I have a good team who knows what they're doing out there. And I've got Bam in my corner, I've got Andy here, and, you know, the whole support team as well. So I think between those two and the time that I've spent in this lineup and the accumulation of, you know, since 2019 and since this has been on the tour, um, it's this data that we collect and every, every time we go out, we, we kind of know a little bit more. We know where the pins are, we know where the wave directions, the winds, and how the ocean moves and feels out there. It's, it's so unique. And I think, um, yeah, the extra time being present here and being, making, putting in the effort. Absolutely amazing. Well, I can't wait to see what you take from that heat into the final. We'll see you very soon, Tyler. Rest up. Yeah, Tyler right into the final. And let's take a look at our bracket for the women starting at the quarterfinals. One spot already taken in the final. What's up for grabs, Megan? Another yeah, spot in that final, Betty Lou or Carissa Moore. Yeah, uh, it's a tough one, both local girls, but I'm gonna have to go with the veteran, Carissa Moore, on this one. All right, well, Tyler Wright and Carissa Moore did meet up in a final here in 2021. It was the continuation of the Maui Pro. We finished that and kind of set history finishing that event here at Pipeline for the women. Tyler Wright, Carissa Moore, were in that final together, Tyler took the win in that occasion. Yeah, that was definitely a, a groundbreaking moment just to have the women back at Pipeline. Unfortunate circumstances brought them here. Uh, Honolulu Bay was definitely one of the, the most beautiful waves on that they had on tour. Um, but yeah, just to have the women now locked in at Pipeline just feels so right. Uh, back on the North Shore, let's um, do a triple crown next, hey? Women's. <laughs> <laughs> Flying over, and again, the clock's going. The surfers have an extra five minutes in both the semifinals and the finals. 35 minutes on the clock, but we're down to 24 right now. And between Carissa Moore and Betty Lou Sakura Johnson. Let's take a look at our WSL stats when it comes to these two. They've only met up one time, and the win goes to Carissa Moore. That was in 2021 at that Maui Pro in the round of 16. So that heat was surfed in at Honolulu, where Carissa Moore took down Betty Lou Sakura Johnson, who came in as a wild card in that event. Yeah, not a lot of history between um, these two, but, you know, they've had a few more heats since then, not all on the CT Tour, and so they're, you know, Definitely bringing out the best in each other. I, I love this rivalry that we're seeing in front of us. As you said, master and apprentice. I like to look at the average heat score, and that's where Chris Moore has a, a clear advantage when you look at her average uh, over the, the, the uh, matchups with 14 points versus Beilu with 11, a little bit north of 11. Yeah, that's always something good to look at, Kaipo, because Chris is such a um, consistent surfer, and obviously meaning that basically she gets two sevens um, against Betty Lou when she competes against her. And, you know, she's she's really, Chris is one of those surfers, when she starts getting into the later round, she's deadly because 
she really knows when to peak. Um, she's a five-time world champion. She knows, you know, not to peak too early, when to really bring out her best surfing. It's, it's not easy and not everyone can do it. Yeah, and Carissa would love a sixth world title, but the world champion this year, Dimity, will actually be awarded the trophy, and the trophy has been renamed as the Duke Kahanamoku WSL Champions Trophy, honoring the father of surfing, Duke Kahanamoku. So it's going to be a special year when it comes around to uh, trophy time. Oh, absolutely. It's such an honor to have that name on that trophy. And um, yeah, like I said earlier, I've seen that mural on on the on the, the huge building with uh, Carissa and yeah. the Duke. And it's, yeah, it's powerful. It definitely gives you goosebumps seeing that. Yeah, yeah Kamea, uh, Kamea Haydar did that mural uh, and, it's, and it's in town on the side of the building with uh, Chris Moore and Duke Kahnemoku. Here she is in the barrel, but that one just clamps down on the five-time world champ. Priority switches back to Betty Lou Sakura Johnson. And what a special thing to be able to represent Hawaii, native Hawaiian Chris Moore is, and have the Duke Kahnemoku. Let's take a look at that mural. There it is. You can catch it driving down King Street in town on the side of the entire building. Chris Moore with her gold medal and Duke Kahanamoku with his gold medal. And that photo does not do it justice because I'm telling you, I saw it from the freeway and it is ginormous. I think I did a double take the first time I saw it. <laughs> I was like, hey, whoa. It's, it's pretty cool. There yes. it is. <laughs> what an honor, right, for Carissa to, to yeah. be next to the Duke. Yeah. I mean, what an honor. Yeah, and, and the artist there, Kamea Hadar, also has a collection out right now with Billabong and uh, his art uh, on that collection inspired by the Hawaiian creation story. So Kamea's doing some, making some moves, man. Yeah, Kaipo inspired by the Kumulipo. Uh, Aye. Not everybody knows the story around the world, but as Kaipo said, the creation. Um, and, you know, as a native Hawaiian, I know Chris is so proud of her heritage and, you know, all of those that came before her. She's always very graceful as a champion to honor those that came before her and you know she's doing the same for the future generations and she really um, brings that aloha spirit just like the duke did around the world yeah the duke broke a lot of barriers same way carissa has as well so um the similarities it has been uh, astounding uh but not much action here this was just a one point ride dimity yeah she's just pulling into a close out there i think um that wind swung around a little since that last heat, making the waves just a little bit more crumblier. It's always a scary thing when you see a heat with so many great waves like that last one. You're, oh, yeah. you're always a little bit edgy, like, wow, what's the next heat gonna bring on? Exactly, and that's why Carissa here, she's, she's looking again. Carissa on the move, speeding down the line, lines up, she's gonna go for turns right now. And a nice finish over some very shallow water, Carissa Moore. Carissa's looking good. Um, I spoke to her earlier. She's got a little bit of extra length than uh, maybe some of the girls, but you know the way she, she positions herself and places herself on the waves and she, how rails, how much she's always on rail. I still think it. I mean, it looks great. Yeah, and I think. Can we take us through this replay? Yeah, here she goes. She's eyeing up this little this section right here. As you can see, all that speed and power and flow, and then reconnects with that closeout section. Her boards look really good while she puts it on rail. That extra added um, length there, it, it just draws that turnout. And you can see the water shot right here. She's going down the line. You won't be able to see the front part, but you're going to see a lot of spray. Now we talked about the shallowness on the paddle back out, Dimity, and it, it is a struggle because when you finish off in that section on the inside, it's too shallow to duck dive. So right there where she's at, it really, you're almost like scraping your knuckles, <laughs> barely getting under, and you can see her getting tossed because she can't get underneath the wave. No, it's so awkward, and we saw that in the previous heat. They were just getting absolutely grilled on the inside, not, not able to get back out, but Betty Lou's also riding a step up as well. She normally rides a 5.5. Five, um, shaped by Takoro, Slater Designs, but she's out there today on a 5.8. I think just due to the wind and the chop, it, it's that's the reason it's going to help. I almost had to like have you double take on that. 
Sakura's up and riding. Big snap there for Betty Lou. Gets out of there early to avoid that inside shallow shelf. Wants to win this paddle battle on the way back out to regain priority on the five-time champ. Here we go with the paddle and a different strategy. Betty Lou going straight out, Megs. And Chris is going to take the uh, the way around with a channel. Yeah, Kaipo, that's that quick decision you have to make when you, you catch a wave at back door. Um, I want to say Betty Lou is going to have the upper in this, this um, exchange paddle back out. Look at Betty Lou, just she has so much power for how compact she is. She's not a very big surfer, uh, but the way she places her board, growing up at Haleiwa, just knows how to find that really um, steep section and get as much water off her fins as she can. Three-point ride checks in for Sakura. 4.17 for Carissa Moore. Moore in the lead. Sakura on this paddle back out. Sakura needs a 2.18 to turn the heat 17 minutes, 15 seconds, counting down. Yeah, like you said, Megs, it's hard to back up a heat like that previous one. There were a lot of waves ridden. Even the, the scores that they were throwing away were still up in the fives and sixes, which is better than anything we've seen um, as of yet. So I know Carissa is very experienced. She's, she would have that in her mind. Yeah, yeah, as we're waiting for the reset, we're going to uh, step away for a bit Take a quick commercial break, but remember, WSLstore.com. You can get all your jerseys over there. Get them. Get Carissa Moore and more. So this is our first WSL Rising Tides Pipeline Edition. For the women to be our pipeline and competing here on the North Shore is something that WSL is really proud of. It's a big deal for us to be surfing at that break and I want these kids to see that this could be them. Now with equal prize money, equal tour stops, meeting some of their heroes, maybe it sparks more of a passion inside them to really pursue it for a living. It feels good. It inspires me to see them rip and it makes me want to do it in the future too. A big part of what we're doing today is we want you guys to be able to come for a surf with us. Also to meet everyone here. <laughs> How's it going? Rising Tides! One of my hopes for Rising Tides is that one day we'll be looking back on the current crop of the championship tour and we're going to have these photos of them here at WSL Rising Tides meeting their heroes and interacting with the tour for the first time. Mahalo to Pura Vida uh, for their presentation of the Rising Tides activation that we'll be doing throughout the championship tour year. We're in semi-final number two and some signals to Carissa Moore from the beach. Carissa Moore matched up against Betty Lou Sakura Johnson and I wonder what the board means, Megs? Yeah, I don't know what the board means, but I know the gentleman behind it. That's Love Hodel. He's been, I was chatting with him earlier. He was, um, He's in uh, Carissa's corner. Oh, and he's a little camera shy, isn't he? Yeah, he's he is. Hiding. No, he's not. He wants the camera <laughs> time. We know Love Hotel. But that, I mean, that's been something, Dimity. Can you decode that? 
Uh, I'm going to say that he's happy with her positioning right now with that one. <laughs> Straight up probably means stay put. There you go. Use it as a clock, right? Yeah. <laughs> ah. Or more set, maybe it means. No, just I, I'm going to go with Dimity's explanation. That makes a lot of sense. And then if the board's tilted, like, hey, you need to move a little yep. bit to the left. you got to move a little bit more to the right. That would be the simple. Uh, but, you know, sometimes they uh, these these coaches, they know that the other surfer might be looking at their signals, so they <laughs> they change the code. <laughs> Over All the right. years, the amount of uh, coaches doing their, like, you know, we used to have Ken Bradshaw with the red T-shirt. We, you know, yeah. We, like we used to see at the at the Lopez house, um, the Ho brothers, Mike and Derek worked together along with uh, some other Hawaiians. They used to use towels that they would hang over the railing as, as signals. Yeah. Leah McNamara always had the towel too. Stephanie Gilmore had the famous uh, Jake Patterson waving the flur fluoro T-shirt. <laughs> Ricardo Toledo. With the whistles? Oh, yeah. And bright, the bright shirt as well. See, they're, they're not too the discreet, are they? The big whistle. <laughs> and he had the bright, always has the bright construction worker t-shirt color. Yeah, yeah make it's sure you can beach. see him. The whole well, beach can see and hear him. <laughs> <laughs> 12 minutes on the countdown, and um, the water a little bit quiet. Strider's out there, though. Yeah, we're back in the lineup, and, uh, well, we're just checking out over the shoulder. We're watching, you know, the board up in the air, and you can see, you know, I think that might mean hold. I think there's different um, positions that they're trying to get through to the surfers to see where to go and going back and forth, maybe over to the right, over to the left, and that's what I'm, I'm, I'm picking up on from the board talk, uh, from, from the, you know, caddies on the beach out to the lineup as you look over your shoulder. I mean, if you know where you're looking, you can find it, but just looking in, you'd never know where it's at, so I don't think... Betty knows where it's at. Hey, Strider, um, take a look at the beach. You see him moving that board. Oh, we see live action here. Sakura in the barrel, and uh, there's a great effort of getting through that section, but a little far over on the reef there for Sakura, looking for a 2.18, though not a big number at all. She's going to come up short, however. Yeah, Betty Lou's just, you know, she's, she's, just trying to find one that's going to stay open. Um, it's what we call building your house in the beginning of the heat. Here she goes. She's dragging her hand, getting in the barrel there. Looks nice. You know, unfortunately, that thing just kind of clamped on her. Not a very big wave either, so not a big opening. Paddle back out. Looks pretty easy. She should be paddling by Strider any time now. I feel like a lot of these big heats on paper have just been very slow this week. Yeah, I really think Mother Nature just gave it to everything in that last heat. This is what they're working with. Strider. Yeah, well, Betty paddling back out through the lineup. It's, you know, it's kind of a roll of the dice, but you can get a good look back out and see if there's a set coming or not. Betty making it back out nice and clean right there. So it's, it's, it's definitely... Uh, a question in your mind as you're in the inside there and you're sitting on about a foot of water. So, you know, these athletes having to make that split second decision. Look out, does it look clean and clear? And you've got about a 40 yard sprint to get through. And then you kind of get to this deeper spot which you can get out, you know, the back from. So it's, uh, it's calculated, but it's always a risk. I love, I love just seeing, although there's no sets right here, but you see the surfers kind of, I, I like that they're not shoulder to shoulder. You know, there's priority in the lineup. Uh, you know, you see a different strategy, Betty Lou sitting under Carissa Moore. Um, it's, it's wise to do that when the other person has priority uh, and you can kind of look for waves and kind of search and go on the hunt um, under priority. Yeah, there's always that surfer that loves to sit right next to you, even when you have priority and it's just like, it, it does its job because it's very annoying. <laughs> and these surfers are, are, are opting for the opposite strategy, which is um, quite nice. Yeah, Carissa Moore setting history, winning a gold medal in the Tokyo Olympics. And there's going to be a chance that Betty Lou takes this wave, decides not to. So Carissa Moore, you know, with that gold medal, setting history in Tokyo, we're going to see history come to fruition again at the Paris 2024 Summer Olympics. 
The uh, WSL is a first tier qualifier. The WSL will provisionally qualify 10 women, I mean 10 men, I'm sorry, and eight women for those Summer Olympics. Two men, two women, representing each company throughout the WSL tour, and that's gonna happen. Paris Olympics is gonna take place at Tel Pol, end of the road in Tahiti. We see more chances at a gold medal. The gold medalist drops into this one, no problem, comes out of it. Carissa Moore with a brilliant job, air dropping right behind the curtain, and that is going to distance her further from Betty Lou Sakura Johnson with a strong lead, Megan. Yeah, that was worth the wait for Carissa. She held strong with her priority and way to capitalize. I mean, she's already got a 4.17. She drops into this wave, drops straight into the barrel, and she's on the foam ball, manages to come out. Beautiful rail arc there. Great wave for Carissa. Well, look at the airdrop on this. She extends her legs and gets right under it with enough control to get through. That was so nice. Timothy, we were talking earlier about how John John wills it. Oh, I mean, yeah. Total will right here. Look at that. You know, like she's, her technique in the barrel is, is probably one of the best ever uh, on the women's side and just coming straight out into a big carve, but her legs were completely extended and that actually helped her get under the lip and then she's next second she's crunched up into the barrel which gives her enough speed to make it out and i love the way she did that turn after Carissa Moore is so good at her weight distribution while sur uh, while on a surfboard yeah that was amazing look at the well, scores just turned into an excellent ride clocking in here so one judge went as high as an 8.5, a flat eight. That's an excellent score for Carissa Moore. Now Sakura needs a 9.17 to take the lead away from Carissa. And there's mom, Shinobu, and her reaction uh, to that number, knowing that her daughter uh, has a, a, a tall hill to climb right now in semifinal number two, Megs. Yeah, she has a hill to climb, but Betty Lou's fully capable of it. We've seen her surf out here. She knows how to get shacked. Uh, she has good wave selection, she, and she's powerful. She can match Carissa pound for pound, you know, in the barrel and on the, on the face as well. Yeah, that's right. In that previous heat, you know, Tyler didn't win with just an eight. Uh, she had to get a better backup because, you know, like he got that seven and a six, so... There's still time for Betty Lou. And uh, yeah, that, that the scores from that one definitely came just from the late drop. Strider, what are your thoughts on Betty Lou? Well, Betty Lou, I've got her on, on the Apple Watch and my, my, it started buzzing and I looked down. So it, it shows me that she's got priority, but also shows me that she needs a 917. So uh, 515 on the clock, that's some time, plenty of time for her. She, she's so deadly out here. We've seen her doing the warm ups. She's on fire. You know, she just needs to catch that one nugget that's going to give it to her, you know, that she can come through the barrel and come out and do a big hack. She's got so much talent at such a young age that Carissa is not going to give her any room. Yeah, thank you, Strider. That Apple Watch is a nice addition to the information that the surfers get. They do have the priority screen on the judges' tower. They do have the on-site announcers giving them updates. But that Apple Watch has another sense to it. It it buzzes on your wrist when you get priority. So now you have your sense of sight, you have your sense of sound. Now you can use your sense of feel to know your situation and your heat with the addition of that Apple Watch. Yeah, that's actually such an amazing addition because so many times in those really tight situations when you're in a heat and the priority switches so quickly, sometimes you don't have time to physically look up to the priority yeah. disc before the next wave comes through. Especially on beach breaks, there's been instances where, you know, you might have missed an opportunity due to just the, the short amount of time. So now you know straight away when it buzzes, you have priority. Using priority. And that one just going to run away for Sakura. Yeah, I want to say Carissa did a little bit of selling on that wave. Um, that this is the part, the end of the heat, where some tactics come into play. Uh, Betty Lou capable of getting a 917. Uh, but then again, we saw quite a bit of wind on the face of that wave um, coming from behind. Here's the cell. Yeah, see, she kind of looks at it 
and there goes Betty taking off. I mean, it just clamped on her. I, I don't know if that was ever going to be the 917. Yeah. Well, that's why Auntie Carissa gave her a little sold her right here. It just goes, hey, I want that one. No, I actually don't because this is what's going to happen. Yeah, she. I mean, she tried to get out of that thing. She just was on the foam ball and it just clamped on her. Yeah, I feel like she's just at, the, at this point in the heat, she's trying to better that three. So just to, just to knock that. No, 917 out here is is really difficult. Yeah, I mean, maybe be able to chip away with chip it. That's to your point, Dimity. If she was able to just get, you know, a five or so, she would yeah. need just need, now you need now you need a seven, yeah. you know, instead of a nine. Oh, yeah. So to your point, uh, correct on that analysis. And we've seen out here uh, surfers getting two waves in two minutes. Uh, it's such a small lineup. Although it's a big wave, it's a powerful wave, it's a small lineup, so. Especially today. And it is with that, uh, you know, the they're coming in waves, those, or flurries of waves, yeah. See it go flat for a while, and then all of a sudden you see four in a row, so. Well, talked about the master and the apprentice. Marissa Moore being the master, and Bailey Sakura Johnson being the apprentice in this heat. Now the master. Well, just gonna, he's just going to run the two-minute drill. You know, this is this is the this is elementary heat IQ for someone like Chris Moore. She's just going to make good decisions, hold that priority, block if she needs to, but not give Sakura an opportunity. She let this wave go, thinking that that wasn't going to change the situation, and. That may have slightly changed the situation, actually. That's not going to be the 9.17, Dimity, but could improve her score line. That may improve on the three, and she could uh, you could tell how she was really trying to bust out of that barrel just to get the completion. And it's for sure going to improve on the 1.2. Oh, yeah. <laughs> One more look at it, Megs. Yeah. Right here, she tucks up under it, manages to get out of that thing unscathed. I wish there would have been a little section after, but here you see, tucks under the lip, kind of comes out through it. Yeah, you're right. She just really needed one more section to get a big finish, and um, then she would be back out with a minute to go, but Carissa would still be have the priority, so it's a tall order. You notice yeah. at the end of the heat here, too, look how much closer Carissa will get to her. As you said, elementary textbook heat surfing yeah. right here. This is what happens. Yeah. she. I mean, Carissa knew that that wave wouldn't turn the heat, and now, regardless of what happens, now, you know, Betty Lou just needs an 8.5, so she did re reduce her requirement, but now Carissa can just be all defense if she wants to close out this heat, because there's just 25 seconds, and watch Carissa finish this off. So yeah, that heat just really came down to that one eight-point ride. Whoever had that priority at the time when that bomb came through and had the skills to make it through that barrel was going to win, and Carissa got that wave. Yeah, and she kind of willed it as well. Oh, yeah. Sakura, equal third. That's a nice start to the championship tour season. Carissa Moore in another final here at Pipeline. Semi-final number one for the men in the water when we return.
right there. Race track section, clear for take off, full rotation. Rocking in the 808, cracking 805s. It is the Billabong Pro Pipeline Men's Semifinal. One in the water. I'm Kaipo along with Ross Williams. And Ross, um, this one is going to be a battle of two grinders, Leo Fioravanti and Kaio Ibelli. Yeah, both scrappy surfers, super high uh, heat IQ. Um, both have sort of wider stance, so they're good at finishing maneuvers and those closeouts. Uh, this is going to be a tough one. And it's going to be a great start for both surfers as we look at the framework of the championship tour. But every surfer wants that podium and those 10,000 points to start off their year. Leonardo Fioravanti, 25 years old, representing Rome, Italy. And Kyle Ibelli, 29 years old, representing Guarujá, Brazil. Yeah, and barring uh, Jack, everyone's looking for their first victory, right? So that, this is a big day for these guys. They're really trying to calm the nerves. They're trying to not think about that. Uh, good point. I mean, there's a 75% chance on the men's side that we're going to see a surfer with their first championship tour win. Yeah, and that's huge, um, you know, because it's uh, everyone wants to get that big W and it's a big paycheck. As you mentioned, 10,000 points, which kind of keeps you f uh, free and clear of worrying about that pesty cut line. So let's see if these guys can buckle down and focus here. The waves have gotten a little slower. Uh, there's not as many waves ridden right now, so that adds to the pressure. Yeah. A semifinal finish that these surfers have already achieved will earn you 6,085 points. So that's a, that's a nice chunk, regardless, to start off the year. That's what they call a keeper. Yeah, that's a keeper. Well... Chris Amore is not satisfied with 6,085 points. She wants 10,000 points. Uh, I'm going to get to her because Kylie Belly just pulled into a closeout. And we'll see if Leo takes this next wave. And he does. And Leo also pulling out. So now let's get to the five-time world champ, Chris Amore. Chris Moore just checking out the nose there. It's all it's looking all good. It's all good. I, I kind of um I was trying to make it out back um back out to the lineup through the back doorway and I like went into the rocks. I was like, okay, forget that. I'll, that it took me like five minutes to get around the left, but I have a little dent, but hopefully it's a good luck dent. <laughs> it is, I mean, your second consecutive final here at Pipe. Last year you came runner up. How much would it mean to you to get the win today? Oh, I mean, it would be so sweet, but I know I have uh, my work cut out with for me with Tyler Wright. She looked on fire in that last heat, and she's just building momentum every heat, and she's one of the strongest competitors I've, I've known, you know, through my whole career. So we have definitely um, a battle coming up. And talk about that heat with Betty Lou. You guys have had some great battles in the past already. She's a grom. She's, we always say, the master and the apprentice out there, but uh, she takes it to you. So your patience paid off there. How are you feeling? You said it was quite stressful. No, thank you so much. Yeah, I, um, you know, Betty is someone who's who has a lot of talent and a lot of great strategy. She has a great coach, and um, you know, I think she has brought out the best in me in the last few events. And I'm excited that we get to we're going to have a lot more good battles coming up. But yeah, it was really slow heat. I'm just happy that the patience did pay off and a, a good one ended up coming in. How good did it feel to get that eight point ride? It was. Very, it made me very happy. I felt like I could kind of breathe for a second. <laughs> oh, Chris, so we can't wait to watch you out there. All smiles, but we're back into it. A battle with you and Tyler coming right up. Stay tuned. Thanks, Laura. Yeah, Chris Moore, Tyler Wright, this will be their 11th CT final together. Leonardo stalls from the takeoff, finds the Puka. No problem with the exit for the Italian. And the first meaningful number will be assigned to Leonardo Fioravanti in this semifinal number one boss. Really well hunted. Uh, Leonardo found that wave just slightly further down the reef and spotted it. And that's the keys to success today. You gotta find those little nuggets that give you that barrel. And also it was a tricky barrel. That thing kind of stretched out. Leo read it perfect. 
So we'll be waiting for that number for Firovanti, who has been on a roll. Here we go on the replay, Ross. Yeah, and really good read, stalling, then letting go just in time. So stepping on a break, stepping on a gas. You know, that's the magic of maxing out this barrel time to impress these judges. Leo started off by stalling, kind of chose his tempo, and then stepped on a gas. Right there, a little pump, and he was pretty deep there too. Even a second pump to get through that second section before it crumbled on him. And you can see how far he is down, all the way by that trench at off the wall. Well spotted from Leo. Three Ps in effect for Leo Fioravanti. Paddle into position, pick a good wave, and then perform. And he's going to perform to a very good score from the looks of the first two numbers getting dropped by our judges. Two more to go before we can lock in the number. Let's rattle the booth. Judge two, judge five. Off it up. There we go. Another excellent score. And just one more judge, a 7.5, nets out to a 7.67 for Leo Firavanti. Strong start. It's a strong start. We see uh, Kylie Belly kind of give a little shake to the neck, like, okay, shh, that's nothing. I got this. <laughs> so already the, you know, the mental battle, Kaipo, has begun. It's always a game of chess when the waves are grindy like this. Uh, you have to really calm your nerves when your competitor throws a good score at you like that. Yeah, well done by Leo. And <laughs> one thing we do also want to I want to point out between these two two guys, these guys do not hide their emotions. They wear their emotions on their sleeves. There and they're both very very passionate surfers. Feisty, feisty. Too. Could you imagine if we had this heat with no priority? What would happen? <laughs> These guys would be choking each other out on the channel. They wouldn't even surf. Uh, they're both just super uh, high energy and not afraid to get dirty. Yeah, Kylie Valley again, second year in a row, making it here to the semifinals at Pipe. So a nice season starter for Ibelli. You know, last season he came in as an injury replacement, but through performing, you know, semifinal finish here at Pipeline last year, went out semifinal again at, at, at Sunset. All right, made it through that mid-season cut. Didn't have to work. Knew he was going to be back on tour this year. Finished off with the semifinals in Tahiti. I mean, Kyle had a great year in 2022. Yeah, he's really consistent. Both these surfers are. Um, and uh, they're not someone that you uh, take for granted or underestimate. They're, they're going to come back. So I don't think, you know, Kyle is going to fold under pressure, even though Leo drew, drew first blood. Yeah, I mean, Kyle had a great year. Uh, finishing the year on the championship tour, number eight. That's, a, that's his career best. And on top of that, last year, Kylie Belly earned his first perfect 10-point ride at the Oi Real Pro. Let's take a look at this 10, Ross. Where'd he go? And it actually looks a lot like the waves today. Uh, again, this is in Brazil. Crazy barrel right there. Uh, and that was a crazy, like, disappearing act. It looked like there was no chance uh, that that surfer was going to make it out. He surprised the whole beach on that ride, Typo. Yeah, Bowie Belly. Uh, this year, 10-point rides earn you not just a great score, but a Yeti Tundra 110 for a 10. So 10 for 10. Thank you to Yeti for all their support. And, um, yeah, that's the best cooler in the biz right there. It does. I, I have a cooler like that at home, Kaipo, and you can chuck a bunch of ice in there, and weeks later, that bad boy is still cold. Yeah, talk about insulation. <laughs> they are effective. Well, right now, feeling the ice is Kyle Belly because, you know, it's been pretty quiet. He needs a, a decent number, 7.25. In the framework of today, uh, he's going to need a nice big backdoor barrel to get that number and finish it off with something else. He does have priority. Uh, again, our semis and our finals do have 35 minutes to start off with, so a little bit more time on the clock, 24 minutes of opportunity for Kyoe Belly. Yeah, and, and again, as we see Lael scrap around here. Smart surfing by Firovanti. Just gets a couple turns on the inside here, working it over. 
knowing a good strategy, finishes it off, throws that Christian Bradley board high in the lip. It's going to back up his 7.67 and probably put Kylie Belly into a combination situation right now. Yeah, that's going to be a definite great backup score for Leo. And under priority, that's his job. He's out there. He, he can lower his standards a little bit, look for a smaller wave, try to connect the dots and, and get a backup score. Yeah, so we'll take another look at this. Uh, just scrappy wave, but great surfing. Yeah, and full of energy. That's what this guy is known for. Leo is high energy. Uh, nice little tail side there. Watch him tic-tac across this dead spot. Meets up with off the wall left and tags it really clean there. So it's not going to be a big score, but hey, it's a backup score and he's adding pressure to Kyle. Yeah, and you know, you get over, say, a four-point ride and you just have the mental game that you can put Kyle in that combination mm. and it'll it'll be a you know it won't be a difficult combo to break but it does put you in a combo and it certainly did 4.33 Leo Firavanti now Kyle Belly with priority does need a combination of two scores equaling 12 or better so I think there's a psychological game right now as well 100% I mean it's always a game of chess out there the psychological battle is real and you know, how many heats have we seen uh, go down to the last few minutes and a surfer requires a 4.3? Hey, guess what? Leo's already taken care of that uh, measure by getting that little backup score. So now he's kind of throwing it back into Kyle's face like, hey, I already got two scores, pal. You better get going. Yeah, Coach Williams, you said it. Uh, lower, you know, lower, lower your expectation or, or just lower your standard, right? Get that number, put pressure on it. What do you think, Strider? I love the streak that uh, um, sorry, Leo Fioravanti's on. I mean, coming out off the, the Challenger Series and blowing up, but you know, you're, you're still that question: Is he going to rise back to the occasion? He was on tour, got you know, fell off tour. Now look at him; he's actually looking better than he ever has. So he built confidence, and now he's proved himself through this, you know, you know Pipe Pro. It's it's amazing to watch him uh, just continually make great decisions in heats and so watching this heat right now he's got Kyle on the ropes he's on, the streak is continuing and there's definitely enough time left in this thing for Kyle to come back Kyle probably one of the scrappiest surfers on tour so don't count him out but Leo looking really good this year mm. thank you Strider so got him on the ropes but not really is my <laughs> takeaway from that well he's got a lot of time left and yeah. Kyle um, he, he's got steely nerves. I don't see him getting impatient right now and pulling a trigger on a, on a bad wave. I think he's going to stick to his plan, which is waiting for a wave that has a little bit of juice, that has some points on offer. Yeah. Kawi Belly, a former world junior champ and uh, steely competitor. Here's the warm up right now. Keeping the mind right with Tyler Wright. They're not used to an American football. As you can see, a <laughs> little hand-eye coordination is what that is all about there, Kaipo. Just keeping the mind sharp, it's sort of meditative, isn't it? Yeah, kind of working on your spiral there. Yeah, the Aussie football is big and round, and you sort of throw it underhanded, right? So this is a little American football there. American footballs, I mean, hey. It's a ball. Every, everyone, just my assessment. American footballs do travel through the air much more efficiently than an Aussie ball. You, you got to be careful here. <laughs> this is like Have you seen spirals shot between from my quarterbacks American. versus like you know the <laughs> uh, the rugby games? But all jokes aside, it's hey. nothing like the pill, Mike. <laughs> Dimity like that. Dimity's right here. Oh boy. <laughs> 19 minutes, 45 seconds, Ibelli, with plenty of time on the clock, needs to break the comp. First of all, needs to break himself out of combination. How is he going to do that? He needs to get over a 4.33 at this moment, you know, just to just to get out of that combo, the pesky combo, if it would. It'd be nice just to get a six-point ride and cut his requirement in half. Yeah, combo schmambo. I, he, he's not thinking about it. He's uh, he's just trying to get two scores, and, and there's way too much time on the clock to think about what Leo has really done. It's still in his own game plan right now, just get two waves. 
Well, it's lunchtime in the Red Bull Athlete Zone for Rio Waida, but it is warm-up time in the Red Bull Athlete Zone for Shuminho. Joao Xianca, who's going to be matched up against Jack Robinson. Funny that Joao is in the Red Bull Athlete Zone rather than the Volcom team house that both Jack and Joao share. So a little bit of separation for the uh, warm-ups, for the gear-up for that semifinal number two. I, I think Joao is going to be deadly in that he, he's, he's got more to win. Uh, Jack's got more to lose. Jack's sort of the prince of the Volcom house and uh, you know, he's he's been the, kind of the golden child where Zhao is hungry. I mean, that dude wants to eat. So, And these kind of conditions are very good for Zhao. He's scrappy. He's not afraid to get backup scores and hit big closeouts. Um, so that's going to be a fun heat. Yeah, that's going to be a great heat to watch. We're going to catch up with that heat in about 18 minutes as semifinal number one with Leonardo Fioravanti exerting a lot of pressure on Kyle Ibelli. And we did predict this a little bit. The buoys through the night dropped just a touch. So you're seeing that now in the lineup. It's a little, uh, little more inconsistent. So they're going to have to take advantage of these flurries when they come in. Well, with 17.45 on the clock, we're going to step away for a break while there's a lull. We'll be back with semifinal number one here at the Billabong Pro Pipeline. The Billabong Pro Pipeline is brought to you by Billabong, the official apparel brand of the Billabong Pro Pipeline. CT1, the Billabong Pro Pipeline action in the semifinal number one. Leonardo Fioravanti with the lead over Kyle Belly. if you're just joining us. 15 minutes, 35 seconds on the clock. Kaipo along with Ross Williams on the call. A little action in the ocean right now, Ross. Yeah, and Kyle sitting really high, actually, up on the reef. This is leaving Leo down alone, dangerously towards Ains. And uh, you can find some good scores down there. So, I mean, all the momentum, all the positive vibes has been in Leo's corner. And if I'm, if I'm uh, in Kyle's camp, I'm a little concerned right now just because he's pretty far up the reef. I, I haven't seen almost any waves break up there. So he's just a little out of touch right now at the lineup. Yeah, flying by, and you can see the positioning. Kyle Belly calmly uh, sitting upon his rusty surfboard. 29-year-old out of Guadalajara, Brazil, also a restaurateur. Ibelli Burgers, got a special beef, a special beef blend yeah. at the Ibelli Burgers. Uh, some different layups, different models of burgers available there. All premium beef. Different layups. Yeah, it sounds like a surfboard. Yeah, well, you can treat a burger like a surfboard because sometimes you put a little extra stuff on it. Could be carbon fiber, could be S glass, <laughs> could be a guacamole, could Coated be with cheese, <laughs> could be bacon. Okay. 
you're Avanti, has to squeeze into that one, and no harm, no foul. The situation remains the same. And again, I mean, we talked about Kyle. Frankly, we've been talking him up, you know, saying how he's got really steely nerves. Um, but now, you know, the, the clock is ticking away. It, it could start wearing on those nerves just a little bit. And he, he's really sticking to his guns, waiting for a set wave. Um, but we'll see if he can get to that wave in time, because in my opinion, he is just a little bit far up the reef. So if a set does come, don't be surprised if he chases it towards off the wall. Yeah, his positioning, I mean, looks more pipe-ish, would you say? Yeah, exactly. He's just pretty far up, which, I mean, it's okay. But if a set does come, he's probably going to have to chase it towards off the wall. Of course, I could be totally wrong, and a perfect A-frame comes right to him, and he could just have the magic. Hey. But I haven't seen it yet today, a wave up there. Kai wouldn't mind the jinx at, at this point. He could use a wave at 13 minutes and still in a combination. Looked like he was having a little talk with himself, just keeping it positive. Last score for Leo Fioravanti in that little close-up, just a 1.03. Didn't change the situation at all. What a great start for Leo Fioravanti for the 2023 Championship Tour. You know, he was a victim in 2022 of that mid-season cut. Was angry, you know, like, and showed it with that cut. Had Came back furiously on the Challenger Series, Fioravanti did, all the way to t being number one at the end of the year on that Challenger Series leaderboard and earning his way back into the Championship Tour in a convincing manner. Yeah. There we go. He's chasing it towards off the wall right on cue. Kayo gets under, pulls in, travels through that first section, makes it on that first section. He belly slashes the oncoming section and surfs his way out of the combination. Well done there for Kyle to uh, spot that that wave was running away from him, and he caught it just barely. He really did have to chase it, but he got in. And the cool thing about that is it put him pretty deep. So he was able to get that big pump right here. He sees his deep big pump right there, even a second one, and slides through. Almost fell asleep a little bit on that maneuver, kind of a funny little wheelie off the lip. But nonetheless, he finished it, and Kyle always finishes it. He's got a real sturdy stance, and it's rare that Kyle falls. Just like that, he's going to be back in his heat, Kaipo. Yeah, I have to get the chin on the board to get over the ledge there. But like you said, Ross, nice just to finish it off. A little, like, stalled wheelie, but that's okay. It's a completion. We'll be waiting for that number. Yeah, he's never too proud to just sort of give up on a move if it's a little funky like that one was. He's like, no, 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 I'm going to finish it. Every tenth of a point matters. Now he's Looking in quick. depth mode. Yeah, yeah. Now he's under priority, and you can see how the personality changes. Right, right Ross? Exactly. Yeah, he's in backup mode. He's going to look for anything, any little nook and cranny, any small wave. Doesn't matter if it's big, small, whatever. Now he wants to get the back of score. Yeah, you got a 6.5. Kyle Bailey out of that combination. Needs a 5.51 to put the heat in his favor here at the 10 minute, 25 second mark. So Kyle Bailey did his job. Absolutely. Uh, and that's a good score. I feel like. Leo's way was a, a touch better, so the judges spot on there. And a 5-5, five five, uh, that's just juicy enough of a score to need a wave that has that critical section. He's going to need to produce either a little barrel and a finishing turn or a big Rio. So if he needed like a 4, three, five, four, something like that, he could get really scrappy and catch a small wave. But 5-5 five five to me is a big enough score where he has to find a wave that gets the judge's attention. Just a little bit more of a critical section needed. Both surfers on a paddle up the beach, and perhaps Kawi Belly trying to tow Leo Fiorfanti a little bit off the mark. Yeah, I think Leo is basically sitting on him, uh, and so if, if that's the case for Kyle in his mind, he's like, okay, if you're gonna sit on me, we're gonna go up the reef a little bit. Uh, nasal breathing preparation with Jack Robinson. 
oxygenating his body. Exactly. Look at Brett Akimo just checking him out. Like, bro, how's this guy? <laughs> but that's exactly right. Typo, he's, uh, he's putting oxygen in his blood. That's going to make him feel nice and bubbly on the paddle out. That'll energize him. Howie Belly knows how to battle. Uh, he's battled through years on the championship tour. And he's, uh, you know, he came in hot in Hawaii last year with two semifinal finishes, both here and at Sunset. Let's take a look at Kyle, 2022 on the North Shore. Go Kyle, by Kyle at Pipeline, where he was outstanding. Yeah, this guy is so good in the barrel. He's underrated. Look at that. He's really good at planting late drops. He stays committed. He's not afraid of juicy waves. Sunset changed it up, longer equipment, but still great performance. Another semifinal finish for Kyle Belly. Hey, he's just a really gnarly competitor. Uh, he's, like we said, he doesn't uh, buckle under pressure, and he has a bit of showtime in him. He, he likes to produce big scores. Blue foot there on the inside section. <laughs> Difficult inside section. At sunset, great start to 2022 for Kyle Valley. Again, a great start in 2023 for the Brazilian. That's exactly right what you said. He's, he's a blue foot. The kid doesn't fall very often. Trying to stay loose. A couple more little neck cracks. And Leo's really smart. And he knows what to do here. He is going to just clog that lineup and shadow him. Whatever the next decent wave that comes through, it's Leo's job to get it and better his four. Yeah. In Hawaii, we called Wynn McCunny. What's happening with the McCunny Strider? Well, the wind is that definitely not. Right? It just feels like it's just like blustering and coming at us uh, across from that east northeast direction. And we know it's supposed to pick up throughout the day, but I, I think it's going to make it a little bit harder for you know these guys to. Uh, Negotiate the tubes because it looks lip lines just keeps throwing down with that wind and it's going to be a, a little bit tougher for them to push through that. But I mean, these guys are pretty strong. Leo looks super strong, and you guys are talking about Bluefoot out here in the barrel uh, with, with Kayo. So, but it was definite notice on the wind picking up right now. So, if that wind is uh, sort of trampling the, the lip line down, what kind of wave are they looking for to get rid of that problem? Well, you know, I, I think obviously that. That, that troughed out double up that they can get. You know, we've seen some really impressive barrels go down this morning. Uh, and back door is so shallow and hollow and throws so far that, you know, even if the lip line has that crumble, you can get through and get underneath it and, it, and almost uh, fabricate your own tube time in there. And, and as it's falling, you just have to push through and come out. So I, I feel like these guys are obviously going to be able to do it. It's just going to be a little more challenging. Yeah, we're looking at the today's surfline forecast, not just the waves, but the winds, Strider. 18 to 22 knots forecasted side ashore, offshore this afternoon. Yeah, definitely can feel that. Uh, and, 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 you know, I, I just felt that 22 knot hit me in the face, so <laughs> it's hey. definitely picking up. Well, good news is this hair still looks great, Waz, <laughs> even though it's very windy. Oh, uh, blow dry. <laughs> Five minutes, 25 seconds on the countdown here. And the Ophiravanti still in the lead over Kayo Ibelli. Ibelli again needing that 5.51 to turn the heat. This is uh, it's going to be a buzzer beater. 5.5 five is not a big score. Um, and again, we talked about the, the swell is um, it's pittering out just a little bit. Jeez, look at that sound. It's beautiful out here today. Both surfers really close together. And I think that's by the choice, like you analyzed, Ross, of Leo Fioravanti, really getting kind of in the, in the zone of Kyle Belly. Some surfers do not like that. That really does, that's effective, like getting on someone's nerves by sitting in their space. I don't think that's true for Kyle. These are two good poker players. I mean, these guys are, they hold their nerve. And different shades of blue that you'll find here on, on the Hawaiian Islands. Lots of shades of blue in the ocean, lots of shades of green. Mauka on the mountains. It's beautiful. Pretty lucky we live here, huh? I think we need to activate the, the mom text threads. There's going to be a lot of moms and kids down there in the, in the pool. 
in the tide pool. <laughs> it's looking nice out there, Kaipo. Uh, just another beautiful day in paradise flying by our compound there. Zhao Xianka preparing himself on the shoreline. Clean lines. A nice looking surfboard there. Britt Merrick. He's been going pretty fast too. I like Kyle, uh, sorry, Joel's boards. He rides a slightly bigger board, a little more volume than your typical tour surfer. He flies down the line. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, I think some of his success, really, when we've seen him being adaptable and stuff, is where he comes from, Sacramento in Brazil. There's a variety of waves, and, and it gets, it can get pretty big there as well, but there's just such a variety, and it's such a wave-rich region, you know, to speak to Joao, um, it almost is like kind of the North Shore, little town, but right. kind of like the North Shore uh, of, the, of the state of Rio de Janeiro. Yeah, that's a good call, Kaipo. And there's also a lot of wind there. So uh, Joao would be used to surfing in the wind, dealing with chops. Uh, he knows how to utilize the wind uh, in his favor. Let's take a look at our heat recap here in semifinal number one. Nice start, Ross, by Leonardo Fiorvanti. Yeah, he found this wave down at the end of the reef, and it was a good score, 7.67. Right away, he goes back out and finds a backup score, 4.3. tick tacking across this wave, board flowing through these dead spots. Nice little tail slide there for Leo. Right here, tick tack tick looking for that little left. And one more finishing move for Leo. So, and it's been pretty quiet since then, other than a 6.5 from Kyle. Got him right back in the heat, Kipes. Yeah, right back in the heat, the completion for Kyle Ibelli. Broke himself out of that early combination that he had. There's all the heat scores. Not a lot of waves ridden, so you got to make those waves count when you get them. Down to just two minutes and nine seconds. Ibelli starting to break away a little bit from Leonardo Fioravanti. Maybe some opportunity here. Fioravanti with the lead, with priority, needs to make a decision. Is he going to take this wave? Leonardo activates. Bit of a tube manual having to bust out of that one. We'll see if that changes the situation. Needs to better 4.33 to change that situation. Pat Ibelli takes a look at this one. Ibelli pumps down the line, travels. That one's no exit for Kyle Ibelli, unfortunately. Still enough time on the clock, though. He does a sprint paddle back out. Leos, look at him. He's got a, a wake behind him. He's paddling so hard. And that's smart. I was really curious what was going to happen after that kick out from Kyle, who was going to win the paddle battle, but Leo was on top of it. Now he can protect in the last minute with priority. He's really going to cover him like a blanket now. He's going to sit on him. Yeah, there you go. Priority to Leonardo Fioravanti and the lead. And we're going to see how Leo plays a little bit of defense right now. They're even talking to each other. Well, they're both looking out to the horizon and they see how quiet it is, so their guards are down a bit. Just a little deep breathing. Yeah. <laughs> well, talkative in the last 30 seconds out here between the two surfers. This could be um, Leonardo Fioravanti's first CT final. And good sportsmanship there. Still with time on the clock. Kyle realizing the position he's in. There's no breaking away from Leonardo Fioravanti at this point. So, bravo Fioravanti. He's going to be in the finals here at the Billabong Pro Pipe. <laughs> he's feisty. He's amped. In the finals, it's huge. Applause for, Bra uh, for it Italy by the crowd semi-final two in the water when we return
Diego up and riding in black white. Joao. Oh wow, Chiaka oh. and Pipeline coming out. I think I do have like really competitive atmosphere with Jack. I will just try to like keep focus and like play smart. Jack Robinson with a ton of speed, wide open. He's looking to sneak out the exit. Robo will take the drop, and he's riding covered in the barrel. What are they feeding you up at that house? You and Joao, let's go. Special juice, Red Bull. <laughs> <laughs> Have a look at the best platform in the world for pro surfing, the Bonsai Pipeline. You're watching the Billabong Pro Pipeline, the start of the World Surf League Championship Tour. And we've got one spot left in the finals as we kick things off with Joao Chianca and Jack Robinson. Joe Trapel with Megan Abubo, local hero and also former runner-up in the world. Megan, you've been spot on with these predictions today. Joao Chianca taking on Jack Robinson. That's going to be a big heat to watch. Yeah, so exciting out there. Um, both of them have been on fire this entire event and, you know, just putting a lot of time in out here. I love their styles, uh, super powerful surfers, and both spend a lot of time surfing out here. Yeah, teammates, they've got a place to stay right next door to us. Has three levels to it. Famously owned by Jerry Lopez and Herbie Fletcher for many, many years. Jack and Joao Chianca love taking reps at Pipeline and free surfs. They're always putting together highlighted video parts. But this one just feels different. They're getting a shot at a final at Pipeline for the first time in their career. Yeah, and Joe, don't you think, I mean, how many cheers are we going to hear from next door, right? <laughs> every, every time a wave gets ridden in the semifinal, we're going to hear a cheer. Uh, yeah, there's so much history here. It doesn't matter how the conditions are, who you're surfing up against. Um, surfing out at Pipeline just has a really special place in your heart for any surfer. Leonardo Fioravanti, your first CT final happens to be at Pipeline. What a way to get there. Leo, all smiles. Never been in a CT final before. He's doing it at Pipeline and talk about a way to ride this one in. Yeah, this just sums up Leo this year, he's just happy. <laughs> he, he seems so stoked. He seems like he's in a really good place. Uh, he's really familiar with surfing out here. He's one of my early round picks for sure. Uh, I, I just think not only like his, his barrel riding look good during this event, but his turns look super crisp. He looks really solid. Uh, his boards look good. And he's putting together like, complete waves. He certainly is. And Pipeline's interesting. It has been a platform for a lot of big-name pro surfers where they've been able to crack into their first CT final, and it happens to be Pipe. You think Seth Modis, last season, finishing runner-up. Kanoa Garashi got his first CT final in Pipe as we look at the start to semifinal number two. Small inside tube for Jack Robinson. Still looks super smooth on the carve and will dance on the roof for a bit until he actually skips out on the reef big blow tail controlled from chianka wraps the next effort third and final turn as he passes jack on the inside he will shut his down just curious about the equipment from jack robinson but he's already working his way back out he must have had a quick check things must be okay if he's heading back to position wow joe that was pretty crazy um i know when we get the replay here we're going to be able to see it he takes off on this. I like how he gets right into that little barrel. Um, straight into that next huge swooping carve there. But look at how bone dry that is. And that's right where he, I mean, you know he didn't jump off there. So he, he hits something. Let's see if he checks out his board here. And right behind him, Joao, huge blow tail. And then sets it up for another beautiful sweeping turn there and then he actually um, got kind of lucky and went past that dry reef section. Crazy how shallow it is here, back door and pipeline. Whether it's big or small, it's incredibly treacherous. You've got to have a really healthy quiver of surfboards if you want to compete out here or even just put in some time as a local surfer. Going through boards, that's on the daily at pipe and back door, no matter what the size. And Jack Robinson 
Joao Chianca putting up some points in the CT Shaper rankings. Jack on Sharp Eyes. Joao Chianca on Channel Island surfboards. He's actually on the same 511 that he rode earlier today in the quarters. So really just his second surf session on that CI Pro model. Yeah, and board looks really good. It looks spicy under his feet. Uh, from that aerial shot, Joe, I wanted to note do you see how much the wind has picked up in the semifinal heat? And that is typical Hawaii right there. Exactly. As we just saw Jack signal, that oftentimes is the motion for a creased surfboard. So he's already trying to hey. talk to his caddy for the hey. board change, Strider. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I'm going to tackle back out. He didn't time um, like on the inside for a quick look, but then he paddled back out to get priority and then looked at his board as he got into the lineup, flipped it over, and you could see him checking the fin. So I think there's something going on in the back of the board there that he has to deal with. And uh, he was looking in, looking in, he finally signaled to his uh, crew on the beach. So definitely something going on there with the back fin. Good man, Strider. Jack's been through a lot even last season with board changes or leash changes in the middle of the heats last year. Another look at his start here, Megan, and we'll see that dry reef show up. Yeah, he put, tucks into that barrel here, and look how shallow that is. Like, some of those, that reef is sticking out of the water. And this is right where he just gets unstuck because he literally clips himself. You can see it right here. You can, he goes for that floater, and then, boom, right here is where he must hit his fin on a dry reef. And, ladies and gentlemen at home, this is something... You don't really want to do, but because it's all on the line for Jack, he went for it. Jack Robinson can stay focused. It's amazing how he can run across rocks, whether it be El Salvador last year when he had to dance on the rocks and get an, a backup board and get back out in a position in a, less than a couple of minutes. But he's probably also familiar what happens at his home break at Margaret River when things go dry on your finishing move on the right. More often than not, you're seeing competitors bounce off that section, often called the bricks. Yeah, Joe, that's one of the shallowest end sections on tour. Uh, there's quite a few waves when you think about it, like even J-Bay. Um, the inside is so shallow. Um, you watch it, you just think perfect lines. But there's a lot of waves on tour that the inside is just driving. It's really true. I think we also have some scars from trying to get out in the right place at Jeffrey's Bay. J-Bay was special for Jack Robinson this past season, enjoyed that final with Ethan Ewing. After the win in Mexico, he started finding the formula to enter big CT matchups. Chilan, Margaret River, those wins were back to back, jack to jack. I think there was a lot of hashtags going out there because he had officially arrived just in his second season on tour, featured in the Rip Curl WSL finals. And off to his best start to date, in his career here at Pipeline. As he's never gotten to the quarters, now he's in the semifinals, maybe with a chance to join Leonardo Fioravanti in the big show. Leo's with Dimity. Wow, Leo Fioravanti, I can feel your energy. You got a huge smile on your face. Your first CT final ever here at Pipeline. Tell us what you're thinking right now. I mean, Pipeline is one of the best waves in the world. It's where I think there's so much history in Hawaii. You know, surfing started in Hawaii. Um, there's so much history behind this spot and to make you know my first ever final here it's a uh, it's a dream come true but at the same time there's a long way to go and you know I, I'm happy of course I'm super happy but I want to maintain that happiness keep it keep it down keep the energy up like you said and um, try and do it one more time yeah exactly huge final coming up against uh, one of these guys in the water what's it gonna take to get the the champions trophy in your hands today I think, you know, finding the right waves, this whole contest, I've been worrying about, you know, the ocean and, you know, placing myself in the spot and getting the right wave. Not necessarily who's in my heat or what they're doing. And I'll just keep on, keep on doing that. And, and if the ocean wants to give me that rhythm one more time, then, then great. So, um, but I, I'm excited. And then, ciao a tutti in Italia, prima finale, grazie per il tifo. Dai, thank you. Doing it for Italy. Can't wait to watch you in the final, Leo. Yes. Go get, go get rested up and we'll see you soon. Thank you. Literally wears the flag on his sleeve, so proud to be the first ever competitor to represent Italy on the top 34. He's been off and on tour. He's broken his back at Pipeline, puts in the hard work. He is loyal and committed to his goal of being a world champion. And talk about the European force for Pipeline. The story stops at 
Starts and stops with Jeremy Flores, two-time pipe champion. And now we're looking to see what Leonardo can do for Europe and for Italy in this next big matchup we call the final. A couple of surfers on the move right now. Chianca with a 4-5. Robinson, remember, hit the reef on this board. He's still able to get barreled on it. And now he's going to straighten out. So still with some damage done to his equipment. He stayed calm, got shacked, and now we'll see the board change. Yep. See, he's already got his leggy off. Board caddy running down the beach. That's how you have to do it pretty quickly. There, there's not a lot of room for mistakes when you get this far in the draw. Um, and, but I think he's going to go back out there with that confidence, knowing, okay, my equipment's good. I don't have to worry about it. It's just something in your brain, you know, even if there's just a small thing. And if there's a small thing on the bottom of your board, it's important because a lot of water can get trapped. And it can, these guys are so precise that it can really affect your performance. So true. As we take another look, this was the split, Chianca's wave. Yeah, kind of backdoors that left there. Oh, unfortunately, he can't make it out, but it looked good in the beginning. And then we see Jack right here pulling straight into the barrel, setting up here just a little bit foamy, and he's signaling his caddy, meet me on the beach. That was a great message there as Jack's already on his way back out, not spending too much time having to worry about it. Bemrose. He blew the fiend box. Hey. Sharing us what happened here. Yeah. yeah, we see it, Matt. Buckled it. Oh, it good man. You saw that? Good thing Bemrose is in shape, man. That guy works out just to be in those moments. That's why you train as a caddy as well, just to be right there at the water's edge with that board change. Actually, I remember when we were on tour, uh, I remember Bemmy back when I was on tour doing just the QSs and stuff. He had a boxing trainer. Like, his trainer was a boxer. That's awesome. And we see that a lot with surfers, you know, spending some time boxing, multiple time longboard world champ, Kalia Moniz, Seth Moniz, their father, Tony Moniz, world-class boxer and great surfer. What a workout that is. So Jack on his way back out, 517 on the board with the busted fin box. That's his best so far. And Chianca on the backhand, 4.5 is his best so far. Now needing a 4.35 to potentially enter his first championship tour final. Thinking about those first, uh, Kalani Chapman, his first CT final as a wild card here at Pipe. Same for Jamie O'Brien. Kieran Perot, his first final of his career right here at Pipe. Shane Werner. An Aussie made a final that Kelly won back in 99. Kelly said that was really cool to have a, a final with Shane because he knew that he was real sneaky good out here, as he calls it. He's just one of those guys that could be overlooked as far as the favorites to win, but he knew Shane had a special connection with his place. And sometimes those moments are just kind of beyond yourself. It's pipe, and you're in the final with a chance to win. Yeah, it's Pipe, and Pipe brings out the best um, in those specialists out here. We even have, you know, remember that final with the Johnny Boy and Uncle Mike? You know, that was pretty incredible. So not only, you know, people's first wins, but like re reviving their careers and um, like really bringing out that youth in everyone. Dimity Stoyle, do you have any more, in more information on the board for Jack Robinson? Yeah, I just uh, ran into Matt Bembrose. He's looking after both Joel and Jack out there today. Um, famously, they're both in the Volcom house together, so Bemmy's just taking care of all the spare boards, all the foot massages, and um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, he just gave Jack a quick couple of um, quick couple of words, gave him the time update, and uh, you know, you can't be too biased when he's got both of his athletes out in the water today. Really cool having a responsibility of two athletes in the same stable and that just uh, is the proving grounds, right? When you've got a home right here on the sand with a lot of legends to talk to about how this wave works, it makes sense they've got two guys in the semifinals. As yeah. we watch a wave running through here, Megan, we've got Jack Robinson up and out. Yeah, it looks like he's just kind of feeling that board under his feet. Um, you, you switch a board halfway through your heat, it's always... Um, a little nerve-wracking when you first stand up. You never know how it's going to 
go even though you've used it in a free surf, it's different when you put a jersey on. It's interesting how some surfers need to make sure they know everything going on with a board before they even enter, you know, a matchup of any kind. And then some can just go, this is a freshie. It feels good. Let's see how it goes. I remember Sonny Garcia was like that as a world champion. He'd have brand new boards, sometimes every single heat on the way to some big wins. Yeah, Sonny always had such um, unique ways of approaching heats. Um, but, you know, he was on tour for so long. He, he did things right, though. He, he knew what worked for him. And that's what matters. That's the most important thing when you get on tour and you're traveling all throughout the years is just what works for me. Just because something works for the next surfer doesn't mean it's going to work for me. Strider Wazulewski, these guys have a chance at a pipe final. How's Jack Robinson feeling right now? Well, I think just getting back in into the lineup and on, a, on new boards, you know, you want to try it out, and that's exactly what he did. He got to his feet. He felt the, you know, the flow of the board. It's almost all it takes. It's just one little up and down, and you feel like you've got confidence in the equipment that you brought out. Uh, and so he feels that. He was paddling back out, super arced up and really confident. So it made me lead, lead, led me to believe that he likes what was under his feet, which is what we want. We want to see that confidence exuded. Those are all brand new boards. He just posted something on Instagram of all the boards laid out. So a beautiful shot of all of his new equipment. Uh, and hopefully he can come through in the end of this thing and find himself some nuggets. That's right. Thank you, Oz, for the update. And that's a big part of setting yourself up for a big event, isn't it, Megan? Looking at your entire quiver, you have your go-to for certain sizes, but you definitely have thought about what might be next just in case a board breaks in action. Yeah, that's all that preparation in um, surfing an event. And, you know, being prepared is all part of your job as a professional surfer to think, believe it or not, that's your job, but being prepared, even stickering your boards up after a while, it does, you know, seem a little bit like a chore because that's part of your job. <laughs> and you want to surf and your board's not ready yet, but you are a pro, so you need to represent when you paddle out. I've seen a lot of the these team houses, they'll have the Grom sticker up the boards for them as sort of a chore, you know? I like Which, that. And the kids love it. They're like, Do they wax no it too? Sometimes. <laughs> I've seen that happen as well. You know what is the worst, I think, Joe? Um, De-waxing your board. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's what you need the Grom for. That is a great idea for a Grom. But now 16.25 on the clock. Leo Fioravanti already in the final. Looking for a big pipe title to kick off the year. And just to note, we're going to have a new leader of the tour wearing yellow heading into Sunset Beach on the men's and women's side with Steph Gilmore, the defending world champ, out early in pipe. Felipe Toledo went out earlier today from Giacianca. So yellow is up for grabs. Exciting. And it's safe to say that both these surfers probably you know, their styles will suit Sunset. Such a great part of the season, all starting here on the North Shore of Oahu. Robinson staying on his feet with a 5-1-7 and a 3-6-7, leading over Joao Chianca. Plenty of time on the clock. We'll be right back.
tons of people come to surf the North Shore every winter. And I think we have a kuleana, a responsibility as ocean people to make sure that our aina and land stays healthy and clean. We're really grateful to WSL for providing a donation to North Shore Community Land Trust. And the impact of those funds will be continuing to restore lo'i kalo, like the one we see right here, traditional Hawaiian taro patches. Kalo is a very important plant for our people. It's our food source. You can eat it from the flower to the stem to the root. Pretty much like identifies Hawaiian culture. So it's awesome to see them building a big lo'i patch back here. Tell us what you're doing by posting on social media with the hashtag WeAreOneOcean and tagging WSL and WSL Pure in your posts. We are one ocean! Oh. <laughs>Jack Robinson looking at the left. He'll pull in the first section, staying wide open till now as it shuts down on his back. And Robinson will recover from that wipeout and try to get back into position to go to work against Chianka. A serious rematch from last year. Jack, always with a huge reputation in pipeline, ended up losing pretty convincingly to Chianka in pumping conditions, and it was early. It was the round of 32. That's when Chianka was making his rookie debut and showing the world what he's capable of in giant conditions and pipe and back door. As you can see, supporters for both camps here, Chianka and Robinson, get to stay in this house whenever they want. There's I some see. classic characters as well, like <laughs> Dave Riddle. Yeah, my old roommate, there. Dave Riddle. You know, <laughs> Dave, Andy, and I used to live together back in the day. Andy would run up way up there, rent a room from us. You know, just because it was quiet and we made homemade dinners and just we were just like all friends. <laughs> it was really cool. That's so awesome. And then for Dave Riddle, he's just a mentor for so many up and coming surfers for so many years here on the North Shore. He stays so physically fit. He still swims all the time, loves his surfing, loves his spots up and down this coastline. Always special when you get to talk surf with Dave Riddle. Yeah, um, how many 70-year-olds do you know ride a 6'2"? Like regular width, too, not talking a fish, like a, sh a high-performance shortboard. Oh, it's incredible. 11, 10 on the clock here. There was so much on the line for these two. Jack Robinson, his wife, is from Brazil, so he spends a lot of time in Brazil. He really loves the food there. Picanha, a favorite, he says, for himself. Padofa, something you put on the beans and rice. He said that's his favorite and go-to when he's visiting the in-laws. Is that the spicy stuff you put on? It's like the powder stuff yeah. you put on the rice and beans, yeah. I used to love, you know, the little street vendors everywhere. They have their skewers, and then you get your rice and beans, and you know, it costs like $3. It's amazing. Yeah, such good food. Robinson also has a Corinthians jersey, a very popular soccer team or football team so yeah he kind of laughed and said so yeah i guess i'm a supporter there as we watch this one stretching out the right now trying to slam on the brakes with the arm bar a bit late there and didn't quite find a line to follow the stalling technique chianka goes down on an opportunity yeah joe there you can't completely see it from um, your tv screen at home but uh, you can see him taking off here. He's actually pretty far down, almost to eights. And that's kind of that section that I know Ross was alluding to earlier that, you know, can't clamp. You, it depends on which wave you get. But that is that they're pretty far down, um, just almost to the left of back. Door. It's all about starting off strong. Remember the mid-season cut that we went through last year? Oh, yeah, it's back. But everyone's more prepared than ever. We're here at the Billabong Pro Pipeline today. We're finishing, and we don't have... Too much time off. Hurley Pro Sunset stop number two is going to be very exciting. A wave that Megan competed on for several years. And then we'll head over to Europe. The male Rip Curl Pro Portugal at Super Tubos in Peniche is going to continue the story of the title race, followed by a classic. A lot of longevity in this event. Megan loves her bell. Rip Curl Pro Bells Beach, followed by the Margaret River Pro, Jack Robinson's hometown. He'll be the defending event champ. Before the cut happens, the tour shrinks down in size, can capitalize on a swell window, and then it's all about the race. 
to make it into the WSL Final Five. Surf Ranch Pro is back, going back to Central California into that wave system, man-made system. It creates perfect waves on demand. Back to the Surf City El Salvador Pro just for the second time in surfing history. And then the Vivo Rio Pro. More fans on the beach than any other event on the calendar. Felipe remains king at that venue. Carissa Moore calls it maybe one of the most emotional wins of her career just last season. And then the Corona Open J-Bay, one of Megan's favorites that's been there for a long time. It's that ruler edge point break that every point break is compared to. And then the Shiseido Tahiti Pro. That one's going to be intense because that's where we decide who's going to lower trestles for the Rip Curl WSL Finals. I mean, just looking at that on paper, I'm just in awe. I really, it's so many iconic events and to start the tour off with those five events, every single wave is iconic. I remember when we first started going to Portugal, you know, it was the search event and, um, you know, just seeing there's so many great waves on tour and it's really diverse too. It's high performance surfing, big barrels, uh, heavy water, and it, to end it all at lower trestles, the most high performance wave in the world, this is gonna be a great year. So excited to see all these guys perform from start to finish. In my mind, the best athletes in the world as we watch Chianka set up that first section Clear make on the tube. There's a blast to finish. That's the combo he was looking for. And I love that. Arms crossed. Getting the crowd behind him. A 4.35 gets him the lead. Yeah, Joe, we have a new claim for this event here. <laughs> here he goes. Stalling in there. Stays in the barrel beautifully. Beautiful off the lip there. And Joe Ao's claim. We have some great claims from this this uh, event. Oh, <laughs> there you see the water angle for that wave. And then boom, just that board for it being the second time he's ridden that board. Unreal. Look at that aerial shot. You can see all the crevices in the reef and he just stamps it there at the end. That aerial shot's always such a great reminder of how shallow it is. Remember what happened to Robinson at the start of the heat. Yeah, he just like weightless on that turn at the end there. Pleased with himself. You know, he does, there aren't a lot of waves out there and they're like, they're scouting the lineup right now. They're just searching. They're on this, the hunt for, and they know this reef really well. So I like that they're moving around on it, finding what they can out there. And he's surfing, I, I know I've said it today, but he really is surfing loose and spicy and just looks on point. It's so interesting now when you see these surfers left in the draw, making, you know, semifinals, finals, how they actually might feel a little bit of pressure off, you know, with this mid-season cut. You know, you kind of like the final last year with Kelly and Seth. They had some tough results to follow, but it not only kept them on tour for the entire year, but also for the start of 2023. So starting strong and then having a way of it pipe, you definitely deserve that jump start on the rankings. And with all those things you want to accomplish, mid-season cut and hopefully WSL Final Five. Yeah, and you always want to start the event off well and with, on a good foot and have that confidence throughout the rest of the year. Numbers in for Chianka. 5.43 gets the lead off Robinson. Jack now needs a 4.77 as he holds priority. A very tight heat. Hard to separate these two at the moment in semifinal number two. Jack already making a decision here. Needs a 4.77. Getting a lot of drive on that first section. He's got the make. Now into the end section. Drops that back shoulder and just chips it shut. Next one is a late takeoff on the way out for Joao. Joe, who do you think they're rooting for? Hard to say. Hard to I, say right? I think it's just a party next door. I mean, they Something must be smells so good. Happy. It's always Ty Van Dyke on the barbecue and always keeps a close eye on all of his competitors that stay at the house. Time on a Henry's always a great face to see and there he's sitting with the all the blue on. As we check out Jack first. Yeah Jack nice and deep on this barrel. Just driving through that thing and huge ending turn there. Just stamps it off the end section there. Water shot here. You see him driving in that barrel. Let's see what we can see from this the end of this, oh, I love this um, 
point of view, this perspective, but right here, look how much speed he has. Just straight into the lip there. Perfect timing, and it is shallow there. It's not even a foot deep. And it's such a great point that you put there because he might have extended that hack a little more if he had more water to ride away, but he's already had to make a board change once. He's got a very explosive layback where he can blow the whole tail out. That was a very smart move for Jack to hit it with a lot of speed. Yeah, I think it was smart, Joe, as you mentioned, because also that section of the wave comes at you. And if you're going to a layback with the section coming at you, it makes it a little harder and you can sometimes get stuck. Strider, how's Jack's confidence right now as he's just taking the lead back with a 6.5? Boy, I, I'm really impressed actually with the confidence before the wave to let Joao take that little nugget underneath priority. It was, I think it was a 5.5 five or something like that in that range, but to let him, his opponent, take a good looking little wave and knowing it and feeling that there was going to be a better one was what I loved. And it did, it came to him. So, you know, he's surfing with a lot of headspace, a lot of confidence and understanding that he's in a rhythm, he knows what's coming, or he's, at least he feels like he knows what's coming and he proved it with that wave. Strider, little condition update right now. Anything changing? Uh, well, it was really blistery out here with the wind. At the moment, we've got a little cloud cover, and it's kind of mellowed things out, which is a blessing because the wind was just sh really just striking across the surface. It was all chopped up, white caps everywhere. Right now, we got a little bit of glass on it, so maybe opening up some more tube rides. Good man was. Jack Robinson has just skyrocketed to the top of the tour in a short period of time. Qualified as an exciting rookie, saved himself with his first ever championship tour win in Mexico. And then the following year, he just kept on performing in finals. Three final appearances, two wins last year on the championship tour to earn his spot at the Rip Curl WSL finals. So many great moments and a lot of buzzer beaters as well. That was the crazy thing about his ride. Thinking about G-Land, five seconds to go against... Medina, then Felipe, back to back, and it happened just like magic. Yeah, Joe, he's really figured out that recipe for success when it comes to competition. And he's figured it out in many different types of waves. And we were waiting for him to come onto the scene and for this to happen. And it seems like, you know, they say once you get that first taste, you never forget it. And I feel like he's just, this is just the beginning of Jack Robinson. Entering the final minute, pressure on Joao Chianca. He's already committing with priority, late to pull in, but he still has some drive. And the wave at back door is not gonna let him out. He got moving so quickly in such a tight space, almost thought he was leaning back. The man is so talented. He almost pulled it off for a moment there. Chianca now won't have priority. 40 seconds chasing a 6-2-5. Things really starting to favor Jack Robinson now. Yeah, things are looking good for him. Jack has priority. All he really has to do is kind of shadow Joao. And it's going to be tough for Joao to get that score. And for Chianca, he's just going ocean. Give us a multiple wave set quickly to force Jack to make a decision with priority. Not too much time. And Joao starting to realize that might have been it. A big semi-final appearance for Joao Chianca for the first time in his career and keeping his amazing reputation intact at Pipeline as he'll kick off the season equal number three in the world heading into Sunset Beach. Jack Robinson is in the final at Pipe to take on Leonardo Fioravanti in just a matter of moments. Coming up next, the women's final hits the lineup. Tyler Wright taking on Carissa Moore. We'll be right back.
Wright's not going to wait for priority. Here she goes. Drops in. Beautiful barrel. Gets the completion. High float on the inside. A dominant Tyler Wright. Every time we go out, we kind of know a little bit more. We know where the wave directions, the winds, and how the ocean moves and feels out there. Love that entry for Riss. Right into the barrel, maxing out the tube time. Carissa Moore with a brilliant job, air dropping right behind the curtain. Welcome back to the Billabong Pro Pipeline. It is time for the final. Tyler Wright takes on Carissa Moore. What a classic. Tyler finishing number eight in the world last year. Carissa Moore, runner up in the showdown. And the craziest thing, these two have an unbelievable track record at this wave in a very short period of time. Remember, this was a final in the Maui Pro continuation. Tyler got the win. Last year, Tyler made the semifinals. Carissa was runner up to Moana Jones Wong. So for Riss, three straight finals with uh, creating women's history with the move to Pipeline. A lot to look forward to. Joe Turpel, Laura Enover, Big Wave Charger, and a longtime CT performer as well, Ross Williams, here for the call. Laura, these are your peers in the lineup. You spent time with both Carissa and Tyler. Who's going to really take the edge in this final? Yes, I spent seven years on tour with these girls, and then obviously many years on the, on the QS and Grom comps, everything since we were about 12 years old together competing. And uh, their first final was back in 2011 on tour, and it just... They've had so many. I think 11. This is their 11th final. I think that's got to be a record. Two surfers facing each other in a final that many times in surfing history. I don't think anyone else or any other duo have that many championship tour finals. Look at this. 7-3 in favor of Carissa Moore. And that was seven straight. So Tyler was losing world titles, finishing runner-up back-to-back season to Carissa more often than not, but things have switched as Tyler's won the last three. That was just what I was going to mention, Joe. You're right. Uh, look at the last three. Um, and uh, these surfers, uh, you know, they have a short memory. So, you know, Chris is going to be fired up. And I, I want to give credit, too, uh, to Chris because it seems like she's reinvigorated by all the Groms that are on tour. She's inspired. I don't see her being, like, settled and satisfied uh, and complete after world title. She seems to reboot herself every year. 100%, you know, they, they come back over and over again and just, uh, just c consistently evolving. You know, they were both so young when they got on tour. They were just kids. And, you know, Tyler was 14 when she won her first World Championship Tour event. And, you know, just seeing these two battle it out, they must partly know each other like the back of their hand, but then also not. They're good friends as well, and they've just had so many memories and uh, shared experiences together around the world. It's so true how similar their roles have been as well to becoming these legendary athletes on tour world champions. 14, Tyler Stahl is the record youngest ever to win a CT. And Carissa had a wild card at 14 to snap her rocks and was runner up in the final to a world champ named Chelsea Hedges. And she was just 14. The writing was all already on the wall for both of these surfers for, for future greatness, Ross. Uh, that's, a, that's a good point that both of you bring up, that they were child phenoms. But uh, the more important thing to take note of is the longevity of their career. And they're still so relevant. I, I don't really see the top of the mountain for these surfers in terms of their surfing ability. They seem like they're still in their prime. Uh, and again, they're really, uh, I think, motivated by the Groms on tour, by Molly, by Sakata, by all these young surfers on tour. I, it's keeping them on their toes. Yeah, I love that Carissa mentioned that in her post heat interview from the semifinals. You know, her and Betty Lou have had some amazing battles. And same, like you just said, Tyler and Molly, they're just getting constantly, you know, reinvigorated by the next generation. And, you know, just their quests to uh, win more world titles. I know they're both not done. Uh, they both want some more metal. Coaching cat on for me, Ross, real quick. I mean, we're talking about two of the greats right now in this final. Have you been able to identify maybe weaknesses in their game, whether it be heat strategy. Is there any way to open a door against these two to rely on when you're trying to compete against them? No, no weaknesses. I mean, these both these surfers are so consistent. Uh, they have talent. Um, but one thing that does separate some of the younger surfers from the older surfers is the younger surfers sometimes have a little more edge, just a little more X factor. 
And as we see this year unfold, we'll have to keep an eye on that. We, I haven't seen it pan out yet. I mean, the veterans have been uh, cleaning up the, the, the board with the youngsters so far. This is where you want to see who demands the first wave. It'll go to Tyler Wright. Sweep off the bottom. There's that classic grab rail that she loves to go to. Hard section to deal with on the finish. So she'll settle for one move. Carissa's turn up and out. So okay. Tyler running down the reef and just didn't quite find the second bonus section. But Chris has got plenty of space to regain first priority at the start of this final. That's sometimes the best part to watch. Who's going to demand getting position on the opening exchange? Let's now catch up with another finalist here at Pipe, Jack Robinson's with Dimity. Wow, Jack Robinson. Looked like you were so in rhythm. They were going back and forth in that one against Joao, but you backed your, you know, you backed your vibe in the, out there in that ocean, and and you, you got the ones you needed in the end. Yeah, um, I actually I, I pretty much busted the fin out of my board on the first first wave. I kept riding it. I just trampled over the rocks. I was like, da -da -da -da, and then I was like, oh no. And then I looked at the fin. It was broken. I was like, I'm going back out just because I still had two fins at least. I was like, all right. So hopefully we'll make one, and then yeah. And a few few quick words from Bemi on the beach, and then you're back out there, but you still backed yourself. You and knew you were going to find that one, those ones to get the win in the end. Yeah, it's cool. Um, I was actually stoked. I changed this board anyway. Little spray inspired by Paco and Taj. I think they kind of had the same one, so I wanted to get on this board. And then, um, yeah, just just chipping away at it. It's it's kind of just got to try and find the rhythm. So. Well, three final appearances last year and the first event for your year in 2023 into the final. Uh, what's what's going to take to get the win this event? I still haven't thought about it. <laughs> Not giving you anything just yet. <laughs> um, yeah, I, 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 it'll be cool. Um, it's Leo, right? Leo's in the final. So go share a final with him. And I know we kind of grew up together. Well, we did grow up together for so many years. So, yeah. It'll be cool to share one with him. It'll be a battle of the King of the Groms. Good luck. We'll have some. Yeah, we'll get it. <laughs> Thanks so much, Jack. Can't wait to watch you in the final. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Timothy. Love the laugh from Jack Robinson, remembering his childhood. It was a special one growing up with guys like Leo Ferravanti, Kanoa Garashi, Mikey Wright. There's so much great footage of those young kids. They all kind of knew what they'd be doing when they were grown-ups. Now, a final? Decide who's going to be. The champ at Pipe this year, they've got to be pinching themselves. I literally remember both Leo and Jack up at the Quickie Pro on the Gold Coast for Snapper Rocks, and uh, both of them with their little bowl cuts being like <laughs> little 12 year olds, and they were just these child prodigies. So uh, it's, it's going to be an awesome battle, and uh, how exciting. Also, so cool to see Jack. He seems calm this year, and, but, but more like loose, I think. We didn't hear a laugh like that last year. He was being very serious in his post heats, very calm. So, uh, yeah, a bit of a giggle there. Mm. Yeah, Jack. Jack's fun. He's a, he's a modern day hippie in a lot of ways. He, he, <laughs> you know, he he tries to do that art of war whole thing, but in in his own hippie way, if that makes sense. He's got a good amount of Margaret River in him, and uh, and it it really is true to his character. That's how he translates his character, his vibe uh, into winning heats out here. And sometimes just a location is the best place to keep you grounded. You know, when you have a spotlight on you, interviews, and you retreat to a place like West Oz, you go back to your roots very easily. Yeah, so many waves in WA, and uh, yeah, Jack literally been getting barreled since he was eight years old. Some very popular jerseys right there. Felipe Toledo, defending world champ this year, went down in the quarters, but starting with an equal fifth, his personal best to date in pipeline. And Carissa Moore, number 10, always striving for perfection, is in the water now and looking for her first pipe trophy, three consecutive finals. On a wave like this, Ross, what does that mean? She's done her homework. You know, I, Carissa didn't surf at Pipe and Backdoor that often earlier in her career, but in the last several years, she realized that, uh, you know, we're going to have more focus out here, and she's gone to work. She's, you know, did a little bit of work at Jamie O'Brien a few years ago. That really helped her lineups. Uh, now she's been working with Love Hodel, who's put a lot of time out here, um, and she's she has a calculated uh, attack out here at Pipe and Back Door. She's really consistent, but she's got crazy talent. She does know how to get in those deep barrels and come out. I've absolutely been loving watching Carissa's evolution here at Pipe and Back Door. Just like you were saying then, Ross, she didn't used to spend a lot of time out here, but, uh, you know, 
she last year she hardly had an off season maybe a couple of months after you know the WSL finals and then straight away she's on the south shore so as soon as the north shore winter starts she was up here for every single swell wasn't missing you know a wave uh just trying to be up here basing herself in the north shore so you know like the rest of the ct crew everyone had a pretty big off season but just amazing to see carissa putting in the work non-stop i'm like girl you need a holiday but no nope, she's getting barreled she keeps a busy schedule but she loves it strider wazalewski let's talk wave selection in this final yeah, you know, I think it's just going to come down to picking those moments. I feel like they're far and few between, so you really have to select the right wave. As we see right now, Carissa taking a look at this one. She doesn't like it. She did look like she was going to go for a little concerted effort there, but it's going to all come down to picking that one wave that's going to give you that score. Uh, and, and you know you need two, but I feel like there's not a lot of great waves out here, so really settling into this heat and knowing you got the time to find a couple is going to take the whole heat to get them, but they're out here. Stride of the waves you've seen so far, do you think there'll be some barrels taking the wind today, or, is it, or barrels and turns, combination of both? What's your prediction there? I feel like the tube's gonna win, and, and that's we've seen that you know throughout this entire event, and that's what uh, you know pipeline's all about and backdoor. But you know, with the with that said, there's a lot of wind coming in and out of the picture. So as that wind comes in, it, it makes it harder as it lays down, which it has been coming uh, up and down throughout this this afternoon and I'm, I'm I'm hoping it lays down enough so we can get some nice clean sections for them to attack and get in the barrel and come out and do those big finish turns. Good man was pipe legend 30 years of surfing out here and enjoying the final between Tyler Wright and Carissa Moore as it's really just getting started. 2-5 start for Tyler 0.37 for Carissa and Tyler has first priority. Ross what's in that in a final when you kind of can analyze the start of a heat. You've got you know over 35 minutes to get two waves. What's happened so far? Well, you know this is a, a kind of a shaky start for Carissa. She you know, she doesn't have a score yet. Uh, keep in mind, also Tyler doesn't have any big scores yet either. But uh, and then she backed up her her small score with a loss of priority. So as far as the chess game goes, as far as the mental uh, part of the game, uh, you know uh, Carissa is being tested a little bit right now. But the good thing for her. Uh, there's 27 minutes nearly left, so she's got a lot of time. Tyler looks so incredibly focused. Her boards from John Pizel have been looking fantastic. Was on a 5-9 yesterday. The thing is, the story about Tyler is she started off the year number one in the world when she won the continuation event out here. Had some strong moments even last season. One of her favorite moments was winning the bell. Uh, her, the one event she wanted to win more than anything else, but she's been absent from the WSL final five. Laura, the way she looks now, is that gonna change this year? Yeah, I loved that that final with Carissa and Tyler at Bells, that was a that was a cracker and you know Tyler looked like she was in form last year, just ready to absolutely rumble as we see Carissa having a little look. But uh we saw a different shade of Tyler last year. She was so focused, you could tell that she was all in and just gearing to try chase down that world title. But uh unfortunately in G Land missed a, a couple of events with illness and then came back in J-Bay and just put on an absolute show. So and I think just seeing how, how focused, precise, sharp and calm she is at the moment, it's it's really cool to see. And she spent a lot of time over here in December as well, was trying out new boards, working with Pizel, working with Andy King. And she surfed out here a lot of days when it was like this, days where there weren't too many crew in the water and she was just getting used to this, this reef here. So it's, it's paying off. So much in the story of being an athlete and a world champion outside the surfing, the big turns, the big heats is just feeling good. And Tyler's been willing to share that story with us for her entire career and just being able to finish from day one to the end of the season be really challenging, especially when you surf at a high level. Yeah, it can. Uh, and, you know, just to touch back a little bit on Strider's uh, kind of report in the water. Um, I almost saw it really, it was easier for the competitors to compete this morning when it was really choppy because it was pretty much only turns and only performance. But now that there's kind of the lucky dip one or two barrels per heat, there is a little bit of a Yahtzee effect out there. You got to find that one magic wa wave. Yeah, it throws a spanner in the works, doesn't it? Uh, you know, I feel like Carissa is the queen of patience. She's, she's the ice queen. She can sit and uh, just really do the work when she's you know, sometimes sat for 15 minutes. Looks like Tyler's having a sniff. Tyler Wright has a bigger wall than her start, but that'll shut down immediately. And priority goes to Chris Moore. 
So she definitely thought she saw something on that opportunity, and now Carissa will have the advantage of priority. That's a bit of a mistake there. I thought that wave was worth it for Carissa to go on, but she let it go. See her coach right there, Love Hodel, guiding her. I actually don't like that. Uh, I just don't like it when your athlete's looking over their shoulder towards the beach. I'd rather them be independent and confident in their own decision making, but everyone's different. You know, sometimes they do miss a wave and that can be beneficial, but in my opinion, that's kind of high risk. Rolling into this one, we have Carissa Moore. Has the speed, beautiful bottom turn, snaps it. Nice and tight in the pocket. And starts that carve nice and early. Smart decision over the shallow reef as she will get that roundhouse out of the way. The Whitewater did pick her up towards the tail end of that. Laura, are you calling that a completion on the final turn? We'll have to have a look at it again, but uh, you know, it's, there's so much going on in there. There's rocks, as we saw Jack, he just got bucked off his board in that last heat. But um, you know, Chris is just wanting to get something on the board here. I love this first turn, slash in the pocket. I almost thought she was gonna try just jam this end section, but she goes for the roundhouse cut back instead. Let's see. I don't think they're going to call that a completion, to be honest. Yeah, both these surfers, uh, surprisingly, for the first time I've seen in this contest, a little too far down towards off the wall. Uh, Tyler's wave actually had a barrel on it, but she raced towards the channel and actually missed it. Uh, she she sort of kicked out or took off and kicked out right where the, the gap is in the reef. So just a little too conservative with their line as far as looking for ain'ts. Uh, it's a tricky little section, Joe, where uh, it's a fine line between getting a closeout and finding that doggy door. Uh, it, it really does look like a closeout, but um, you got to be right behind that bubble. So right there, judges react to the finishing roundhouse incomplete as she didn't ride away with control. She is scored on that big first turn, 2.77. Remember, Tyler had a 2.5. So still incredibly close, basically even with 21.45 on the clock. Their battles have been unbelievable over the years. 22 CT meetings, 11th final <laughs> that they're entering at the CT level. And I remember when Tyler was losing the world title race to Chris Moore in back-to-back -back seasons, I think Tyler moved on in like two seconds. He was like, okay, that was cool. Let's go ahead and do it again. And it was her honest reaction. She, she didn't have any downtime of being disappointed. But then there was one moment where it really hurt in the heat at lowers, where it hit her as she got the loss on the beach at lower trestles. And she identified that feeling of pain from losing, and that changed everything with her actually desiring a world title. She went back to back to follow that tough loss. Strider Wazalewski, things are still incredibly close at the moment in this final. They are, and that was a... Uh, a lot of work that Carissa just put in to get back through that inside section. We know how shallow it is in there. And Carissa just put her head down, ducked up three, four, five, six waves in a row just to get through that. Probably scraped the knuckles on the bottom. It's so shallow, but persistence paid off. She's back out into the lineup. And on the way back out, I think that one of the key elements here is you can always find those little waves at eight. There's always that little hope, you know, that little glimmer of hope of finding that one little lucky dip barrel that you can find on the way back out. So. I think that it's a great call today to just take a couple on the head, get back out through the, the, the back door side of things so you can get uh, try and find a score on the way. Thank you, Strider. Ross, any personality to talk about, about where they're sitting with eights and comparing it to back door off the wall, or is it just sort of where it shifts and flows on a day like today? Well, the one comfortable thing about as far as lining up down at the end of the reef, uh, there's a, a distinct... Uh, little channel. There's there's that little gutter of sand right there between off the wall uh, and ain't. Uh, so you don't really have to look at a house and line up a tree with a house and all that. It's not, it's, you know, there's a lot of uh, room to sort of go deeper or towards the channel, but you really need to pay attention to that sandbar filled gap in the reef. Yeah, there's, there's all that reef there. And then, like you said, the sand, so it goes super blue water, but you want to stay in the darker water so you know that you're on that reef and uh, hopefully your wave is going to spit you out into that nice blue water. Which, Joe, so it, it made for an interesting heat because they both misread that last set a little bit. Maybe maybe Chris was paying attention to Love's board, on, uh, got a little distracted. I don't know what happened, but that last set had two scores on it, and it, they both misread it just a little bit. So right there, Tyler losing priority, and now Carissa will have priority on the switch as she still is hoping for a sore, score of substance in this matchup. Eyes on the horizon for risk, but Tyler 
Saw a little tiny wave that she couldn't catch up to. Right now, Laura, did you, would you mind not having priority on a day like today, or is it going to be everything to win this final? I mean, I think Ty will be kicking herself that she went that last small wave, but uh, obviously she's just trying to find one of those smaller barreling, barreling waves that's going to run across the reef. Uh, I think that was a bit of a mistake, and you can see she's going to sit nice and close to Tyler right now and, and just wait for something a bit better. Reading the ocean, what a skill set to have on a day like today. You can, you know, not waste any time catching waves and dry docking scores under the three-point range. We'll see what happens in the back end of this final. It's still incredibly close with two world champions going for the yellow jersey and a championship here at Pipeline. We'll be right back. Let's flash back to last season. One of the greatest contests on earth, the Rip Curl Pro Bells Beach. Carissa going head to head with Tyler Wright. For Riss, she's already had a few bells. Tyler looking for her first bell of her career. And it was all about the final member. Brisa was number one in the world at this time. Carissa was able to take the yellow jersey with this runner up finish. He was ripping, but it was Tyler Wright's day as we look back, Laura. Yes, this was Tyler Wright's day. She went out and absolutely dominated in this heat, just dropped two hammers on Carissa at the very start of the heat, and just Carissa was left trying to fight back, and this was where we really saw Tyler just, you could see the passion and the energy and how much this meant to her, this win, and she had her whole family on the beach, she had her wife on the beach, and it was just a really special moment. She's been surfing this wave, Rincon and Bells, since she was absolute grommet, so she knows it so well. See Mikey and Owen there. It was a super special moment for the family to all come together and celebrate this win. Uh, and for an Australian to win in Australia in front of her major sponsor, it was everything she ever dreamed of. She said she puts that bell right next to her world titles and the chair up the famous stairs. And so incredible looking back. And look at this head-to-head -head history. 13 wins for Carissa, 8 for Tyler. It's really a tale of two different eras. We had Carissa in the beginning win 11 of their first 13 matchups. It's been all about Tyler Moore recently, just getting on a roll against Carissa Moore, picking up more wins, winning their last six of eight matchups as we look at the final. Continuing 14.50 on the clock. Here comes Tyler Wright. First turn, nice snap off the top. Power hack right there. Great motion to finish as she got on a roll. Nice clean rail-to-rail -rail work, putting herself in a great position in the pocket and trying to really battle with Carissa Moore. Ross, what'd you see? Well, I, I want to give props to Tyler. I feel like she's surfing better than I've ever seen her surf. Uh, you know, a lot of times she gets emotional and tries to sell a turn. And in my opinion, sometimes it gets in the way of the actual quality of the turn. Uh, but right now, her board is on rail a little deeper than I've seen in the past. She's drawing really sharp turns. The board looks fast. So, uh, you know, Tyler is looking really good this year. Well, and I'm just going to eat my words because uh, before I was saying that she was looking waves too small, but a five-point ride for that wave from Tyler, and that was 
three turns, smaller wave, and just goes to show that the power and her execution and the criticalness of her turns are doing some damage. She looks unbelievable at the start of the season, picking waves that she wants to tear to pieces, and she looks incredibly smooth. Here comes Tyler again. She'll pull in this time. Had a great amount of speed heading into that. Ended up kind of messy. That wave didn't help her out, but the five gives her the lead. Carissa now needs a 4.74. And Carissa definitely not satisfied with the runner-up finish at any level. Well, that's usually what it seems, but she said she can take some time to look back and see the positives about a final performance as Tyler's checking her foot there. Yeah, maybe a little whack on the reef, a little love kiss from back door. Another interesting note, Joe, um, you know, both these surfers get scored well, uh, and they're used to hearing huge scores. And uh, so that would give you confidence in finding a small, crummy wave and producing a score. As we see Carissa Moore having some ball to work with. Now setting that rail, pulling in. Can she go the distance? She does. Now with all the speed to kick out on the end section, Carissa Moore now turning in her best score so far of the final. Wow, she just went hooning through that barrel then. That was uh, that was so small but precise for her to do that. What do you think, Ross? Yeah, she waited. Uh, a lot of patience here waiting for this wave, found the barrel. Um, wasn't the most critical or deep barrel, but for today, right now, you know, it was a decent barrel, but a missed opportunity with the closeout turn. That would definitely frustrate her. It also leaves a little bit of a bad taste in the judge's mouth. So. This score is going to be solely based on this tube ride right here. To me, it just looks like average. It smells like a five to me. What do you think, Laura? Looked like she just skipped out there when she went to uh, hit that end section and just misread that. But I think this will be a good score. I think this will be up there with maybe the highest of the heat so far. It's Tyler. Tyler's turn. She'll just pull in. Next section is getting nice and mushy, but she has so much speed to push through it. And she trims the end section and stays on her feet. There's the celebration for Tyler. Yeah, you definitely want to have that section stay nice and open, not nice and mushy. But she punched through really well, and that was nice. And then getting the finish, her celebration is probably to fire herself up, to keep focused against one of the best ever to compete. This means a lot to her right now. To take this win would be absolutely huge for her campaign. And just so impressed with you know Tyler's compression and her leg strength to punch through that. You know, that would have been hard for any of uh, anyone really, but to stay on her feet then, that was good effort. A little more exciting too. You know, Chris's barrel was nice and smooth. Chris's wave was was better for sure, but that always impresses the judges when you can break through and get through those critical sections. She got the finish unlike Carissa, so a little more uh, I think the momentum is still in Tyler's corner. Almost totally opposite waves then. Carissa's barrel was so nice and, and open and round and perfect. And then Tyler's just, you know, had a lot to work through. But uh, those ends were different. As scores are in, Laura, for Carissa Moore, a 7.17. So seeing some serious separation there from the previous high mark of a five. Remember, still waiting for Tyler's last. Carissa up again. Nasty little tube. Somehow she works her way out. She'll get clipped on the exit. But making a move for that with priority, would you just call that a mistake, Laura? I think so. I mean, I think she was, you know, 10 minutes to go. Just wanted to drop that 2.77, which I think she will. But you know what? 10 minutes is a lot of time to try and, and better that score. So I'm surprised she, she went that. Ross, what'd you see here? Any point in taking this wave? It's like I said, you know, both these surfers are used to getting uh, big scores uh, in heats and, and even a seven. I think that's pretty good credit for just that, that you know, nice little barrel. So uh, it gives Carissa the confidence just to catch an OK wave and, and milk it to the beach and get a score. Unfortunately, again, she couldn't get that finished closeout turn or, or she would have had a backup score there. See Tyler looking at the Apple Watch to see if she had an update from the last score. Judge is still thinking about it. And there's that first decision on the panel. Five judges on, throwing it right into that five range category at the moment. She already has a five. She needs basically a five to take the lead off Carissa Moore. So think, very important decision right now. I think the judges really liked the quality of that wave uh, for Carissa's 7.17. Um, 
She read it nicely. She waited for it. She got the payoff. Uh, it's not like the, the barrel was really difficult, but the quality wave was, was really nice, and the judges paid her off. Pretty tough to get a big score when you're not on a set wave, isn't it, Ross? It, absolutely. On a day like today, again, it, it comes back to getting uh, a juicier wave. Here comes Tyler. She will end up just left, be left searching on the inside on wave number seven for her in this heat. Now she's got pocket fives. That was enough to take the lead off Riss. And now Carissa needs a 2.83 as she has her last score still yet to lock in that tiny little bubble that she pulled into and then fell on the exit out. Scores it now for Carissa. Maybe that fall cost her another lead change, a 2.4 just under. But you know what Carissa just got then? She got priority, which was uh, really important there. So I think Tyler will be kicking herself. She went that last wave. She almost should have, she maybe hadn't, she obviously saw her watch and, and that she was in the lead, but uh, yeah, a bit of a mistake there. Whoever wins this final will enter Sunset Beach number one in the world and will be wearing bright yellow heading into stop number two. Uh, seeing a final of world champions. Carissa with five, Tyler with two. Is the Italian preparing for his first ever championship tour final runs. Yeah, he's blowing some air out right there, just trying to stay calm. A lot of nerves for Leo trying to get that W. And he's got a, a beast of an opponent with Jack. This final, it ain't over yet. No, far from. This is going to be the longest seven minutes of their lives. You thought the women's semifinal between Tyler Wright and Lakey Peterson was close. 13.43 to 13.33. This is even closer. 10 Leo Fieravanti so focused has the Christian Bradley surfboard right next to him. That's like family for him. Stepped out as a beautiful surf warehouse shop glassing room distributing a lot of the best boards in the world famously known as stephen bell what a legend what that a final coming up next what a story change for leo as well you know 29th on the tour last year didn't make the cut him and joel you know both finishing in that same position and uh for them to come out and start the year like this and just take these points and take this in their stride for the rest of the year is is pretty cool to see they've just change their storyline. Love how those narratives can change. All that hard work. So much can happen in the off season. Carissa Moore told me in that one on one piece on WorldSurfLeague.com that losing the world title last year to Steph when she had that number one jersey almost the entire year almost was like a grieving process of how to let go of that season when you put so much into that effort to be the world champion. Yeah, she, she cares so much. Uh, she is emo Everyone's emotional on tour. So it kind of helps. It's actually beneficial to be a, an athlete that cares and really wants to win. But, um, you know, they have a memory. Uh, it's good. It, it really would pay dividends to have a memory of a goldfish. They say it's about three seconds. <laughs> Depending on who you ask, three seconds to five months. It's, it's up in the air with science. But, uh, you know, you don't want to build scar tissue. That's the main thing. You've yeah. got to be fresh every year. Chris's speech to honor Steph Gilmore was beautiful. Laura, you had the best seat in the house for that one. I did, yeah. There were, there were some beautiful speeches going down at the WSL Awards. And, yeah, Carissa just paying ode to how much of a you know hero Steph has been to her for her whole career. As we see a little look here. But uh, just so gracious in defeat. She's obviously had a little bit of time, <laughs> a few months now, to uh, probably prepare that and get over this process. That could have even been a way for her to totally let it go and move on into this year. It was like when you, you know, the full moon's out, you write down your little stuff and then burn it in the fire. Oh, I've never tried that. Apparently, no, it's a full moon now. We need to do it. <laughs> Joe, let's yeah. do it tonight. <laughs> okay, no, tonight. Let's I'm coming over. Together. <laughs> I can't wait. I think you're, you're spot on, though, Laura. That was total closure, and Carissa did say that. That was just okay. Last season's last season. Imua, let's move forward and take on another world title campaign. So far, Tyler or Chris will start either number two or number one in the world. As Tyler has the lead, pocket fives. Moore needs a 2-8-3, holding priority. I don't know if they'd realize they'd be chasing scores in that range at the end of this final, Ross. It's a, it's a funny predicament, actually, for Tyler. I know she's in the lead, but uh, she knows that Carissa has that big old score of a seven, so... I would think she's desperately thinking there's no way I can hold on to both of these fives. I'm going to have to find another wave out here with an opportunity to, to get rid of it. 
Chris Moore going for another big win. She's already third on the all-time win list for championship tour victories. First Steph, then Lane, then Carissa. If Carissa does win, she still needs another one to equal Lane Beachley. Carissa obviously second in this same final last year to Moana Wong, so she would be itching to get that win this year. Yeah, I feel like, and it's kind of been three in a row when you think about the continuation yeah. from Maui, and this was the final, Tyler and Carissa. I love seeing Carissa last year after her fourth consecutive final and three second places in a row, when she finally got that win in Rio. You could just see the elation on her face and just how re relieved and, and stoked she was. She actually says that was one of the most emotional wins that she's had in a long time. Gosh, you love that when you see pure joy in a competitor's face, when they win a lot, and when you see how much it still means. Uh, Carissa's win in Rio last year, there was no canned answer. It was pure elation. As we watch this, a lot of drive for Carissa Moore. One big section as she greased an aggressive frontside float, really hammering the lip. Lands with authority, needs a 2-8-3 single maneuver. Is that enough to turn this final, Laura? Wow, that's a tough one right there. I mean, she had so much speed. I thought she was maybe going to try go to the air for a second there, but uh, she hit that section. It was really critical. Let's have a look at it here. It almost looked like she could have gone for the air, but look, arms wide open and then comes down in the flats. It was really critical, so much speed, but I'm just not sure if it's going to get up into the threes. What do you think, Ross? I I think it will. Again, I think the scale is set a little bit high in this heat, and so they're going to have to stick to that scale. Um, but, you know, this is a pretty gnarly section. It's got some lip throwing out at her. It's not an easy uh, section to tag. She produced a very clean little float hit there. So if I had to take a guess, she'll get a three or a four somewhere in there. Last score coming through for Carissa Moore. Call him Rostradamus or an incredible <laughs> they do coach okay? as well. 3.83. Carissa does get the change on that single maneuver option. Great call, Ross. Where's Pertamo? Step aside, <laughs> kid. I got this. <laughs> Pertamo Red doing a great job as head judge on the women's side. Head judge Luli Pereira uh, watching the panel upstairs. That was a decision. Even a few fours in there. So they definitely saw that convincingly turning the heat. Yeah, and I think it was just the speed that she went into that turn. It wasn't like she had no speed and just wanted to try to tap that end section. She took, she got as much speed as she could to really slam that. And when you think about Tyler's five point ride, they're, they're really rewarding turns out there today. Strider just drifted by, he always got a great seat. Just told Abe Lerner, hey, get me a little bit closer. <laughs> Be careful what you wish for with Abe. He'll, he'll <laughs> launch right over there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Abe Lerner, what a legendary lifeguard. Runs in the family as his whole family's been protecting tourists, locals, world's best surfers for decades on decades. As we now count down this final, 35 seconds, Carissa single maneuver option made that decision to go and was able to get into the lead. Tyler with priority, she's chasing a 6.01 and she pearls on that final opportunity. Wow. Yeah, it was just a pretty small wave, too. I'm not sure it had potential for the five. So Carissa's going to maybe hop on that sled with Strider. What a moment as we count this one down. And that is just emotion from so much dedication. After losing the title last year in September, Carissa Moore's back to number one in the world and the champion of the Billabong Pro Pipeline. Good final, Tyler. Job. Great job, young lady. Billabong Pro Pipeline champ. I'm so proud of you. This is your first win back since Rio. Must feel good. And back in the leader's jersey. I think so much, Tyler. This one feels extra special because of the way that the season ended last year. And just I've been spending so much time out here at Pipe. And, you know, it's not the pipe that I have been practicing or wishing for, but I'm a pipe is the win at Pipe is a win at Pipe, and I'm so grateful. And you're here at home in front of your fans on the beach. Everybody's so excited. Uh, congratulations. And I just wanted to say you've been charging all, you know, this whole event. So hats off to you. Thank you, Strider. Thanks so much. We're going under. 
That right there, but what a celebratory duck dive for Carissa Moore. And you feel like, what, what does it take to go through a tough loss? How quickly you want to get back out there or maybe take your time because it takes a while for the season to start again and reenact what you might do on tour. And for Carissa to get back in the Yellows jersey, start off this year number one in the world, you can tell that means a lot. That means so much. Wow, I've got goosebumps. Just seeing the emotion from Carissa, you know, that was obviously such a tough, tough loss for her at the WSL finals. And instead of, you know, just taking a really long break, she was just straight back out here at Pipe. I, when I was here in December, I was watching her surf all types of conditions, spent, putting the most time in out here out of everyone. And uh, that must just feel absolutely incredible to start the year this way. Carissa Moore, the champion of the Billabong Pro Pipeline and number one in the world when we come back, the men's final here at Pipeline. Leonardo Fiorovanti at Pipeline, and he's coming out. Ninja Turtle, Leonardo. There's so much history behind this spot, and to make you know my first ever final here, it's a dream come true. And if the ocean wants to give me that rhythm one more time, then, then great. Here we go, Jack Robinson, grabbing rail, pipe barrel, backside, oh. coming out with a spin. Oh. He's a 477. Getting a lot of drive on that first section. He's got the make. Now into the end section. Jack Robinson is in the final at Pipe. Welcome back to Pipeline. The final is on. Leonardo Fioravanti versus Jack Robinson. Here we go. One of these men will end this day as a Pipe champion and number one in the world, Joe Turpel, Megan Abubo, and Ross Williams, two local heroes that traveled around the world together, competing in the title race for a very long time. We're still celebrating an emotional moment for Carissa Moore. I know you've known her for a very long time, and now she's back in yellow and a pipe champion. Yeah, incredible to see. She's gotten second here twice, and to be the pipe champion, Billabong pipe champion, she must be so happy and to start the year off like that, going into sunset. This is going to be a great year for Carissa. How good is this scene, Ross? Love Hodel and her husband Luke on the chair. Uh, I mean, it's just a, a really well-deserved W there for Carissa. That was a tough, tough contest. You know, a lot of tricky conditions, and Carissa's really good at reading that lineup. And, of course, we know she has the talent. Uh, I mean, that probably felt like she ran a marathon just now. She's going to sleep like a little baby tonight. Oh, 100%. What a celebration that will continue throughout this final. 40 minutes on the clock. How much does that change a final when you have that amount of time to look for your top two waves, Megan? I think in the back of your mind, you really want to be patient. You only need those two waves. Uh, patience is a virtue and, you know, definitely don't need to be going on. I mean, searching and hunting for great waves, but patience and, you know, just to keep your calm. Because you're in the final at the Billabong Pipe Pro. 
Here we go. First wave of the final. We've got some action here for Jack Robinson. He's driving through a stretched out tube, still trying to punch free. What an effort. Didn't get out of that barrel, but he can time travel in the bar barrel similarly to John John Florence. Yeah, he's uh, incredible at reading his line in the barrel. Uh, he, he can he can make sense of a really tricky little tube ride and, and find those exits almost better than anyone. So there we go, Jack's first wave. Leo did step on a wave earlier, just a 0.27, so Robinson did take off on that wave with priority. The streak of Jack has just been unbelievable. How quickly he's accumulating wins. He's gunning for a fourth CT win. This is the start of just his third season on tour. Yeah, he's surfing like a true statesman. You know, he really knows uh, how to surf for heat, how to put it together, and it doesn't seem like he's not intimidated by anyone. It reminds you of quick starts to winning from Mark Richards, Tom Curran, Sean Thompson. They got on a roll incredibly quickly when they qualified for the championship tour. And I feel like the biggest thing was the story was kind of almost turning into when is Jack going to qualify? I mean, he's not that old, Ross. He's right. 25. But when you have that talent at 10 and everyone's waiting for your debut, it felt like a long time for his support crew. It, it did. Uh, and to be honest, he had a funk in his career early on from like maybe age 19 to 21 years old, it was kind of looking almost iffy for him. Like, is he going to really rise to the occasion or is he going to disappear? Um, and I feel like the breakthrough event for Jack was uh, during COVID, there was that little off season events, uh, that run of events they had in Australia. And there was an event down there on the Gold Coast where he got second to Ethan, I believe. Uh, and he was ripping and he had really good competitive savvy and he was doing these crazy airs and tail slides and he just looked fast and full of life and I was like, whoa, there's a, a different Jack right there. That was cool, the WSL Countdown Series, bit of a preseason that we all really enjoyed in that time of the world that we really wanted some competitive surfing out there and Jack used his time wisely. And I always wondered how Leo would have been feeling last season. You know, the return of G-Land, there's all this old footage of, you know, Jack, Kanoe, Garashi, and then Leo's back to the Challenger Series. And you go, he, I don't know, it'd be hard not to feel left out. But the way Leo looks, it only fueled his fire to get back on the top 34. Yeah, Joe, he's come back with a vengeance, hasn't he? But he looks happy. I think this year he might give Steph Gilmore a, a run for her happy money. <laughs> yeah, he's... he's every, every interview, he's just happy, he's stoked. That's, that's a good look on him. I feel like there's this edge of authority with Fioravanti about him, this commitment of loyalty to his goals that he has, unflappable, undeniable, doesn't matter if he ruffles a couple of feathers in some heats, he yeah. seems really true to himself. I think that's spot on. Uh, that's what I think of when I think of Leo. He's a little edgy, um, super competitive, maybe a small chip on his shoulder, um, always obviously produces a good post-heat interview. Uh, but that's what fuels him. That's what gets him to win heats. He's really competitive. And that's what makes his heats so entertaining to watch. He's trying to join Jeremy Flores to represent Europe as pipe champions. Jeremy, multiple time pipe champ, kind of stole the, the finish of John's second world title when he had about eight seconds on the clock, went back door. And then he also took one from KP when Kieran was supposed to win. And next thing you know, Jeremy was the one that had the headspace to take the win at the end of that matchup. Big shout out and hello to Jeremy Flores. I know he's uh, known both these guys for a really long time. And so he's probably glued to this final right now, Megan. Yeah, I, you know, back in the old days when they both were riding for Quicksilver, uh, I know, you know, Jeremy being the older one in the group, you know, they used to do a lot of fun camps and stuff together. So spent a lot of time traveling, especially being from Europe. Um, and I think that's kind of what attributes to Leo's, kind of his attitude. Um, there's, they almost have this confidence, Europeans, to me, uh, when you, even when you travel there for the first time, this, this confidence about them, this air, and that, you know, he brings that with him at every stop. Yeah, I agree, Joe. You know, everyone competes different, and I feel like there's some surfers on tour that are just kind of like an artist, and they're really trying to outperform 
their competitor by surfing their best and impressing the judges. And then you get the other uh, surfers on tour who are fighters and they're scrappers and they, they want to get into the emotions of the heat and just score higher points than you. It's about the victory. And so every, there's a lot of different characters on tour. Jack Robinson always looks so calm in his face, but you know, he's what, what a road to the final he's had. There was definitely some scrappy moments in the heat with Gabriel Medina, just cat and mouse moving, trying to get position. And it feels like he doesn't mind entering that style if it comes down to that to start off a big matchup. Leo famous for wanting to own that start on the opening exchange, like he did in this one, but it was a 0.27. But it seems like Jack's really good at switching gears. Yeah, and you know, coming head to head with Gabby, it's, it's not easy. You know, he's really good at doing that. Uh, he's the king, the master at that. And just to try to get into someone's head in the beginning of the heat too, you know, that sometimes can play in your favor. Oh, those tactics are so interesting to listen to. We've heard of people singing songs sometimes in the water. That could throw someone off very quickly. Not sure if any of that happened in the last final, <laughs> but what a celebration it's been for Carissa Moore down on the glass with Dimity Stoyle. Wow, Carissa Moore, I think everyone on the beach's hearts were in their chest. How is your heart? And you are now the Billabong Pro Pipeline Champion in memory of Andy Irons. Tell us how you're feeling right now. Oh my gosh, I'm so happy. I have so many emotions. I mean, just to get to this moment and, you know, it, for, for the women, it's been a few years in the making and having us out at a crazy wave like Pipeline and just trying to spend more time there. It's been such a process. And then, um, you know, after finishing the season, like the way I did last year, it's nice to kind of come away with a win and wipe that slate clean and to, to win in an event that's in honor of Andy Irons. I mean, he's one of my favorite surfers of all time. And um, I always appreciated the time he took for me. When I first was a rookie on tour, he was there and was there for like one of my first wins at Portugal. So um, this is pretty cool. Well, I think the whole beach can feel your emotion right now. We all know how hard you've worked out in this lineup. You've shared finals out here in the past, finishing runner up. How much does this mean to you now to be the champion? Uh, it feels so good. I mean, all the women were surfing really well this week. I mean, we didn't have the most ideal forecast, and I always imagined winning pipe when it was like firing. And um, but you know, a win's a win out of here. Pipe, I'll take it. <laughs> Exactly right. We've all seen your highlight clips from every free surf that you've worked so hard. You're getting barreled off your head out here. So you've definitely deserved this one. So, and now you're in the yellow jersey. How good is that moving into the rest of the season? Oh, I'm really stoked. Like I said before, yellow is my favorite color. But, you know, just looking at the field of women this year, it's going to be such a battle at every event. So um, I'll enjoy it while I can and hopefully I can keep on uh, hold on it. Oh, well, absolutely amazing. The whole Hawaii is so proud. We'll let you celebrate this one, let it sink in. Thanks, Dim. <laughs> Carissa Moore, your Billabong Pro Pipeline champion and number one in the world heading into Sunset Beach. So much meaning in that interview with one of the best ever to do it. And I loved how she just got to remember those special memories with the late three-time world champion Andy Irons, four-time pipe champ as well. He went back to back in two different eras with his pipe titles and Carissa got to overlap with his career as a rookie on tour, making it even more special, Megan. Yeah, Andy's so synonymous with this wave and he, he really uh, had a huge influence on so many surfers uh, throughout Hawaii and he was just always so proud to represent Hawaii all over the world. Uh, he used to travel with friends and family and bring them. I mean, I remember he would bring my cousin with him to, to Australia, my cousin Clay. And, you know, he, he just always loved having a bit of home uh, with him on the road. And I think that all of us, every Hawaiian surfer um, that, you know, Andy has left behind, it, he, a part of him lives in all of us. And it's really special to, you know, you could see it in the emotion when she, she was describing her, her respect towards Andy. Yeah, Andy, you know, when I think of Andy... I think of punk rock. You know, he was a guy that, you know, went through his highs and lows and then he would come back with a vengeance and for him to win world titles. And then as you said, he really loved home. He loved Hawaii. He loved his family and friends. And that's the, the warm side of Andy. But the edgy side of Andy was really fun for sport. Uh, you know, he loved to just kill Kelly uh, and the rest of the crew. He was such a fun, deadly competitor. And, uh, and I think that's why he's a lot of people's favorite surfers because he was punk rock. So cool. And what a legacy for Billabong to pay tribute with their Andy Irons collection, which gives back to local organizations as well. 
Andy, uh, is such a powerful human in the sport of surfing and all over the Hawaiian Islands. Billabong celebrating 50 beautiful years. All started back in 1973. Gordon Merchant, what a legend, had an idea and created one of the best brands in the world. And they've been such a part of a big events for so long, incredible team. And they're setting up for an incredible final this year, the Billabong Pro Pipeline. Jack Robinson, Leonardo Fioravanti, one and a .27, but they've done a lot of work in the first 12 minutes or so, battling for position, trying to stay incredibly focused in a challenging lineup at the moment, Megan. Yeah, it's challenging. There aren't a lot of waves out there, uh, but with 28 minutes to go, we can, it's almost like a fresh heat, you know? Um, it's great going into a final, you're given extra minutes, uh, but each surfer knows you, you only need those two waves, um, keep it calm, collective, and really just hope that some sets come here in the latter part of the heat. It's funny, Joy, there's two different personalities in the water. I, I, just a minute ago, during Chris's interview, I saw Jack standing on his board with his arms in the air, soaking in the breeze like he was in a deodorant commercial. I mean, <laughs> you talk about someone who's out there just kind of freed up. And again, back to that little Margaret River hippie vibe. He's just trying to soak in the environment, you know, and, and will a wave to come his way. Meanwhile, uh, on the opposite side, you have Leo, who's just super sporty. He's out there thinking about the numbers and thinking about to get his heat started. And just two really fun characters out here. I really love that about pro surfing, how you can get such a contrast on how to connect with your best. Both surfers look interested. The one without priority has this wave. The man from WA pulls in, still traveling, and that section just won't let him down. I'm just so impressed with that extra space. In my mind surf with them, I feel like, okay, they're down. What happens after that when it looks like they've run out of air, Megan? Yeah, it looks like there's nowhere to go, and you can still see the blue-colored jersey of, or of Jack just kind of still threading through the barrel. And what is that, that bonus effort that we see often from Jack or John John Ross? What would you think? Yeah, a, a shout out to Kelly Slater, too. Uh, another guy that, you know, it's a mindset, Joe. I think they give themselves that extra percentage that most surfers give up on. Uh, oh, this wave's too fast. It's going to close out, and I'll go ahead and, like, maybe pin drop. Or those guys, they'll go, nah, maybe. And they'll just, they're a little, they're super optimistic in these crazy barrels. Whether it's a 10-foot wave or a 2-foot wave, they give themselves that extra pump, that extra uh, effort to make it out. One of these guys will join at one of the most incredible lists in surfing history. Kelly Slater winning his eighth title at Pipe last season, which was his 56th championship tour win. Out of all of those, he called last year's win the best of his career. And we'll have a brand new champ this year. John John's on there. Michelle Perez, Jeremy Flores. Speaking of WA, quickly Taj Burrow. And then the, the great legends from Jeff Hackman, Jerry Lopez, Jeff Crawford, who came from Florida to win this event. He actually lives down the road. Akalupo, Tommy Carroll, just, just such a dream run of names that can call themselves pipe champions for Jack and Leo. That's what they're fighting for right now. Yeah, they're fighting to be a, a part of history, a part of these iconic legends you just mentioned. Uh, as we, I, I remember watching Tommy Carroll do the snap um, and win that year, you know, and that was one of the most incredible moments I've ever seen in the entire time I've been involved in surfing. I was just a grom, but I'm sure, Ross, you have so many moments like that. And Derek O. Oh. oh, yeah. I mean, there, there are so many. That's what, Joe, we were talking about that earlier in this event. Uh, what makes Pipe and Backdoor, in my opinion, the best event on tour? It just creates so much drama. Uh, even if it's two foot and windy, uh, there's still drama. Somehow it's shallow. Uh, the waves can be 10 feet. You could get the best wave of your life, or you could get right back down to performance. Uh, this, this little piece of reef here is so special. Got the support crew right there for Leonardo Firavanti. His girlfriend, Sophie, right there. And her family and friends. You know, she grew up right on this island and so happy for for leo to call this like a second home nowadays yeah and really to add on to what ross said this is the most natural beautiful captivating arena i think it's sports 
just to be 100 yards or 200 yards from where they're competing in this natural, the natural elements at one of the most beautiful stretches in the world. I mean, you could, you, and it's, you can come down here and watch it for free. It's amazing. It's, it is absolutely amazing. It's definitely a gladiator pit. You know, people get severely hurt here and people come in with uh, uh, stories of the ride of their life. Uh, it's just really exciting. And uh, meanwhile, we got some small scores here. These guys are definitely probably, uh, Joe, I think feeling just a little bit anxious. They want to get the ball rolling. Oh, certainly. You know, 40 minute final. Thank goodness they've got a ton of time because it's been incredibly sleepy now. And Surfline let us know that today would be the day. Next two days don't look great. So trying to max out the best part of this swell. Definitely started off with a lot more activity this morning but fading out through the afternoon. Just gonna test these guys' metal as far as making decisions in a scrappy heat. Jack's got the freedom to kind of take an extra paddle here and there. Remember, with priority, if you show a commitment to a wave, they'll flip that. We saw that a few times in this contest this week. Yeah, we've seen it a few times, and it's that split second that, you know, you're in the heat of the moment, and you decide to go for a wave that maybe just because you had priorities, you, you, you took one extra paddle, and there goes the priority, and the momentum goes in the other person's favor. As we see now, just jumping off the board quickly is Jack Robinson. Sometimes it's just an energy change. Just you've been sitting so long, making sure your wax is all dialed, staying focused. I like watching Kelly when he starts splashing water a little bit. That's kind of a tradition for Kelly. Everybody has their own little fidget tool, like something just to keep their mind off of the nerves that they're trying to avoid. Uh, one quick note, that last wave that Jack had a look at, um, I was looking at it, uh, he passed it up. There was a score on that. He probably could have got a five or a six even on it. It had a nice closeout section over at eight. So sometimes you will get that, even under priority. Um, at back door, you have this envision of like, I'm gonna get a barrel. Uh, but sometimes you gotta lower your standards and just start looking for sections to hit. And now we've got them interested in this ruffled up wave. And Jack, with positioning under priority, is able to stall for maybe a quick tube, not getting it there. Now harder off the bottom, explosive finish for the man from WA. His best so far in the final on that single maneuver option. Yeah, kind of a, uh, to make that decision, you know, right here you can see him take off should I go for a turn? But he actually opts to try to get a little head dip there. Closes out beautifully, but um, not sure. Maybe could have maximized it more, as you can see here, Ross. Yeah, I think if he could have the wave over, obviously hindsight's 2020, but he would have went to two big turns instead of the head dip. Um, but we've seen this all event. We're at the Pipe Pro, and barrel is king. So you, know, you can't blame these guys for looking for barrels. But it, you know the waves are getting smaller right now, uh, and you got to get a score somehow. And so they might switch gears to look for big turns. Jack wants to bring a pipe trophy back to WA. We mentioned Taj, but maybe the most dramatic finish to a pipe final, Jake the Snake Patterson in the late 90s. Bruce Irons was already being chaired up the beach. There was still some time on the clock and Jake packed one a back door and everything changed. Probably one of the most dramatic finishes in surfing history at this event. Yeah, that was crazy. That That's one that everyone talks about. And uh, you know, uh, you just gotta be careful. You can't count your chickens before they hatch. I, I wonder how many less than a minute to go finishes where the situation changed. If we ever actually got statistics on that out here at Pipeline. I mean, it's gotta be the number one spot in the world where situation changes in the last minute. Yeah, we talked about all those dramatic moments where we've seen guys break combination in a minute 30 when it's pumping out here and get on a roll. It provides that drama on, on big swells that makes it so exciting. We mentioned Jeremy's earlier with eight seconds going back door to beat John. That makes it so exciting. And the crazy part about bringing that up, it seems like Jack does that on repeat, on demand. He did that on finals at G-Land twice and over Medina and Toledo. <laughs> He's got that magic, doesn't he? Um, and, and it was a smaller event, but I think John John did it to Jamie O'Brien too out here at Pipe. He actually shook Jamie's hand uh, and said, "Yeah, good heat." And then he swung it on a on an insider and got the score he needed. I still rewatch that final sometimes. <laughs> that was unbelievable. He got that ten at Gums. As we watch 
Fioravanti now after a serious lull, missing the barrel opportunity. He'll have to settle for one turn as well. The single turn for Jack was a 3.17. And now Robinson up again. This time he's driving through that hollow section. Robinson's hoping to make it free and something got a hold of the Australian. And now they're neck and neck. This is going to be an interesting one to see the fitness and who wants priority. They're both going to put their head down and go for it. Priority judge Ian Ratso Buchanan will decide who gets to that takeoff zone first and start the priority rotation once again. Let's see, Jack's got the edge, but he did just catch the last wave. Leo on the first wave. Sometimes if it's really close in a paddle battle, they'll just keep the rotation clean. But if someone really gets distance and they caught the last wave, they can get it back just like Jack did. This was Leo's last wave, Megan. Yeah, he was looking for the barrel on that. Not not a lot to offer there, but as Ross mentioned, you know, it's the pipe, the pipe pro. And there we see Jack. Oh, you almost thought he was going to come out of that, right? I was definitely holding my breath. Uh, you just never count these guys out. But this messy northeast trade winds, a lot of these barrels, especially now that there's a lot less energy in the water, they're not really pitching out. They're a little crumbly and mushy, and it's really hard to break through. Leo Fioravanti didn't win the paddle battle. As he's waiting for his last turn to be scored, he now has a bit of freedom to look a little bit without having first priority. Leo got past Jordy Smith this morning. That was the first heat of the day. That was a bit of payback for Leo because he had a severe combo. Not in his favor at Jay Bay when Jordy had a perfect heat against him. So that was a great way to answer back. But Leo's had some drama at Pipe. Broken back in competition. He had to surf for a spot on tour against Mikey Wright. Right. As this final is... Just starting to heat up, numbers slowly building. Jack's still out in front with a 3-1-7 over Leo's 2-6-7. We'll finish the final at the Billabong Pro Fight right after this. You're watching the final of the Billabong Pro Pipeline. This is Firavanti fired up, punches out the first section. Vert climb on the second effort. Third turn, nice little finish for Firavanti, who caught that wave during the break. Had the 267 for one turn, now a 4.0 for three big moves down the line. Joe Trapel with Megan Abubo and Ross Williams for the call here in the final. Smart move for Leo. Looked real spicy, as you guys would say, on those 
three different types of turns. Megan, what'd you think? Yeah, he's like a bottled sauce of Tabasco right now. <laughs> he looks quick, real quick uh, off the top. I think this is kind of part of that, the time in that heat when they're starting to adjust now, like, okay, what's gonna, how am I gonna win this final? Uh, and he's looking like he's making those turns happen. So cool. These guys have been in so many heats, so many different types of conditions, and even together in free surfs, it's basically a heat, but no one's counting the score. Uh, smart decision for Leo. He has actually taken the lead with that, Ross. Yeah, and it'll be interesting for him to uh, digest that score because he did three turns uh, in a typical event, like say at a beach break somewhere, you'd think that'd be more like a 6-5 or something like that, but the judges letting them know Hey, you never know. A four-foot set could come through, and someone could get really barreled. So they're reserving those those big points for a tube ride. It's interesting too, and I think that becomes the challenging part at pipe. It's like still the barrels have been scoring all day, but what if there aren't any left in the right. final? And we've had a lot of events finish that way, Megan. Yeah, you have to be prepared for anything, and even midway through a, the finals, the conditions can change. As we can see on screen, the wind kicked up. Like, I want to say 10 miles yeah. uh, once in the start of this final. So that's another factor that they're, work, they're dealing with out in the lineup. Yeah, Joe, it's nerve wracking. When, when the, the scale is being reserved for barrels and you just, you're, both of these guys are aware that there, there might be one out there during this, this final. And it's just like throwing the dice, hoping that you have priority when that wave comes through here. So um, it's just a, a really nerve wracking way to compete. It's that X factor of pipe. That scale is definitely compressed, so it gets a little bit closer than maybe it feels, and just waiting to see if the ocean will light up for a big tube. And the next 12 minutes, head judge Pertamo Arendt has a great panel upstairs. Lily Pereira, Ben Lowe, Ian Ratso Buchanan, Luis Dantas, Mikel Zalakane, Liz Hauser, Mikey Kalani, and Milo Murgia upstairs watching the action of the best surfers in the world. Great representation from the surfing world as well. All great surfers watching the next 11 and a half minutes. Jack with priority. He needs a 3.51 in this shredded lineup. Well, they're getting some uh, salt water in their face right now. It is mustery out there. And just, this is when it counts when you put in time, no matter if it's pumping or not, right, Ross? Yeah, I, I was just going to say, Joe, no no real advantage in this heat right now. There's no, I, I don't really feel like a storyline yet. It's just anything could happen here in the last 11. Well, Jack's going to use priority. Nice skip and a step off the bottom. Nice healthy look at top turn and rock and roll hack off the top. Nice speed that he gathered throughout those two big moves and pulling in Fioravanti, trying to really utilize the criteria here, and he'll kick out. Paddle battle already starting for Fioravanti, and that's why he wanted to get out of that wave quickly. And still going to be paddling until the priority judge says they can cool off. Remember, Jack won the last paddle battle to regain priority when he had the most recent way, but this one's a little bit closer on their positioning right now. Yeah, watching this show brings me back to the days of when there used to be a priority buoy. <laughs> you know, like, you remember those days, Ross? Oh, yeah. And they we saw a lot of races like this back then. They should bring that back for the event at Huntington. I think it is <laughs> pretty crazy. I thought you got punched in the face once. I'm kind of glad we moved on. I did. Luke Egan punched me right in the back oh. of the head once. <laughs> oh. was, but I beat him, so I was like, I was okay with it. <laughs> <laughs> and the judges yeah. can't see because you're behind the buoy when it's happening, right? <laughs> wow. Wild times in pro surfing. Leo Fioravanti does get priority, and he had to earn every bit of that because he had the most recent wave. And that's all that fitness. He posts a lot. He posts a lot of workouts on his social media. He really fell in love with that training on his recovery from serious injuries. We mentioned the back injury, which was severe, but then he had a reoccurring shoulder injury that really affected him. He actually had finally requalified because he'd fallen off, dislocated his shoulder in a heat at Newcastle, and then it popped back out, warming up at the box, a slabbing wave. And that's when Jordy ended up getting a walkthrough. 
You know, Joe, I just wanted to bring up, uh, he sacrificed a little closeout section there for priority. And we're going to have to pay attention to scores here because we have a grindy heat here uh, and a backup score could really matter. So he's trying to, you know, approve upon a four. So let's pay attention to that last score because he definitely could have added a point on a closeout turn. Great call. Last for Jack, 6.0 on two big turns. And now we'll feel how they react to the barrel of Leonardo Fioravanti. So he had the barrel. He had an opportunity to hit the close at it off the wall. It wasn't a beautiful section, but it was a section. Uh, so it's going to put a little bit of a um, focus here on this support. 3.47 for the barrel of Leonardo Fioravanti. And now needs a 5.18. And I feel like in a day, on a day like today, it's, it's not a bad thing to have second priority because you know, there's a tons of, you know, there's small waves coming through. You can kind of scour the lineup a little bit more. Uh, Jack's sitting on a six. As we check out the replay, two big turns here, Megan. Yeah, starts it off nice off the lip there. I, I love the way he read that wave. He really timed that last, last section well. Right here, nice carve. And then he's just gaining momentum. I think, you know, last second he decides, I'm just going to float this thing. And beautiful. I, I really like how he put together that wave. Both basic turns, but he had a lot of flow and speed through that. So good credit to Marcio for another good looking board under Jack's feet. And again, so that's where he kicked out. He could have tic tac across that channel and slammed the closeout section. Maybe even went for like kind of a layback snap. And you never know. He could have turned that 3.5 into a 5. And now he'd only require a 4.18 instead of a 5.18. So sometimes being too tactical can can bite you so we'll have to pay attention to that good Great call there ross good observation ross and sometimes it's almost even some of your ego too that gets in the way like oh, I, I can't lose this priority right um on a day like today so you never know as ross said i mean it, it's so close it's yeah. I, I mean i'm speculating right who knows that the section might have been really bad but it, it did close out at off ball he could have got another snap in but they are scoring you know two turns they are scoring that barrel to turn combo pretty well and they are awarding points at that end section if you um, get a good turn in there. If I remember correctly in the final with Taj and Kelly it was a small day it ended up being pretty small a lot of turns being scored but then Kelly got a small tight barrel finished runner up in that final and I believe Kelly was like brought that up hey isn't it pipe you know I got barreled and that was his argument in that final to see and, uh, what, what were they scoring that day. But I feel like that conversation happens all the time at Pipe and Backdoor when it gets to this size. For Leo, for him, he's like, I'm gonna surf to the criteria, maybe get barreled here. But again, it's gotta be a solid one, a clean entry into the pit and have a critical section there to, to really create some separation. I mean, it is grindy out there. You gotta find, uh, give the, the judges a reason to give you a score. Uh, and so turns are 100% a factor today. Uh, and, and he already did the hard work with getting that little barrel. So I just, you know, I'm sure if he would have had that wave over, he would have finished it off. But we'll see. This heat's not over. Five and a half minutes till we have our pipe champions. Carissa Mora taking her first pipe trophy. Three straight final appearances and getting a win after over her longtime rival and Tyler Wright. That was their 11th final completed. And I believe the most in surfing history with two meeting up in CT finals over all these years. And now it's up to the men. Jack and Leo have five minutes priorities with the Italian. He would be the first Italian to win this event. This is his first chance in a CT final at anywhere around the world to win. The support crew there. For Jack Robinson. But a lot of these homes as well just invite a lot of friends and family and local people to get a good spot to enjoy all the action at this event. Yeah, Jack desperately looking around trying to get rid of that 3.17. So really uh, kind of an awkward final here in terms of scores. You know, these premium scores are gone. They're really going to have to be uh, crafty out there and just look for those fours and fives. We're down to four minutes on the clock. Let's recap how the last 36 minutes really went as far as highlights are concerned. Jack Robinson staying active, counting a 3.17.
and a 6.0 that has him sitting out in front. Really picking his points well. His turns look really solid. This one went for the barrel and probably a mistake in hindsight, but did crush that finishing move. His turns are looking like magic today. And then Leo on the other side is peaked at a 4.0 as his high mark, Megan. Yeah, you know, he's looking really good too on these on his turns out here. Um, put together a nice wave there with a few good, great uh, turns. Uh, and right now sitting with priority. Yeah, so just the difference right now is that six for Jack, a little bit bigger wave, bigger section. And now we've got live action, 3.15 on the clock, leading the final, Jack Robinson, big vertical whip. There's the blow tail, can he hang on? And he ends up losing that final maneuver. First turn was really fast and quick. I feel like he knew he didn't have the same wave size or critical sections he did on his 6.0. That is a huge break for Leo. Uh, that doesn't happen often. Jack is super consistent. Again, you know, he's got that nice athletic boxy stance. He doesn't fall very often. So just pushing a little too hard on that tail side, that leaves the door open for Leo. One more look here, Megan. Yeah, he, he takes off nice off the lip there. And then right here, he just almost like, looks like he gets a little bit, you can see it in the slower. There he goes off the lip right here. Again, he's, he's looking down the line. You can see it, he's setting up, but this is that tricky section where he just kind of blows the tail out and almost kind of loses balance. It looks like his his balance, his weight distribution was a little off on that turn. I mean, Joe, he makes that, that, that looked like a five, you know, and, and we're looking at a huge difference in the score needed. So uh, that door still cracked open for Leonardo. Leonardo needs a 5.18, last score for Jack, a throwaway. Leo has priority. Uh, this is the moment he's been dreaming of his whole life to be in a pipe final with priority, with a chance to hold the most coveted trophy in a single event win in the game. You, you can't help but wonder, like, with that wave, do nerves sometimes play an in factor, um, an over adrenaline? You know, there's so many things at the end of the heat in a final that could play, come to play, you know, with maybe him falling off on that one. Definitely, especially in a bit of a wave star feed. I mean, they had 40 minutes, and look at the numbers. It's not even in double digits for their combined totals that haven't really felt at ease in this final at any stage of the game. Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a funny final. The waves are really tricky, and they're sharing some little mistakes here and there. Leo probably should have finished that one little barrel ride. Would have been a different score. Uh, you know, Jack left the door open with that last uh, fall there. So here we go. Buzzer beater, possible. Jack Robinson trying to get a fourth championship tour win, which would be unbelievable if he could get there that fast. We mentioned Sean Thompson, Mark Richards, Tom Curran, how quickly that they were just dominating the tour and winning events. Last chance. 25 seconds. Ross, anything on the horizon? He's going. No, nope, he's going to let it go. So under priorities, Jack Robinson. Can he better a 3-1-7 on this wave? Big bottom turn, aggressive snap to start. Median section lays back into it, but he can't hang on. About inches of water over that shallow reef. Three, two, one. Leo can't get into it, and it's all over. Jack Robinson is your champion of the Billabong Pro Pipeline and your new world number one. Jack has to check his board one more time. Remember, he had to make some board changes today, landing on the reef. That was a For Leo Fioravanti, a tough one there to go down. He let out some frustration, having priority, and just didn't get the wave he was waiting for all the way and let the clock run out as he finishes number two in the contest, Ross. Be a nice handshake here, I predict. And that was a wry smile from Jack. He knows that that was kind of a funny final and uh, they had to grind it out, but it's a victory nonetheless. He's gonna be psyched. Yeah, I love how he threw the shaka to the beach. <laughs> just, you know, Jack just loves being here. And the Hawaiian people, they love him. 
I'm sure all the security guards are stoked that Volcom House is going crazy next door. And Jack Robinson puts his name on one of the most prestigious lists you could ever think of in this last couple of years. John John Florence, 2021 pipe champ. Kelly Slater winning his eighth last year. And now Jack Robinson on that list in world number one. And now four championship tour events in a very short time, picking up wins. Heading into Sunset, where he's had a lot of success in the past. Yeah. Look out, world. Jack's on fire. That was where he qualified. I remember announcing that event. He uh, When he broke through and made it on the CT, he won that event that year at the end of the year at Sunset. Dominated, too. Uh, and he kind of told everyone, too. It was almost kind of awkward. He's like, yeah, watch out. I'm here. Because we're used to a shy Jack, but he, he found his confidence at Sunset Beach. There's the celebratory wave for Jack Robinson officially. Your Billabong Pro Pipe Champ. A job well done. And think about his road to this final and then win. Having a heat with Florence, which was highly anticipated. It was so great to watch. Also, having a heat with Gabriel Medina, which was unbelievable because Gabe was red hot after his heat in the round of 32. And there's that moment that Ross has been identifying, that soulful <laughs> connection that Jack Robinson brings to the championship tour. It's a testament to the depth of his talent because we would expect him to win if it's eight foot pipe. You know, that's where he really shines. But this is, you know, competitive, tough conditions and Jack's still got it done. So you talk about a world title contender. This guy can get it done in all conditions. Yeah, he's so well-rounded, Ross. Uh, and then going into Sunset, he's got to be on everyone's fantasy choice at Sunset. He's he's amazing in open face wall. And as you said, Joe, he knows how to win out there. I think it's a big topic you bring up of learning how to adapt to the conditions on tour and having the will to win. There's old interviews you read of Jack when he was a Grom on the QS, and he was being influenced by the others saying, ah, oh, it's not that good out there. Right. Don't you want to be on a surf trip? And he kind of was able to go, actually, no, I do want to be here. And he honestly took that on with uh, such great commitment. Yeah, he's really competitive and he has a good spirit. I stayed with him uh, and his wife at Bell's last year and there were some, a lot of lay days and we were just playing games and throwing dice uh, on lay days. And he, he's doing that, that breath work in between rolls. I mean, this is a kid that wants to win Yahtzee, let alone the Pipe Pro. He's, he's, he is really fun to be with. Is that a true story, Ron? True story. <laughs> <laughs> Taking those, that breath work, whether that at Wim Hof, in between Yahtzee rolls. This kid's competitive. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> you've been with the best and the most competitive Ross in your career. Uh, yeah, to see the generation, the next generation living true to being competitive surfer in the water and out. Uh, his growth has been such a pleasure to watch. I think that's Kaimana Henry right there, yelling the loudest. <laughs> that's right, just such a fixture in these waters. Looking after everyone in the crew that stays at the house. Also, Ty Van Dyke on the chair. Ty Kaimana, originally from the island of Maui, spending so much time here on the North Shore and looking after so many surfers, not just from Hawaii, but international athletes like Jack Robinson. And I'd say that's a fairly easy chair for those guys. They're, they're pretty strong. They eat a lot of poi. <laughs> <laughs> they eat a lot of poi. Uh, good for Jack. Well deserved. You know, he's he's such a, a professional. You know, he's spent a lot of time training off season, and it's showing. Quickly came back from an injury too. I mean, he got hurt not that long ago. Bounced back. It's like an appendix, right? Injury and a kind of an emergency rush to the hospital. That's right, that was not too long ago. He's always felt like he has a special connection with the place, well respected by the local community here because he always gives respect to the lineup, to the locals. 
Yeah, good point, Joe. And he spends a lot of time, more than most tour surfers. He'll spend months here uh, and basically live in Hawaii for several years now. So this feels like a second home to Jack. You look at the last handful of starts out here as well. And didn't have like a ton of great results. He'd never been in a quarterfinal at the CT level. And this year it all changed. He just fueling off what he did last season to get back get through probably the toughest side of the draw with all those pipe trophies he had to get through. And now he's got one of his own. Yeah, he's just been in the zone for a little while now, hasn't he? And just to start his year off like, like he has in this fashion, he's gonna be deadly for the rest of the year. Let's hear from Jack with Dimity. Oh, we are here with the 2023 Billabong Pipe Pro in memory of Andy Irons champion, Jack. How huge is this moment for you? Uh, it's so special. I, uh, I dreamed of this for a long time and um, Andy is one of my favorite surfers ever, um, along with a lot of other greats and uh, yeah, just an honor, I don't know, just to to feel everything and feel all the emotions at the start of the year, you, you know, you don't know how everything's, uh, you know, how you're going to come back and um, yeah, I was feeling good but you never know with, with this beast, you know, with her, so yeah, it's uh, what a way to start it. Well, you've always been one of the favourites out here in this lineup, and this week Mother Nature was so challenging, but you managed to dominate in all conditions, barrels, turns. You had such a tough road to get to this point. Does that make that feel even more special? Yeah, uh, for sure. I mean, I'm just so grateful, you know. That's, that's one of the biggest things. Every time I was paddling out there, this wave's hurt me. This wave's given me a lot of good things too, and um, I'm just super grateful to be in one piece and, you know, be in the moment. and be able to do it so um yeah so much fun and you had a little taste of you know the final five last year and you've been working so hard on the off season you're now in the yellow jersey starting the year does that feel even better yeah it's going to be a long road and um yeah i'm just getting the legs ready to run that road so um <laughs> we're going to try and go all the way and uh yeah one by one well, that Volcom house is going absolutely wild next door, so I'll Volcom let you house celebrate. Is going to go in the, water tonight. <laughs> the thing's going to be gone in the pipeline. If we get too many people on top, we're going to, things are going to fall over. But, well, enjoy uh, that celebration, Jack. You deserve it. Thank you. I appreciate it. And uh, everyone that was a part of the event, it was uh, yeah, a yeah, special one. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dimity. Jack Robinson just taking in all the emotions of a lifetime dedication to be standing where he is now as a Billabong Pro Pipeline Champion. Stand by for the awards presentation and the 805 Post Show coming up next.
It's the 805 post show from the North Shore of Oahu, the Billabong Pro Pipeline CT1, the first stop on the championship tour. And we have started that road uh, to the final five, Kaipo along with Laura Enever, as well as Ross Williams. There's a lot to unpack today um, in action. I'm going to start with you, Laura, and uh, your thoughts of what we just saw with Jack Robinson. Wow, what a, uh, a final. It was down to the uh, dying moments. Anything could have happened, and that's what kept it so exciting. You know, challenging conditions there. That wind picked up, but uh, seeing those boys attack those waves, it was a good good job. Yeah. The challenge of today, Ross? Yeah, uh, you know, it just was ever-changing. Uh, we saw some you know, good size this morning and some barrels, and then it slowly but surely dropped a little bit. So it was whoever could sort of bend with those conditions and uh, Jack was standing at the end. He's, he's so versatile. We know how good he is when the waves are pumping, but he can get the job done when it's grindy too. Yeah, well, let's take a look at our bracket into finals day for the men and the road uh, for Jack Robinson. We start off with a stacked field in some challenging conditions, Laura, but hey, you know, the cream rises to the top. Yeah, all day has just been so exciting from the quarterfinals. Like Ross said, we've had barrels, we've had everything, but seeing Jack, look at him, so focused. This heat with him and John was absolutely bonkers. They went back to back, barrel for barrel, turn for turn, and uh, just the fight back from Jack. You know, he's looks like John had it all, you know, wrapped up. He had the rhythm at the start of the heat, and then Jack turned this heat with three minutes to go. Unbelievable finding these waves all over the reef and uh, just hanging on there for dear life. He's so strong. You can tell he's done the work. Oh, Benny's given him a lot of leg massages. Yeah, the road to the final for Jack Robinson started with John John Florence, Ross, and then a inform. Joao Shianka was going to be the next challenger for Jack Robinson in the semifinal. Yeah. Definitely a really difficult road for Jack to get through John and then Joao uh, and then eventually Leo. Uh, I mean, he's going to feel really good about this victory. Those are tough competitors. Uh, but Jack is scrappy. Uh, you know, he, he's got such good positive energy. He seemed to be open to it throughout the entire, entire event, and it really helped him. And let's not forget, Jack also got past Gabriel Medina in the round before, so what a road. Jack was able to share a final with his childhood friend, Leo Ferravanti. The two have known each other since they were just tights, since 12 years old. Now they found themselves on the top of the peak in the CT final, and Jack continued making smart decisions, Laura. For sure. I mean, I still remember the days when they both had their little bowl cuts coming to the uh, all the contests when they were 12 years old, and to see these two match up in such an important but incredible final. Both of them wanting to have the title of the Bilbon Pro Pipe champion. But Jack Robinson was just too good. Like you said, Ross, too versatile. Leo, what a run he had. He seemed unstoppable in form. And it was anyone's game. Leo's first CT final, so the Italian is starting off strong for the 2023 championship tour. But we are celebrating a title, a champion, a pipe champion in the way of Jack Robinson. Well, Laura, you mentioned their bowl cuts. Uh, <laughs> Jack was unbeatable. He had the best bowl cut in he the history did. of surfing. So if that was an indication, of course he uh, beat Leo. Yeah, there's the numbers. I got another great stat for you guys. It's 24 for four. Jack Robinson has surfed 24 CT events. He has now four CT wins. That is the quickest ascent to four CT wins of anyone on tour and the fourth highest of all time. Tom Curran being the top, Sean Thompson, Mark Ridges, and now Jack Robinson. Wow. And so it's a pretty impressive number that Jack put up. And if you notice, the three guys of all time ahead of him were all world champs. So is that the future for Jack Robinson? I mean, it's really good signs for him. And, and he did turn it around. We were talking about it during the final. Um, he was not, he was almost known for being kind of inconsistent and more of a free surfer uh, just a short while ago. And then he found that passion for winning. He found out how to appreciate the grindy conditions and how to get those Ws. His small wave surfing has really improved too in the last few years. And uh, look out for him. He definitely could win a world title. Like you said, he feels like Jack Robinson has been around forever, but this is only his third year on tour. And to be where he is now, Four wins, it is telling signs that he's here to stay for a while. Oh, yeah, he's here to stay. Let's make it official, and I'm going to throw it down to Joe Turpel for the awards presentation. Take it away, Joe. 
Thank you so much, Kaipo, and thanks everybody here. Give yourselves a round of your applause, a part of surfing history today. You guys are the best fans in the world. Thank you so much. What a way to kick off the season of the 2023 World Surf League Championship Tour here at the Billabong Pro Pipeline in loving memory of Andy Irons. This event is so special, our favorite to kick off the year in the title showdown and the performances were unbelievable. Let's give it up for all the women out there that have been creating history now for multiple years at Pipeline, crowning new champions once again. So special seeing those performances lift each and every year. A lot on the line this year in 2023 is this event at Pipeline is the first opportunity of the season for the surfers receiving CT ranking points, which will also determine who will qualify for the 2024 Paris Olympics. How cool is that? Well, often we're going to be following that road all season long and keep you posted on the qualifications. Uh, you, fans are great. The community is great. The locals who love this wave, thank you so much for watching the world's best compete on your favorite wave in the world. We are so grateful as well to be kicking off the tour right here in Hawaii, the birthplace of Heinalu as a cultural practice and a competitive sport. We'd like to mahalo first and foremost Kanakta Maoli as well as Kama Aina, who for generations embodied true aloha in sharing and perpetuating surfing while stewarding these oceans and coastlines for everyone to enjoy. Mahalo to Hawaii, the North Shore community, and to all those who have come before us here today, bringing us together through surfing. Thank you so much. A lot of special people to thank. I want to start with Pastor Dennis Salas. Thank you so much. The Irons Ohana, Lindy and Axel up here on stage. The Moniz Ohana, the Chandler Ohana, the DeSoto Ohana for hosting a beautiful opening ceremony. We can't thank you guys enough. That was incredible. Of course, we'd also like to thank the city and county of Honolulu, state of Hawaii, the North Shore community, and the com committed pipe local contingent for sharing every day with us down here on the beach. All of our partners that make this so special, celebrating 50 years. Big thanks to Billabong, the Hawaiian Islands, Red Bull, Shiseido, Yeti, Craft 1861, Pacifico, Apple, Surfline, 805 Beer, Sambazon, Turtle Bay, Spectrum Hawaii, Mananalu, True Surf, and Surf Shark. Put our hands together for all of our supporters at this amazing event. Also, the Hawaii Tourism Authority at home in the Hawaiian Islands, Lulu's Lay and Bouquets for the beautiful lay you're going to see on all of our finalists, and Jesse Miley Dyer and the Irons Ohana as well. Thank you so much. These trophies are very, very special. Kelly's got eight of them. That's amazing. The winners are going to receive, yep, the Jerry Lopez 7-0 Lightning Bolt Pipeliner, shaped by Jerry himself. A legend of pipe, but a master in the shaping room as well. And the artwork, it's a tra tradition done by Phil Roberts from Florida. And also our runner-up will receive a painting done by Phil Roberts as well. Thanks, Jerry. Thanks, Phil, once again, to make that so special. Up here on stage with me, someone that works tirelessly for the World Tour. World Junior Champ, longtime competitor, a chief of sport, Jesse Miley Dyer. Let's hear it for Jess. Thank you for all you do for surfing, kicking off another fantastic year. Let's hear it for Lindy Irons once again. Always sharing the aloha spirit with all of us. Axel Irons as well. You've grown up on this stage, my friend. Can't wait to get some waves with you. Now let's get to some trophies. I'd like to introduce a man that puts in more work than I don't know about anybody in the world that's been through so much adversity, up and downs, falling off tour, coming back, injuries, and he always comes back better. Your runner-up in the Billabong Pro Pipeline from Rome, Italy, Leonardo Firavanti. This guy blitzed the Challenger Series last year. I feel like that name just suits it so well. Challenger, and he dominated that role. He's been put there so many times, but he's back and better than ever. To feature in his first CT final of his career. And here's your beautiful painting. Hold that up quickly. Phil Roberts on the artwork there. 
Wow, what a special day for you. I know how hard you work. Your heats are so entertaining to watch. You seem like you've got a command of your career right now. How good does it feel to be standing on this stage looking at Pipeline? I mean, this is a dream come true, honestly. I mean, I've grown up watching every single you know, event here since I was 10 years old and you know, watching the guys get on the podium. And just to be here on the podium, you know, I know Lindy's here, and just to have, you know, a trophy that has Andy's name to it as well, which he was one of the greatest here, um, means so much. And also, you know, having my girlfriend, her family, which is my family, and everybody supporting me today was very, very special. So, great day. Thinking about this wave as well, tough injuries, the back injury we talk about all the time to where you're standing today, that has to be extra special as well, how far you've come. For sure, this wave has, you know, put me in the hospital for about six months <laughs> when I broke my back when I was 17 years old, and, but it's also given me so much, and this is just one more thing. Um, so thank you, Pipeline, thank you to all the locals that let us surf it all the year. Uh, you know, Hawaii is a special place for surfing, and I'm grateful to be uh, on the podium at such a special event. Opening round heat, John, Gabriel, elimination round, look where you're standing now. <laughs> You've got to be proud of yourself. Yeah, that heat was, uh, was a dream come true heat as well. Uh, I didn't put the performance I wanted, but yeah, like you said, I'm on the podium now, and that, that means more than that heat, that's for sure. <laughs> Leo, you're number two in the world. Best of luck, best of waves right here at Sunset Beach. Thank you. Woo. What a legend. I'd like to introduce a very special human that repeats success around the world, but specifically a pipe and backdoor. Let's introduce a two-time champ, runner-up this year in the Billabong Pipe Pro, Tyler Wright. <laughs> Tyler Wright, back-to-back -back titles in 16 and 17. Good job. Got a nice little lay for you and a beautiful painting done by Phil Roberts. <laughs> Tyler and Carissa have given us so much entertainment. You want to hold that up real quick? Beautiful, isn't it? There's something really special about watching you surf. I mean, we watch you for a long time. You know, you've had so many great joys on tour from your Bells win, your world titles, but something feels refreshed in just watching you ride a wave again. Can you tell us about what we're seeing? Um, honestly, we had a really nice off season. Um, a lot of work went into performance and a lot of work went into building my body back. I put on some weight. Um, and I've been working with uh, Andy King and Jason Patchwell from Surfing Australia. They've been amazing for me and really put a lot into my mentality of how I wanted to approach a year and what was really important for me. And um, I couldn't be prouder of, uh, of this event, actually. I'm really happy and, uh, yeah, it's a really enjoyable process for me. Um, so I want to say thanks to those guys and also uh, Kakoa Bacalso, um Bam. He's like... Um, He's been in my corner the whole time. He's literally taught me from knowing zero out here to what I know now. So uh, I really appreciate Bam and everything he does for us kids in the house and um, his energy and his support as well. The results don't lie, especially the vision that you've put in a backdoor and pipe over the last few years. The surprise role and the continuation event from the Maui Pro to winning the event here, semi-final last year, runner-up this year. That's an unbelievable track record at a really new wave on tour. That must feel amazing to see that relationship that you have with this place. Yeah, the relationship's building, you know. I think I said it last year, you know, give the women an opportunity out here and we will build. We'll have pipe masters. We will have a whole tour that is um, so well equipped to take on this wave. We've just never been given an opportunity until 2019 and Jessie's really made a huge effort to get the women here and I cannot thank her enough for seeing the vision of knowing that the women deserve to be at Pipe, you know, and, and you can see that how much more comfortable we've gotten just in essentially 12 months of knowing that this wave's on tour permanently for us now and I think that's massive, um, massive shout out to the WSL for, for putting that effort in and seeing that and seeing how women's surfing can grow and, and build and um, yeah, you'll, well now you guys got Pipe Masters, so sweet. Tyler, you're number two in the world, another stellar performance. Best of luck from here on out. Thank you so much, really appreciate it. One more time for Tyler Wright, a two-time world champ, runner-up.
in the Billabong Pro Pipeline. I'll just trade places with you. And now let's uh, put our hands together for this man all the way from WA, Western Australia. Already four CT wins in a very short period of time. And now he's got the big pipe trophy. Your champion of the Billabong Pro Pipeline, Jack Robinson. destiny for Jack to be up here one day, but he always talks about this wave with humility, with respect. Lost in the round of 32 last year to Joao Chianca. Had a few early losses before making the final series. That surfboard is shaped by Jerry Lopez himself in the artwork by Phil Roberts. You gonna ride that thing? I think he would like me to ride it, huh? Maybe. Huh? I think that's uh, one of the most special feelings. What is it like to actually have it in your hands? It's kind of interesting because I was thinking about ordering a board from him like for a long time, like the last month or two. So it's kind of interesting how things work, huh? Wow. <laughs> Big on visualization. I really like that. And uh, see this role of winning, Jack. Uh, we've seen you in real time competing for a world title, but kind of forget all that for the moment. This is Pipeline. This is the one that stands alone, and you finally did it. Yeah, uh, it's a long time in the making, but you know, I feel like it's not just the wave, it's the people too. Uncle Kimo, his whole crew, everybody, everybody that watched me grow up. It's an honor, man, seriously. Come here for so long, maybe 15 years, long, I can't remember, but have so many friends here, and just the people who support me, the good mind and the good energy. Man, no words for this just respect. When we saw your road to the final, it was unbelievable. Yeah, you can, you can let it go. Let's hear it for Jack. Your road was unbelievable. I mean, we were picking your highlighted moments from where we sit. What about yours from getting another great matchup with Gabriel Medina along the way to, to John John Florence, to Leo Fioravanti, a guy you literally grew up with around the world as childhood superstars. And, where does it start for you as far as highlights go? This is the biggest, biggest highlight for now. Yeah, and, uh, but they're all good, you know what I mean? Like even the first win, it's just, they're all so special. It's, you don't even really have any words for it. It's just, especially here though, the support, everyone that's here, my whole team, Leandro, Bemi, <laughs> it's, it's Julia, my mom's here, everybody's here. Um, this one's the most special, I think, yeah. We're going to turn this jersey into yellow before you get to sunset. Number one in the world. <laughs> Heading into a wave that you love so dearly and you've had a lot of success. That has to feel incredible. Yeah, it's cool. Um, you know, I'm just super grateful and, yeah, start here in Hawaii. Uh, yeah, hopefully we get some good waves for that one. But it's, it's a long road ahead and, um, you know, I'm just getting myself ready to run that road. So, yeah, it was... Uh, a low one last year, but a lot of learning too, you know, like you finish the end of the year like at a low point, but you're also, you learned a lot, you know, so there's just no price on that and uh, experience, you know, so just working my way. Well said, Jack. Well served. Enjoy your moment. Have some fun tonight. We'll do it. Maybe the Volcom house is going to fall down. We're going to be too many people up there. <laughs> Jack Robinson, your champion of the Billabong Pro Pipeline and number one in the world. Wow, keep the celebrations pumping. We've got a very special human being representing this island, Oahu, a native Hawaiian, number one in the world once again. Let's hear it for your champion of the Billabong Pro Pipeline, Carissa Moore. <laughs> Jerry Lopez was shaping all of his boards back when he was ruling this wave at Pipeline back in the 70s and winning his pipe titles. Have you had one of these yet? 
I, I feel very fortunate. We actually had these um, beautiful boards made for our Maui contest, but this is the first one that says Pipe Pro, Billabong Pipe Pro, so this is so special. You've worked so hard, Chris, on this wave, coming up on the calendar and taking everybody by surprise, and you put your head down and committed. And after all those runner-up finishes, leaving with one thing left to do, and you finally accomplished this first place trophy at Pipe, what does that mean to you? Uh, it, it means everything. It's not just today. It's an accumulation, like you said, of years and especially the last couple of months of, of work. And I wouldn't be here today without my incredible support crew. And I want to say a big thank you to my coach, Love Hodel. Um, I've been working with Swell Patrol, Rick Memzik and Lisa, um, my sports psych Daniel, my trainer Aaron. My dad was here with his family and my sister and my incredible husband. Um, and all my family and friends to get to surf in front of the home crowd and feel your support. Thank you everybody here so much. Carissa, for all you've been through from last September to where you are right now, that road that you went to to be back to number one in the world, what's gone on through your mind as you tra channel through those emotions? Uh, I mean, it was a heartbreaking end to my season last year, but I truly believe everything happens for a reason, and it's taken a little bit of time to lick my wounds and get back up, but like I said, I, I'm here today with all the love and support with so many people, and I'm just grateful to be doing something that I love and to have the opportunity. Thank you, WSL, and giving us a platform out at Pipe. I, it's been so inspiring to watch the field of women just really step it up year after year, and Moana leading the way. It's been so fun to surf with her over, out the last couple months out here. She's been pushing it, and um, yeah, I'm just really, really grateful. Uh, besides all the big names and all those crazy moments and big scores, uh, what are the true highlights for you throughout this week at the Billabong Pro Pipeline? What's really standing out? Oh, I'm, there's been some incredible surfing going down. I think, you know, having this be our first event of the season, it just brings back all the feels and all the excitement and nerves and getting to see my surfing Ohana again and travel with these incredible humans. Um, is, I think that's been the highlight most of all. You and Tyler Wright seem to match up in more finals than anybody in surfing history. I think that's actually a record for most finals surfed together. That was your 11th uh, together. This one at Pipeline, this one with the win. That's a rivalry right there. What's it like to see each other as both as world champions going head to head for these event titles for all these years? Uh, I mean, only so much admiration and respect for Tyler. Not only is she an incredible talent and um, competitor, but an amazing human. Um, and we've come against each other so many times. It is familiar in a way, but um, you know, I always know I'm going to get a good battle with her. Carissa, enjoy your moment. You're a pipe champion. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much. Chris Moore, number one in the world. Jack Robinson, number one in the world. And the champions of the Billabong Pro Pipeline. Let's continue the celebrations here as we send it back to the 805 Post Show with Kaipo. Take it away. Oh, thank you, Joe. Uh, back here at the 805 Post Show. And that was a uh, great moment. We made it official. Hey, look, look at it. Ross, third time's a charm for Chris Moore. This is her third final at Pipeline, but now she's got a title. Yeah, I mean, she really deserves it. She's been putting in a lot of hours um, out here at Backdoor and Pipe. She's got um, the competitive savviness, and she's got the skill. She's a hard worker. It's, it's really no surprise. Let's take a look at uh, our winners right now and uh, the prize trophies, the Jerry Lopez surfboards. This is our brackets, Laura, and a look at Chris Moore's road to the final. Yeah, it was no easy task. She actually came up against so many of the young guns. Molly Picklam in the quarterfinals, Betty Lou in the semifinals, and Tyler Wright in the final. It all started here, quarterfinal with Molly Picklam. Picklam Pickles, Ross, was in great form throughout the event, but not good enough to beat the five-time world champ, for some more. Yeah, what sets apart Carissa from some of the grommets, uh, you know, she's not as sendy, she's really calculated. She always makes sure she maximizes her percentages and gets the good waves. Um, she really knows how to line up out here, uh, and she's more consistent. Then in the semifinals, Carissa Moore had to come against a young lady that she mentored from childhood in the way of Betty Lou Sakura Johnson, but Carissa Moore again, came out on top. Yeah, and she was so patient in this uh, semi-final. She uh, waited for this one for about 12, 15 minutes, 
and it really paid off. Uh, Betty Lou really just didn't get started and Carissa just shut the door with that incredible ride there on the best female barrels of today. Then it came to the final, the 11th time Tyler Wright and Carissa Moore have met up in a CT final, but this time there was no stopping Carissa Moore, Ross. Yeah, and uh, you know, she had a lot of patience again. You know, she's such a reserved competitor and she stayed put there and waited for that wave. It was the best wave of the final, that barrel for Carissa, and it paid off. Just barely, it was a close one. Yeah, tight final there, back and forth throughout that 35 minute final. Tomorrow. This was the wave, she needed a high two with about two minutes to go and she shut the door and you can see the emotion there from Carissa. You can just tell how much this meant to her to get back on the horse after losing everything last year at the end of the year and come out on top here. Like you said, she's been bridesmaid for a while and now she's finally the Pipe Pro champion. Well, it's a great way for Carissa Moore as well as Tyler Wright to start off their championship tour campaign. Uh, I mean, when we look at the final five, we got to include them in our thoughts, it's, but it is a long road, Ross. Yeah, we're just getting started and uh, looking at the schedule ahead, you got Sunset Beach, you got Portugal, it's gonna be cold, icy, big old caverns everywhere in that beach break. So uh, it's a long year, but you, you hear that from everyone. They just try to take one heat at a time. Here, Jack always says that he's religious about it. Uh, so you can't get too ahead of yourself. Yeah, well, let's take a look at our women's rankings leaving pipeline heading into event number two the hurley pro at sunset beach laura there we go you have a big ten thousand points for carissa moore tyler wright second lakey unbelievable that those three were also in the semi-finals last year betty lou in the uh semi-finals as well but this is going to be a wild year i cannot wait to watch it all unfold those uh rookies and the young guns down the bottom i can't wait to see what they bring with their spark to Sunset Beach. Well, let's have a preview of Sunset by looking back to 2022, Ross, where Brisa Hennessy took out her first championship tour win. Yeah, I remember, uh, you know, the, the conditions on this day were really tricky. It was between Sunset Point and normal Sunset, and you really had to pick the eyes out of it. Uh, and then also the, the key to success at Sunset Beach is finding a wave that stands tall and gives you a proper section. And uh, Brisa did a great job on that rail. Laura, it's also about learning to swing around big boards. Yeah, and Brees has had a lot of experience with that. She grew up basically on the North Shore surfing pro junior events out here, and that really showed when she was in that event, her first win and what a special moment that was. I think she'll be hungry for another. Yeah, well, and it also shows, you know, how unpredictable Sunset is. It really is a playing field that evens out. Um, uh, the playing field where it doesn't really favor any surfer in particular because it's such a varied, big, expanse uh, room of play. Yeah, exactly. And, um, and wave selection is everything there because if you're not careful at Sunset Beach, it's a deep water wave. You can do a lot of cutbacks. So it's those surfers that are really aggressive, like a John John, like a Jack, especially, that, that find those sections that stand tall and they crack it. And do you know Speak who I think is going to be dangerous? I think Stephanie Gilmore will be back for uh, for blood at sunset. I know she's been putting in a lot of time and energy out there since she took her uh, elimination round loss out here. So I think she'll be wanting to climb the rankings out there and put in some work. Yeah, well, the, the grace of Steph Gilmore and the big faces at Sunset Beach makes a lot of sense to me. Let's take a look at our men's rankings leaving pipeline, Laura. Jack Robinson's on top. Unbelievable, so cool. I mean, we knew it was coming, Jack and Pipeline. They just seem like a match made in heaven. And, uh, you know, just, yeah, wild to see this top 10 standings right now. It's gonna be very exciting heading into into Sunset. I'm excited Roger. to see John John and Geordie, see what they can do. But yeah, love it. Jack Robinson's gonna be wearing yellow when he returns to Sunset Beach for stop number two. We're taking a look back, Ross, at 2019 when Jack Robinson was dominant for a win at Sunset Beach. Yeah, this got him uh, graduated up into the CT ranks. Uh, it was a big win. He got some really nice barrels. Uh, hopefully we get some, some good swell on the horizon where we can see that inside bowl at Sunset flare up. That's probably the best part of the wave there at Sunset. And, and Jack, you know, we talked about how much time he spends here on the North Shore. And he, so he knows uh, all these lineups. And Sunset, man, that is a big lineup to know. And these deep, heavy water waves, they just suit his surfing so much. You know, Margie's, all those waves in WA. He's just, uh, yeah, so comfortable out in them. 
Well, I mean, fitness is going to come into play. It's a long paddle, long hold downs, big wave. Jack Robinson uh, to the wind. They're riding a sharp eye surfboard this year. And speaking of sharp eye, let's take a look at our CT Shaper rankings because sharp eye, Ross, up on top as we kick off 2023 with these rankings. Yeah, so uh, Marcio right now walking around with uh, you know, little, his shoulders back. He's feeling a little good about that. And it's gonna be fun just to watch these guys talk trash. Yeah, they get men's and women's points starting at the quarterfinals. And Laura, it's not a mystery that all of the big board building houses are representing in that top five right now after event number one. Yeah, I mean, they obviously have the most service on tour represented uh, for all these boards, but uh, you know, I think Everyone knew Sharp Eye would be, would be hard to beat going into this, but uh, I'm excited to see the Takoros and the Arakawas and all the uh, other Hawaiian, Hawaiian shapers scoot up yeah. after sunset. Well, speaking of top five, should we look at today's top five? Typo. Let's go. Top five moments. Billabong Pro Pipeline finals day. And we got to go to quarterfinal number four, Jack Robinson versus John John Florence. This was a battle, Laura. This was a battle, and it looked like it was all going John John's way. He started quick, and he got a, uh, he just had the rhythm, you know? The team John John, they're in the yellow shirts over in the uh, yard next door. But then, halfway through the heat, maybe at about the eight minute mark, Jack Robinson got back-to-back -back scores, and literally flicked the switch and turned the heat like that. Jack making it happen. Ross finding some tubes and really some diamonds in the rough. Yeah, that side slit barrel from John was definitely the highlight of that heat, but uh, Jack had the stronger backup score and it made a difference. Number four, we want more in the way of Carissa Moore. Clutch barrel for an eight point ride in her semifinal. Yeah, this was against uh, Betty Lou and she waited so long for this barrel and I just love the way she slid into it. That's so hard to do to get in right from the takeoff there. Eight points, that would have felt so good. I, I interviewed her right after this heat and she just said, oh my goodness, there's no better feeling than that. That was stressful. Number three, bravo, Viral Fonti with his best CT finish to date, his first CT final, the Italian came through. Yeah, he's a good fighter. Uh, you know, he just looks for those waves and uh, he's really uh, has high focus uh, and did a good job kind of finding those sections, where to hit it, where to look for the barrel. Uh, he spent a lot of time here at Backdoor Pipe the last few years, and it's paying off. Yeah, such a feeling, happy, and a great start for Leo Ferrovanti. Number two, it's a pipe champ, Laura Jack Robinson. Must feel so damn good. You know, he's, like you said, four wins already, three years on tour. He just... Uh, he was incredible today. Versatile, barrels. He just made it happen, and he's just got this really incredible flow and connection with the ocean right now. Ripped a fin out of his board, but uh, there we go, the win. And the chair up the beach for Jack Robinson. A good feeling after a hard-fought day. And at number one, she's going to be back in yellow. Carissa Moore takes the title for the women here at the Billabong Pro Pipe. Yeah, you know, and her road to victory, she smashed Molly, she smashed uh, Betty Lou. So a nice statement from the veteran, you know, taking the grommets out, putting them on notice. Everyone's talking about Betty Lou, everyone's talking about Molly, but Carissa, she's still the reigning champ, and uh, she told them, hey, come and get me. She seems just unstoppable. <laughs> you know, we talk about Carissa, <laughs> and, you know, she's been on tour for so long now, but she just is as hungry as ever, and she's so competitive. I love it. Final thoughts, Laura? Final thoughts. Wow. I mean, Carissa and Jack, I would have p picked them in my fantasy team. So, uh, yeah, pretty incredible. I did, actually, Ross. Final <laughs> thoughts. Oh, you're good at this game. <laughs> uh, you know, I, it, was a, it was a tricky contest. The waves were, were pretty tricky. But at the end of the day, you have to be really steely nerved and, and you have to make the right decisions at pipe and backdoor. And it's like this. And uh, it was really fun. A lot of drama. Yeah. Well, thank you, guys. And remember... The Hurley Pro Sunset Beach, that's going to kick off February 12th. Go to worldsurfleague.com for the updates and enjoy today's highlights. Aloha, everybody, and welcome to the Billabong Pro Pipeline in memory of Andy Irons. The opening day of competition is upon us for 2023. Go, Jake Marshall in a backdoor barrel of his own. Spills 
going and he's coming out. It's risen in my bones, sparing a cry, what's present in blood. Oh, look at this little wave dropping in. Jordy Spence it's coming out. Yago Laura and Pipeline disappearing and coming out. Uh, Kelly's 31st appearance at Pipe in competition on the championship level. Abracadora. Backdoor pulls in, slotted deep, and finds the exit. Looks like a good one. Betty Lou, Shreddy Lou in the barrel at backdoor and reemerges. Under the hook, no problem. Big half to finish. Fitzgibbons, back door, gets there. The biggest upset of the day. So far, we're gonna go up the back of the red white. Going for back door pits. Patina heading that same direction. Wide open. This thing is a cave. Oh, the South African matchup in the barrel and back door. John John, back door. Long wall, but even John John will not find the exit door. There. No, he does. What just happened? It's finals day at the Billabong Pro Pipeline. Something's telling me potentially you're the one out in the lead. You know I like it, keep doing it. I don't wanna interrupt. Finds a little more of a corner, finds a little bubble, gets through that section. Nice carve in some difficult water. Back up into the lip again and fist pump for Leo Piravanti. Drops in in the barrel, disappearing, and final coming oh. out at the end The hot young Brazilian, Joao Chianca. Four, three, two, one. What a heat. Jack Robinson taking on John John Florence. Jack gets the lead change as he's into his first semi-final here at Pipe. Well, Tyler Wright on to the finals. Chris Moore in another final here at Pipeline. Leonardo Fiorvanti's first CT final. Bravo, Fiorvanti. champion of the Billabong Pro Pipeline and number one in the world. And it's all over. Jack Robinson is your champion of the Billabong Pro Pipeline and your new world number one. This copyrighted event broadcast is produced by the World Surf League for broadcast around the world and may not be retransmitted, reproduced, rebroadcast, or otherwise distributed or used in any form without the written consent of the World Surf League.